Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Dodge City and to the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. But I gave you some more coffee. Uh, yeah, I guess so. How about you, Chester? Yes, sir, I believe I will. Uh, why don't you just leave the coffee pot here on the table, Miss Keller? Why, sure thing, Marshal. Right. Well, I got some fresh eggs this morning, if you're interested. They oh. were just brought in. Well, good, good. Uh, cook us up about a half a dozen of them, huh? Have them for you right away, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> All right. Fresh eggs, my. I'll swear if Del Monaco's ain't getting to be about as fancy as some of them Kansas City restaurants. <laughs> well, that's civilization, Chester. Progress. Another five years, and Dodge City will be tamed, curried, and bridled. <laughs> see and believe it, Mr. Dillon. No, you'll see it. Both of us will see it. That is, if we live that long. Yeah. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Uh, you Mr. Yeah? Dillon, the marshal here? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, I'm sorry to bother you at breakfast, marshal. My name is Hunter. Ed Hunter. Mr. Hunter. I'm a deputy sheriff from Richmond, Virginia. Come in on the Santa Fe this morning. I see. Well, uh, why don't you pull up a chair, Mr. Hunter? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Chester Proudfoot, Mr. Hunter. How do you do? How do you do, sir? This here's my first trip to the frontier. I find it a rather remarkable experience. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, won't you have some coffee? I uh, know, thank you. Marshal, I'm here to arrest two men who are wanted in Virginia. No? Here are the warrants and the orders of extradition. I stopped off for them in Topeka. Uh-huh. Yeah. John Allison, Calvin Moore. Both wanted for murder, huh? Hey, do you know these men, Mr. Hunter? No, sir, I don't. Well, the names aren't familiar to me. I never heard of them. Have you a Chester? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. Well, I have some information that may help. Not much on Allison, I'm afraid. He shot and killed a bank teller at Greenbrier last spring. Oh? He's about 30 years old, dark hair and mustache, medium build, an excellent horseman and a confirmed gambler. <laughs> Well, that's fine. That narrows it down to about two-thirds of the men in Dodge City. <laughs> well, possibly I can do a bit better in regard to Calvin Moore, Mr. Dillon. Now, he came down to Richmond from the north and set up practice as a medical doctor. He was about 29 at the time. And he ambushed and shot young Roger Beauregard and then left town. That uh -huh. was uh, 17 years ago. Beauregard's been trying to trace him ever since. Well, I'm afraid that's a pretty well, long time. I have a time. picture of Moore, photograph. Oh? Uh -huh. Of course, he was much younger than this. Oh, well, sometimes there's still quite a resemblance, even after 70. Something familiar about that picture, Mr. Dillon? Uh, uh, 17 years. He must be somewhere past 45 now, huh? Hmm. Are you sure that these men are here in Dodge, Mr. Hunter? Reasonably so. Is there something about that photograph that makes you... Well, it's, it's too blurred to tell much about it. Besides, he'd be 17 years older. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Hunter, suppose you leave the picture and the descriptions with me, and I'll check around town, and I'll keep in touch with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, I wonder if you might suggest a good hotel. Uh, certainly. Why don't you try the Dodge House? It's the corner of Railroad Avenue at the end of the plaza, the east end. Uh, tell the deacon I sent you. I uh, thank you again, Mr. Dillon, and I'll be grateful for any help you can give me in this matter. Yeah, sure. So long. You want to see the photograph, Chester? Yes, sir, I do. Well, Mr. Dillon, that is... That is... Yeah. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. 
He's my friend. I, I, I never asked him anything about his life before he came here. Didn't seem to matter. But now the law says he's a murderer. I'm part of the law. So now it does matter. Maybe it's not him. No, it's him, all right, Chester. You saw it the same as I did. It's Doc. <laughs> This is the first chance I've had this week to clean a few instruments properly. <sighs> Gunshot wounds. Oh, Matt. I'll lay odds I'm the only doctor in the United States who makes three-fourths of his living off of gunshot wounds. <laughs> That's a rough country, Doc. Yes, indeed it's a rough country. Uh, maybe you ought to have stayed back east. Yes, huh? see, broken bones, babies, and gunshot wounds. Well, I wouldn't know the first thing about a good civilized case of gout anymore. Uh, what part of the East did you come from, Doc? You see, I went to medical school in Boston. I studied consumption, colic, liver complaints. <laughs> Never had a case of liver complaint in all the time I've been here, though. No, I guess that kind of thing is more common down south, around uh, Richmond, Virginia, for instance, huh? <clears throat> Matt, stop beating around the bush. You've got something on your mind, and it's bothering you. Look, Doc, uh, a deputy sheriff from Virginia came in on the morning train. He's got a warrant for murder against a man named Calvin Moore. He's got a photograph of Moore taken 17 years ago. Would you like to look at it? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Are you Calvin Moore? It wasn't murder, Matt. They said it was murder, of course. The Beauregards were an important family. Would you like to tell me about it? Oh, not much to tell, Matt. I had been in practice in Richmond about a year. And there was a girl. A beautiful girl. The spirit and fire and that soft radiance that only southern girls seem to have. And, you know, me, that was so long ago. Uh -huh. I've been in the South myself now. Roger Beauregard and I were both caught in this girl. He was a typical Virginia gentleman, hot-headed, used to having his own way. He started threatening me, warning me. And I laughed it off. Then one day I was coming back from a case, and I ran into Roger on a country road. He had a pair of dueling pistols, and he challenged me. What? Well, that's not a crime, Doc. That's self-defense. It's not a crime here or anywhere. Well, I tried to talk him out of it, but he was crazy mad. He shoved one of the pistols in my hand, and he pulled back on his horse, and he leveled his gun. I had no choice. We both fired. He missed. I didn't. Self-defense, yes, but there were no witnesses, and I was an outsider, a Yankee. So you ran for it, is that it? I ran for it. St. Louis, Virginia City... Montana Territory, the Panhandle, Wichita, Abilene, and Dodge. I changed my name to Charles Adams. And the, uh, the girl, Doc, what happened to her? I waited for her in St. Louis. We were married there. Two months later, she died of typhoid fever. Well, you never know. No matter how much you figure you understand somebody, you just quite never know. I can't go back there, Matt. I've got no defense. It, well, I'd mean prison. I'd rot in prison. I, I won't go back, Matt. Now, Doc, look, Hunter is here after two prisoners. I got no right to, to my own rules to go after one man and keep the other one covered. I always figured that the only kind of law that would work out here is an honest law. What are you going to do? Doc, I don't know.
You're late, Matt. I decided you weren't going to stop in tonight. Is Chester around? Kid? Yeah, over there by the ferro table. No. Matt, what about this Virginian who's been hanging around for the last two days? Oh, Hunter? Yeah. He's a deputy sheriff, got a couple of warrants to serve. Why? Well, he's been asking questions. Some of the boys are getting a little skittish. Now, there's no call for it as long as they're not named Allison or Moore. Are you free now, Miss Kitty, huh? or are you busy? What's it look like? Well, I figured maybe he was just killing time. Uh, hiya, Marshal. Bunko? Uh, bought you a drink, Kitty. It's over on the bar. All right. Thanks. Matt, I'll be off in a couple of hours. Drop around. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I understand you've got a rival lawman in town, Marshal. Well, there's a deputy here from Virginia, if that's what you mean. I always figured you were the law here. Is he short in this town, Marshal? Say the word, we'll run him out. I ever ask you for help, Bunko? Well, no. When but... a man's short in Dodge, I'll run him out. And no offense, Marshal. You keep your own cinch tight. Don't worry about anybody else, huh? I'll see you, Bunko. I swear I never saw anybody such bad luck in all my life. My gracious, he ought to swear off Pharaoh and stick the stud. Oh, Chester. Hmm? The old Jethro Keener, he just lost three weeks' pay. And Bunko Benson, sitting right there beside him, mind you, picked up $230. So that's why he's feeling big. Uh, come on, Chester, let's take a walk. Huh? Yes, sir. Three weeks' pay. Mercy, I never saw such luck. What about Doc, Chester? He turned in a couple hours ago. That's when I came on over here. How's he acting? About as usual. No signs of planning to run out, if that's what you mean, Mr. Dunn. One thing he's doing, though, that he's never done before, he's toting a gun. Uh, good evening, Marshal. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Hunter. Since you didn't come to me, Mr. Dillon, I've come to you. I'm wondering what progress you've made. Well, I, uh, I'm still checking. Any results at all, Marshal? Well, I don't have much to go on, you know. Now, Calvin Moore was a doctor by profession. He might still be practicing. I suggest we investigate the local doctors. Well, that wouldn't take long. We've only got one, Doc Adams. How long has he been here? Oh, about four years. How old a man is he? Mm, late 40s, I imagine. But he doesn't show much resemblance to that photograph you gave me. Well, maybe you're too used to him to notice the resemblance. Yeah, maybe. I'd like to look him over myself, Marshal. Well, uh, he's pretty busy out on calls most of the time. and uh... Not all the time. No, not all the time. All right, Mr. Hunter, I'll bring him around. That's funny, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he should have answered by now. Well, we're wasting our time, Chester. He's gone. Well, now, he, he, he might have got called out on a case. Yeah, I know, but I don't... Hey, what? Uh, that was across the plaza, down toward the Dodge house. Come on, Chester. Somebody sure is stirring up smoke. Yeah, yeah it's across the street. Edge of the railroad yards, I think. you, Marshal? Yeah. What happened, Mr. Hunter? Somebody tried to kill me. I started into the hotel and they fired from the dock here. I fired back, but he got away. You, uh, get a good look at him? Oh, no, I just saw the flashes. Well, this is an easy town to get killed in, Mr. Hunter. So it seems. About that doctor, Marshal, you didn't bring him around. Well, uh, he's out on call. I think I want to meet him more than ever now. We will return.
return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, there's a world of wonderful entertainment awaiting you every weekday in the daytime with CBS Radio's roster of wonderful dramatic serials. This Monday, listen in. And now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. What time is it, Chester? Uh, 2.15 a.m., Mr. Dillon. Yeah. I sure hope we don't have to spend the whole night waiting here. I don't see how Doc puts up with the smell of all this medicine. He's used to it, I guess. Yeah. I suppose a man can get used to anything except dying. You think it could have been him that fired those shots, Mr. Dillon? Chester. Hmm? There's somebody coming. Come on in, Bunko. The doc's not here, but he'll probably be... Oh, what happened to your arm? I... I got thrown into a barbed wire fence. Here, let's have a look at it, huh? No, 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 no. It's, it's all right. It's a gunshot wound. All right, hold it, both of you. Well, is that the same gun you tried to kill Hunter with, Bunko? Stay where you are, Marshal. Yeah. Around 30 years old, dark hair, mustache... Medium build, excellent horseman, re- confirmed gambler. Wanted from her. John Allison. Uh, alias Bunko Benson. Am I right, Bunko? He's not taking me back there. You stay where you are, Dylan. Now, don't be a fool, Bunko. Put away the gun. Stay back. I'm... I'm warning you. Bunko, look! All right, Chester, let's get him over to the jail. Mm, Just hold still now, Bunko. Just one more second. I'll have hold that bullet now, and then... We'll just... Ah! Oh, there. <laughs> uh, now, add that one to your collection, Matt. Well, I'll make Hunter a present of it. It wasn't bad shooting to be firing in the dark at a gun flash. He'll never get me back to Virginia. Oh, now, hold still, Bunko. Oh, I don't expect right, a man to tie a bandage with your arm, waving it around like a mare's tail in fly time. See, how'd you know he'd come to my office, Matt? I didn't, Doc. We were waiting for you. Oh, I see. There we are. No, 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 no. That ought to stop the bleeding. And don't loosen it up, Eddie. <laughs> and you'll live the hang yet. Don't worry about my hanging, Doc. I'll outlive you. Well, in view of the circumstances, uh, I'd say the odds are about even. Well, Matt, shall we adjourn to the front office? Yeah, come on, Doc. Uh, lock the cell, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. Well, I turned in at 10 o'clock tonight. I got one hour of sleep. They called me over to Mrs. Behan's. She thought her baby was on the way. False alarm, of course. Usually is the first time. And I got back and I came straight over here. Uh, Doc, you were wearing a gun earlier today. What'd you do with it? Oh, I put it back in the drawer where it belonged. I realized I was acting like a fool. Uh, was that where you were waiting in my office? Somebody tried to kill Hunter, and, and you thought... Uh, Look, Doc, I, I've i tried to think of some way out of this. Uh, a way out for both of us. I got one man under arrest back there now, and I, I can't rightly set myself up as a judge and free the other man. I'd even hoped you'd cut and run for it. You, you'd get away if you did, you know. Hunter doesn't know the country. I've been running for 17 years, Matt, and... And it still caught up with me. 
I'm too old to run any farther. What are you going to do? I'm a lawman, Doc, right or wrong. Well, then I guess I'm under arrest. Huh? No, I, I, I didn't say that. I, I just said that... Is Doc Evans here? There's a... Oh, oh, there you are, Doc. Yes, yes, what's the trouble? A what's... fellow over in the railroad yards asleep on the track. He was drunk, I guess. They were switching cars. You better come, Doc. He's awful bad. Oh, I... Good, Chester. You ready, Doc? You're ready as I'll ever be. All right, let's go. Then. Uh, he said near the loading pens. Down this way, I guess. Yes, sir. It looks like some lights over there. People around. Yeah. Marshal, is that you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Hunter. Uh, I thought you went to bed hours ago. I'm a light sleeper, Mr. Dillon. I heard there's an accident over in the yards. Thought it might give me a chance to meet your local doctor. Well, I, uh... I guess you can meet him right now if you want to. Doc, this is Ed Hunter, Doc Adams. How do you do, sir? Mr. Hunter? I, uh, I got one of your prisoners locked up, Mr. Hunter, John Allison. Known here as Bunko Benson. Good. I just found out he's the man who tried to kill you tonight. He caught one oh? of your bullets in his arm. Well, I see. Why, then it's one down and one to go. Just Calvin Moore. Dr. Calvin Moore. Uh, this is no time to stand around making Chen music. I'm sorry, well, That's Hunter, quite all right, Marshal. I'll go with you. Uh, will you pardon us, please? Uh, all right, will you move back and let us through here, please? Here, here, Doc, this way. Yeah, I'm right, will you, Matt? Uh, please stand back now, will you? Give Doc a chance to yes, work. Yes, uh, please, if you please, just stand there. Uh, uh, oh, oh, bad is right. Uh, well, we'll do what we can. Come on. That man who's hurt, Marshal, who is he? Oh, just a drifter. Been around Dodge a couple of years. Calls himself Texas Joe. No friends or family. Nobody knows where he came from. It's the usual story. Oh, easy now, Tex. We'll have you fixed up here in just a couple of shakes. Is... Is that you, Doc? Hey, that's right. <laughs> I told him, get you, be all right if you got here. Why, sure, it'll be all right. You just lie still now. And... Yeah. <laughs> Certainly has to work under primitive conditions. Doc? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chester, will you get those lanterns going and give Doc some more light? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's the only real doctor this side of Abilene. Hey, Mr. Dillon, is there anything I can do to help I guess not, Miss Kelly. Thanks, anyway. Poor old Tex. Why, he stopped in the restaurant not more than four hours ago. I fixed him a meal. Uh, you never know. Well, Doc can pull him through if anybody can. Sure he can. Uh, put one of those lanterns on the other side there, Chester. Yes, you Doc. You seem to have a lot of faith in this Dr. Adams. They've got reason to, Mr. Hunter. Uh, Matt, uh, could you give me a hand here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, Doc. Uh, lift his head up just a little bit there, man. Yeah, all right. right. <laughs> Not much of a chance. All I can do is make him comfortable. Huh? Marshal Dillon. No, don't try to talk, Texie. You're going to be all right. You, you've been decent to me, Marshal. Just a bum, but you treated me square. You and Doc, only friends I got. Sure, Tex. I, I got one more favor to ask. Could someone... Could someone read me some scripture? Well, Tex, I... I just don't recall any Marshall, of that. I, I know some. Uh, Mrs. Kelly, I, I doubt if you can I, hear. I can hear. Please. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He restoreth my soul. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He... Uh, I think that's enough. Of course. Of course. Well, you can't win them all, I guess. I don't know. 
No, you can't win them all, Doctor. Well, I... Doctor, as the only physician here, I suppose you also function as coroner. That's right. Yes. This man will be buried under the name of Texas Joe. Hey, don't you worry about that. <clears throat> Boot Hill is full of men buried under nicknames. In this country, we... Doc! Doc, I just came from... Oh. What, Kitty? Oh, uh, Doc, I... I've been sitting up with Mrs. B, and you left too soon. She needs you over there right away. Well, then it wasn't a false alarm. No. All right, Kitty, I'll be there just as quick as I can, but... Well, well, as soon as I... Uh, Kitty, you go on back over and do what you can for her, huh? Doc will be along. Oh, all right, Matt, but you better hurry. Well, Mr. Hunter, I, uh... Uh, gentlemen, this seems to have been my lucky night. Both my fugitives located within an hour of each other. I guess there's nothing I one can do One of them safely to... in jail and one of them dead. What? Uh, didn't you notice the resemblance, Marshal? That Texas Joe there, he's obviously the man in the photograph. I saw it immediately. Well, Mr. I hope Hunter, you'll I... take all the necessary steps to see that he's buried under his real name, Calvin Moore. His death, of course, closes the case, and I'll be leaving for Virginia with my other prisoner tomorrow. Well, Mr. Hunter, I... I just don't know what to say. Well, I... Now, I'd say it's no time to stand around making chin music, Dr. Adams. You have a patient waiting, and this town seems to depend on you. Well, well of course, but... Hey, you got I... work to do, Doc. And, uh, Doc, make sure it's a boy, huh? Well, I'll, uh, um, uh, I'll do my darndest, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Doc. Good night, Doc. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, Paul Dubov, and Vivi Janis. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas, through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow evening, listen for Lionel Barrymore, your host on CBS Radio's Sunday Night Playhouse. There will be another specially selected historical drama or a classic from literature with a cast of stars perfectly suited for the roles in the story. Every Sunday evening, hear Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday Night Playhouse over most of these same CBS radio stations. Truly an outstanding dramatic experience here at the Star's Address. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of escape, Listen every Sunday night to the CBS Radio Network.
Rod City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Cleanliness is next to godliness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, I know, Chester, but all you're doing is getting it off the floor into the air. Man can hardly breathe in here. All right, Mr. Dillon. Ah. I'll do my sweeping later. Yeah, good. My mother taught me that, Mr. Dillon. Taught you what, Chester? That cleanliness is next to godliness. She was a fine woman, too. Oh, look, Chester, it's a good saying, and it's probably true, and I got nothing against your mother except that she also should have taught you how to sweep. Well, maybe she just didn't have the time, Mr. Dillon. You see, there was an awful lot of us, and oh, what with chores Matt. and... Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, come on, uh, I'll buy you a drink. Uh, what? Doc said he'd buy you a drink, Mr. Dillon. He really said that? You coming? Doc, you got to quit throwing your money around the way you do. Uh, maybe you don't need it. Uh, no, wait a minute, Doc. I, I'm with you. Uh, I'll tell you all about it when I get back, Chester. I'd be mighty interested, Mr. Dillon. Oh, sure be glad when it gets winter again. Why, Doc? You'll just complain about the cold, then. Oh, uh, I suppose... You go sit with Kitty, Matt. I'll bring a bottle. Okay, Doc. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. What are you and Doc up to? Yeah, he wants someone to talk to, so he picked me. And you. Fine. I'm a good listener. It's lots of practice. <laughs> What are we celebrating? Uh, let's see here. We'll drink to a fellow that you don't know. Uh huh? Cain Vestal. Well, here's to him. Yeah? Here's to him. <coughs> yes, he'll be dead in a couple of months. What? That's what I told him. What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'm not the only one who's told him that. I'm just the last. Well... Who is this Kane Vestal, Doc? Huh? Oh, it's just a fella. Came in on the train last night, leaving for Arizona to my die in Arizona. He's a musician. He plays the guitar, he tells me. Well, how's he gonna die? Consumption. He's got it bad. I'm the last doctor he's gonna ask about it, he says. Oh, poor fella. Yes, yeah, climb it out there, keep him going for a little while longer. And, uh, oh, I don't know, he's... He's such a sad man for some reason. Well, who wouldn't be, Doc? No, 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 Kitty. I think kane has been sad for a long, long time. He's a very nice fellow, too. Nothing can help him, huh? No, nothing. You know, it's a funny thing, Doc, huh? I'm just sitting here thinking. Sometimes you have to tell men they're going to die. Sometimes I have to. Yeah, that's right, man. Oh, let's see. Uh, there he is. See that fellow with the car there? He just came in. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he knows anyone around here. You mind if I ask him over? Uh, sure. 
your party, Doc. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Kane? Uh, Kane? Uh, over here? Uh. <laughs> uh, 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 sit down. Sit down. Kane, this is Kitty. Uh, hello, Kane. Hey, Kitty. <laughs> this is Marshal Dillon. Hello, Marshal. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> uh, there we are. Have a drink. Well, thank you, Doc. Uh, is this your first trip west, Kane? Yes, Marshal, it is. Oh, well, where are you from? No place in particular, Miss Kitty. I seem to spend most of my life on the Mississippi River. I, I thought you were a musician. I am. I was hired to ride the river boats and play my guitar for the passengers. Oh. <laughs> well, at least you've had a constant change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years of going up and down that river, it got pretty familiar, Marshal. <laughs> well, Kane, I knew a young fellow back in St. Louis before the war, and he was learning to be a river pilot. <laughs> Say, I wonder if you ever ran into him, name of Clemens, Sam Clemens. No, Doc, I don't believe I did. Oh, he was a very amusing fellow. He was just chock full of stories. Um... You leaving Dodge tomorrow, King? I'm headed for Arizona, Miss Kitty. No reflection on Dodge, though. <laughs> uh, if you hit a place out there called Tombstone, I uh, wish you'd look up Virgil Earp for me. Uh, tell him I sent you, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I'll do that. Say, Kane, I wonder, uh, could I ask you a favor? Well, certainly, Miss Kitty. Anything at all. Well, would you play something for us? I had an idea that's what it would be. <laughs> Anything in particular? Oh, play something you like, Kane. Another girl I knew used to like this one. going to stay here a while. Maybe you could teach me to play like that, huh? It'd be a pleasure, Miss Kitty. But I'm afraid I won't be around for long. Morning, Mr. Dillon. It's, uh, noon, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but... You went off with Doc yesterday, so I figured I had a little time coming today. Well, that depends on how you spent it. Now, if you've been gambling, oh, I am... now, Mr. Dillon, you know I never gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I was out helping a fellow learn to shoot a six-gun, that's all. Now? You mean there's a man in Dodge who doesn't know how? This fellow don't. Never had one in his hand before. He's a musician. What? It plays the guitar, he told me. You mean Kane? Uh, Kane Vestal? Yes, sir, that's his name. Nice a fellow you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. But he was supposed to leave on the stage this morning. And what's he done with his six-gun anyway? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He just come by here early this morning and asked me if I'd teach him. Yeah. Now, where'd he get the gun? Said he'd just bought it. Anything wrong, Mr. Dillon? No, no. 
It just doesn't add up somehow, that's all. Oh, well, he won't cause any trouble. He's not the sort. Uh, you never know, Chester. Mm, no, sir. My kitty looks pretty this morning. She's got a yellow parasol, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? All right, I think I'll go see her for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Uh, hello, Matt. <laughs> Kitty, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. What is it? Uh, I- I'm curious about something, Kitty. Maybe you can help me. Maybe. How long was Kane Vessel with you yesterday? Kane? Oh, well... He didn't leave till evening. Why? Well, he didn't go out on the stage this morning, and he's bought himself a six-gun. You, you any idea why? A gun? Huh? Doesn't sound like Kane. Anything happened yesterday, Kitty, or did he tell you anything? Well, yeah, might... there was one thing, Matt. Joel Adams and a couple of his men came in. Yeah? Kane got pretty upset when he saw him had a bad coughing spell. Oh? Huh? Later, he asked a lot of questions about Adams. Well, what'd you tell him? Just that Adams is a big landowner around here that nobody who isn't working for him likes him very much. That's all I know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk, Adams and Kane. No. I don't think they even know each other. Well, anyway, he sure isn't the sort to be packing a gun. Well, you'll just get into trouble, Matt. Yeah. Uh... Where's he staying, did he say? Dodge house, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kitty. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, Kane. Well, I'm Marshal Dillon. Come in, come in. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Marshal? I, uh, I thought you were leaving Dodge on the stage this morning. Well, I was, Marshal, but I changed my mind. You know how it is. Sure, Kane, sure. Now, we're glad to have you around. I, uh, I'm just curious, though. You're, uh... Stay and have anything to do with that gun you bought this morning? Oh, Chester told you. I thought he would. He's a good teacher, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't answer my question. Do I have to answer it? I'm just trying to help you, that's all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Marshal, but I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Look, Kane, you're new in this country. A man like you just can't pick up a six-gun and call himself a fighting man. Not and expect to live through it. I certainly lay no claim to be a fighting man. Well, then why did you buy that gun? There's no law out here against a man having a gun, is there, Marshal? No. But any man who carries one is expected to use it when the time comes. You'd be a lot safer without one. Being safe doesn't mean a whole lot to me, Marshal. Not now. Yeah, I, I know. Doc told me. What's it all about? It's a long story. And an old one, I suppose. I'd really rather not talk about it. Well, I can't force you to. But, but tell me this. Does it have anything to do with Joel Adams? Yes, it does, Marshal. I'm going to kill him. When? I don't know. Any time. Well, why? That's a long story I mentioned. All right, Kane. But if you try to face him, he'll kill you before you got that gun halfway out of your belt. And if you shoot him any other way, you'll hang for it. You've forgotten something, Marshal. What? No matter what I do, I'm going to die soon anyway. 
month or two isn't going to make any difference. You hate Adams that much? I wouldn't kill a man I didn't hate, would I? I didn't think you were the sort of man who'd kill anyone. Only Joel Adams, Marshal. Then I gotta warn him about you. Well, I understand, Marshal. It's all right. He doesn't know me anyway. Never even saw me before. But you want to kill him? Yes, sir. Well, I'll take your gun away from you, but you just find another one. And I can't arrest you unless I catch you trying to bushwhack him. I'm sorry for the trouble I'm causing you, Marshal. You know, I've never had to deal with a man like you before, Kane. Maybe I ought to just tie you up and throw you on that stage. You could. But I'd just come right back. <sighs> I guess you would. I'm sorry this has to happen here in Dodge, Marshal. Then why don't you leave? I guess I hate Joel Adams too much. All right, Kane, I'm through trying to convince you. So long. Bye, Marshal. Marshal, and I never saw him before last night. You must have known him somewhere, Adams. You're trying to make me out a liar, Marshal. I'm trying to save Kane's life and yours, maybe. No, he ain't going to shoot me. I'll kill him first time he looks sideways. Maybe you won't see him. Oh, shoot me in the back, eh? Well, in that case... It... In that case, what? Why, nothing, Dylan, nothing. Forget it. If Kane's shot in the back, you'll be the first man I'd take in, Adam. I don't even know him. Why should I shoot him? I'm only warning you. Well, just leave me be, Marshal. I can take care of myself. See that you do, Adams, and only yourself. Why, sure, Marshal. I, mean, I don't much like the idea of some stranger gunning for me. Makes me sort of uneasy. There must be some reason for it. Don't start it again, Marshal. There ain't no reason. I know. You've led a blameless life. You never hurt anyone. I you, told Adam? you twice. There are men around you. here who'd shoot you on sight if they thought they could get by with it. I don't think you were ever any good, Adam, so don't tell me Kane's got no reason. I don't You're believe it. You're pushing me now, I'm Marshal. I'm tired of your talk, that's all. Maybe it's true you don't know him, but he sure knows something about you. Well, then he'll wish you didn't. That's all I got to say. Well, just keep out of his way. Give it a little time, and maybe there won't be any killing at all. Why, sure, sure. All the time in the world. All right, Adams. I've done all I can. Just don't worry about me. I'm not. Then goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye. returned for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the poignant story of Jane Froman, adapted from the movie with a song in my heart, was selected by you listeners through a national magazine as the one you would like most to hear on Lux Radio Theater. So this Monday night, listen for Susan Hayward, Rory Calhoun, David Wayne, Thelma Ritter, and Bob Wagner of the movie cast when CBS Radio presents Lux Radio Theater. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Sure is quiet around town tonight, Mr. Dillon. There's a trail herd doing in a couple of days. I suppose business will pick up then. Mm. You'd think those cowboys be too tuckered out after a ride like that to have any juice left in them at all, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, they're too poor to cut loose any other time. Well, that don't stop them down in Texas, Mr. Dillon. No? No. It's just like an uncle of mine back in Waco. He was poor. Oh, he was mean poor. But he always said the only good money was was to have fun with. 
So did he have fun? But no, sir. He was too poor, like I said. <laughs> all right, Chester, all right. All I ask is that you don't try to explain it to me. Well, but there's nothing to explain, Mr. Dillon. It, it's just uh, it's just that he was the Chester. one poorest Chester. man you'd ever... Uh, Marshal, say, you want to talk to Kane Bestel? What? Uh, Kane is upstairs in my office. He been shot? No, no, not shot. Beat up. Well, how is he, Doc? Well, it's not too bad. A couple of cowboys found him just outside of town. They heard a shot and said two men rode off before they could stop them. Yeah? And I guess whoever it was, they didn't have time to finish the job. They just got started working on it. So Adams made the first move, huh? Uh, I'll be back soon, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. They hit him on the head with a gun butt and scratched him up some. Outside of that, he's fine. That's still a stall, even if they didn't kill him, Doc. Yeah, I suppose it is. Anyway, they took a shot at him when they heard those riders coming along. Went right through his coat. Yeah. They probably think he's dead. So that's where you went, Doc. I might have known. Didn't even give you a chance to use that gun, did he, Kane? I didn't have a gun on me, Marshal, but it wasn't he. It was they. Huh? Do you recognize them? Well, I don't know many people around here. You know Joel Adams, or so you told me. It wasn't Adam. Could you pick him out if you saw him again? No, Mar Marshal, I don't believe I could. Where were you when they grabbed you, Kane? Into Front Street. I was taking a walk after supper. They rode up behind me, one on each side, lifted me up, and mm -hmm. carried me out of town a ways. You must have got a good look at him, at least when they got off their horses. It was too dark, Marshal. Yeah. Doc, how long has he been here? Oh, oh about half an hour, Marshal. Why? Those cowboys who saw you, Kane, they brought you right in here, didn't they? Yes. So it was maybe an hour ago when those two men hauled you out of town? It was plenty light enough then. Was it, Marshal? You're going to fight it yourself, aren't you? Yes, Marshal. It... <laughs> it's my affair. It was, Kane, but you've been assaulted and shot at, so it's the law's business now. I won't prefer any charges, Marshal. You don't have to. I've seen you, and I know who did it, or who hired it done as well as you do. Uh, please, Marshal, i got to handle this my own way. There's a law that says you can't murder a man, Kane, and the same law says he can't murder you. Are you so full of hate you can't get that through your head? I guess that's it, Marshal. All right, Kane. You do what you have to do. So will I. Hello, Adams. I've been looking for you. It's late, Dylan. Can't you see me tomorrow? It's not even midnight. That's early for you. <laughs> you see how this marshal's always trying to get me on the prod, boys? Yes, sir. Yes. These boys of yours play pretty rough themselves, Adams. Meaning? Didn't they tell you? Tell me what? What they did to Kane Vestal? They did not kill Kane Vestal, and you can't prove it. No, Adams, I can't. Kane isn't even dead. What? You know, I'm curious, Adams. Why'd you think he might be? Why, why, if somebody said he got himself hurt. Joel Adams. You arranged this, Marshal? You know I didn't. Who is he? What does he want? Hello, Joel Adams. Don't strain yourself so you don't know me. Who are you? Kane Vastel. But my name doesn't matter. What are you haunting me for? I never saw you before in my life. That's true. You didn't. But we had a friend in common once. A friend? Who? Julie Travis. What about Julie? You were a riverboat gambler then, Adams, and you had money and fine clothes and a way with women, especially young girls. Julie was only 16 at the time. Never mind all that. 
So she went away with you to be married, you told her. Oh. <laughs> I think I guess the rest. You wanted to marry her, but I got her instead. Is that it? That's it, Adam. <laughs> That's exactly it. Oh, no, I thought you really had something on your mind, Vestal. Well, all right, why don't you get out of here and quit bothering people while you can still walk? Julie killed herself, Adam. She committed suicide. What? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Because you never married her after all. It was just a year after you abandoned her in New Orleans. I think it has a lot to do with you, Joel Adams. What are your plans, mister? I see you got a gun in your belt. Gonna kill you. Oh, so? When? Now. Right now. All right, Vestal, draw. Leave the gun where it is, Kane. One thing I always promised myself, Adams, is someday I'd spit in your face. Why, you... Give me the gun, Adams. Right. He's dead. Well, he was going to kill me. You heard him. He wanted you dead, Adams, any way he could manage. I know it. That's what I say. You're under arrest for murder. For... What... It was a gunfight. Kane never even moved for his gun. Well, then I'll hang for this. He couldn't have got me any other way. No, don't suppose he could have. I remember the river gamblers used to say, don't matter how you win so long as you win. That Kane should have been a gambler. Maybe he was. Come on, let's go. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. And now for a special announcement. There have been many requests for information regarding our theme. It's called Old Trail and was written especially for us by Rex Corey, our musical director. If you will write to Gunsmoke in care of your local CBS radio station, we will try to give you whatever specific information you may desire. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, hear William Powell in a startling anti-communist drama titled The Man Who Cried Wolf. Remember to hear Suspense, starring William Powell, on most of these same CBS radio stations this Monday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network.
around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Heavy, Matt? Oh, somehow it was easier carrying him up to your office and back down, Doc. Where are you going to put me, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, well, on the couch here, I guess. Uh, uh, you be all right there, Chester? Oh, yes, sir. This will be fine. Good. I'm sure sorry I'm so much trouble. Chester, next time, try to land on just one foot. Even if you break a leg. I know. A man's in a terrible fix when he sprains both ankles. Mm, he sure is, Doc. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what you're going to do. You're going to stay right there on that couch, and you're going to sleep there, too. Maybe Doc and I will bring you in something to eat every day or two. Oh, no. It's better than you deserve. I know. I've been saying over and over to myself, Chester, you fool you. <clears throat> well... The wages of sin, Chester. <laughs> you were lucky to get off as easy as you did. <clears throat> the way I heard it. Uh, come on, Chester. Tell us what really happened, huh? <laughs> but I did tell you. I was uh, looking out this second-story window, admiring the view, so to speak. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I fell. That's all right onto the street. He didn't say whose window, Chester. In Texas, Doctor, a gentleman don't mention such things. You ain't in Texas, well, sometimes we should never laugh. <laughs> like now? Yes, like now. <laughs> Many a reputation's been ruined by just such loose talk that you're making, Doc. Never mind, Doc Chester. He's jealous, that's all. Oh, jealous? Uh, putting tracks in a man's yard? <laughs> Not me. Not by a long side. Why, no, sir. Oh. Good morning, Marshal. Oh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Oh, there's Chester. <laughs> Heard about you, Chester. I heard... Never you... mind what you heard, Torp. Chester just got thrown from a horse, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. What is it you want here, gentlemen? Yeah. All right, you tell him, Summers. Well, Marshal, it's about tomorrow night. Oh? Uh -huh. So what about tomorrow night? Well, you know, it's a roundup. The sales season's over. There'll be a thousand cowboys celebrating in Dodge. Well, they always do at the end of the season. What about it? Well, there's going to be more of them this year, and there'll be a lot of homesteaders in town, too. It's going to be worse than ever. Well, I expect that. There could be a lot of trouble, Marshal. <laughs> yeah, there could be, Summers. Just what is it you want? Well, we've talked it over, and uh, we want you to get a lot of good, tough men together, maybe about uh, 20 of them, and deputize them. That way, there won't be any trouble. Yeah, that's what you want, is it? Yes, we do. Look, Summers, my job's to keep the peace around here, and I'm going to do it, but I'll do it in my own way. Oh, I know, Marshal. Now, you but... turn 20 deputies loose in that crowd looking for trouble, and they're going to find it. As soon as the wild ones heard about it, they'd bunch up and shoot it out with every one of them. Why, it'd turn into the worst slaughter dodge you've ever seen. I think that's about the most fool idea I ever heard of. Yeah, no reason for you to talk like that, Marshal. I think it's a good idea. I sure don't want my place wrecked just because you're mule-headed. You're a gambler, Torp. So? So you can take your chances along with everybody else. Now, if you don't want that, then close your place up tomorrow night. Well, lose all that Texas money? <laughs> That's not likely. Now, we're not all gamblers, Marshal. They can wreck my dry goods store just as fast as a gambling house once they get started. And it's up to you. That's right. It is up to me. And we're going to leave it that way. Then uh, you won't do anything. I'll do everything I can. 
I don't know, Marshal. Look, Summers, I know you've got your doubts about me. That's natural. Some people think I'm too lax with front street. Some think I'm too severe. But that's the way of it in any town. If a peace officer does his job well, he pleases nobody. Marshal, we didn't come here for a lecture. What did you come for, Tork? Maybe you had in mind to help me pick out those deputies. Is that it? A matter of fact, I could, Marshal. Yeah, sure, sure. In a couple of hours, yours would be the only tables open for play. No, that's not what it's I... It's been had. done before, Torp. Is that too, Torp? We're not going to take his word for anything, are you? I don't know. But anyway, he won't listen to us, so it's his responsibility. Come on, men, let's get out of here. I hope you can handle it, Marshal. Goodbye, gentlemen. That torp is no good. He is just plain no good, Mr. Dillon. Well, I know one man that got skinned at his place, and torp gave him back $20 so he wouldn't be broke. Huh? Just how much did this man lose, Doc? Oh, well, five or six hundred, they said. And uh, then he... Uh... Oh, yeah, I see what you mean, man. I'm sure not going to be much good to you tomorrow night, Mr. Dillon. No, you can watch the jail right here, Chester. I know, but you just got to get somebody to help you out on the street. At least one man, anyway. You can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, but tomorrow night, Dodge will be overrun with trail boys and homesteaders, all looking for satisfaction. No, I wouldn't ask any man to face that. I know a few fellows who'd do it, and so do you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe, but I wouldn't ask anybody. How many were killed last year, man? I don't remember. Well, I do. Six, that's what. We buried them all in the saddle blankets. All except one. I remember he didn't even own a blanket. (laughs) Why, then he was sure out of luck all the way around, wasn't he? Come on, Doc. Let's go get some dinner. All right. We'll bring you a piece of bread, Chester. Maybe. I want a steak. Rare. (laughs) How come you're so hungry, Chester? Were you in such a hurry to get over there last night you didn't take time for supper? Mr. Dillon... I will answer no more questions about last night, and that is final. (laughs) Well, we'll bring you something. Yeah, I don't know if we should, though, Matt. A man can think about his sins better on an empty stomach. Close the door, will you? (laughs) (laughs) The next morning, I had Mr. Hightower print up some signs for me with a few rules that I made up for the roundup. They were fair and reasonable, and I hoped they'd be accepted without question. The principal restrictions were that there was to be no shooting, and no reckless riding in the streets. That afternoon, I went from saloon to saloon and left a sign at each one. The Texas Trail was my last stop, and there I sat down with Kitty for a short beer. Town's beginning to fill up, Matt. Yeah, it'll be swamped to the dashboard by dark. You, um... Expect trouble tonight? <laughs> I always expect trouble, Kitty. Yeah, I know. Matt, I heard something. Yeah? I heard Torp and a few of his men cut cards last night. So? I don't know who it came out for, but Low Man is supposed to kill you. Oh. Uh, when? Tonight, I suppose. Why is Torp after you, Matt? Uh, Torp says he wants an open town, Kitty. But what he's really after is somebody who'll close down every game but his. Mm. Who's this, Matt? What? Rough-looking traveler headed this way. What? Well, well, I'll be. Why, it's Zell Matlock. Matt Zell! You old badger. How are you? <laughs> Zell, it's been a long time. Hey, a long man. time. Here, come on over here. Sit down. Sure. Uh, I'd like for you to meet Kitty. Kitty, this is Zell Matlock. This is Kitty. Uh, I do know you, ma'am. <laughs> Just rode in to Dodge an hour ago. Yeah, it's your first time in a Zell. Hey, would you like a beer? Huh? Don't mind. Good. I uh, aim to get drunk tonight, but before I got started, I thought I'd look up the peace officer and shoot him. I'd be sure to tangle with him before the night's out. I always figure it's safer to do it sober. So <laughs> he, he half means that, kid. So I asked around and found out the man's name is Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. I've seen it all now. Well, I hope you're not disappointed. I'll, I'll tell you, Miss Kitty, I knew Matt Dillon before he got civilized. 
Why, we had to tie his leg up to give him a haircut when he came to town. <laughs> Don't you yeah. believe a word that he says, kid. Yeah, the wilder the coat, the better the horse, Matt. Mm-hmm. Well, you was all right. The only trouble with you was that fool honest streak you always had. <laughs> Are you rich now, Zell? Ah, nobody's rich on the Mexican border. Land of sunshine and pin of beans. Now, I hired out to a general over in Chihuahua three years ago. I lost 20 pounds and was lucky to get back at all. Well, haven't you learned to stay out of Mexico yet? No, I met the man he wanted me to shoot and turned out to be a better fellow than the general. So I told him I'd been hired to kill him and... Then rode for the border. The general lost three soldiers who tried to stop me from swimming the Rio Bravo. Uh, you must be pretty handy with a gun, Zell. Yeah, you're just fair, ma'am. But when I take my gun out, I go right ahead and use it. Some people stop and think for half a second. Um, there's a roundup in Dodge tonight. Matt's handling it alone. Kitty, what the... Yeah, no, no, hold it, hold it, man. I heard about it. I heard all about it, and that's why I'm here. To say hello... And uh, sign on for a night's pleasure. Give me a star, Matt. I've killed on the side of the law before. <laughs> I don't believe that. And anyway, I, I don't want any killings here. No, I was joshing you, Matt. I know what you want. It's true. I was sheriff in Tascosa for six months. You what? Yeah, it's in the record. Well, they caught up with me there, but I've already done such a good job taming the place that the governor pardoned me. <laughs> I won't kill anybody tonight that don't need killing. All right, all right, I believe you so. But uh, I won't ask any man to come in when it's as rough as this roundup may be. Well, you didn't ask me. Any other objection? Well, uh, the men don't know you around here, so no telling how they'd take to a stranger. First night I ran Tascosa, nobody knew me either. I'm not green at this business. Yeah, but it's Matt. my job. Why should you get mixed up in it? <clears throat> well, I I also heard somebody's planning a party for you tonight. Oh, you did, huh? I've owed you something for a long time, Matt. Oh, that's got nothing to do with no, it. It has. You got no right to not let me pay it back a little. Now there's a chance to. <laughs> yeah, you're just as crazy as you ever were. <laughs> That's better. Well, come on, let's go find me a badge before it gets dark. Sure, nice to have met you, Miss Kitty. Well, good luck, Zell. I'll see you later, Matt. Yeah, sure. So long, Kitty. Sure been a long time coming to Dodge, Mr. Matlock. What do you mean, Chester? Well, I've heard Mr. Dillon mention you a lot, but the way he talked, I wasn't never sure you were still alive. <laughs> oh, well, I was never sure either, Chester. You know, Zell isn't the most cautious man I ever knew. Well, you think being a U.S. Marshal isn't asking for an early grave, man? Oh, maybe. But at least it's a way to do some good before you die, whether folks think so or not. You no, know, men like Torp, that's all. Oh, no, Chester, even good men have got a strange twist that makes them suspect any man paid to handle the bad element. Hey, you just can't help thinking that some of its dirt is rubbed off on him. You know, I never thought about that before, Matt. Sure how it was in Tascosa. They wanted me there, all right, but they wanted me to uh, keep my distance, too. It makes a man kind of lonely. Yeah. They just don't know what's good for him, that's all. Uh, Instead of a real lawman, they'd rather hire some killer with a lot of notches carved on his gun. Well, there are plenty of them around. You sure are. Bragging kind. I never did like a man who has to notch his gun to keep his courage up. Yeah. My goodness. Look yonder. Mm-hmm. The street's about full already and it isn't even dark yet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, give yeah. me a hand here, will you? We'll move Chester's couch away from the window oh, there. All right. There, that should do it. Yeah, you'll be safer here, Chester, in case somebody gets it in mind to shoot up the jail. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. I can watch both doors from here. Uh, just hand me my gun belt, you will. Oh, yeah. There you are. Well, come on, Zell. Uh, Chester, I'll get somebody at the Dodge House to fetch up some supper, huh? Thank you, sir. And, and good luck, both of you. So long, Chester. I see you, Chester. Well, how are we working, Matt? Uh, I tell you, Sal, you take this uh, side of the street. Uh, I'm going up to the Dodge House, and then I'll be on the other side somewhere. All right. 
Oh, say, you mind if I go back later and get that Spencer carbine of yours? Make a mighty handy club if I don't have to use it any other way. <laughs> sure, it's yours. Who they got there? That fella on their shoulders. Oh, that's Mr. Hightower. He runs the printing press here. Shall, shall we stop it? Oh, no, no. They're just carrying him into the Longhorn to make him stand some drinks. Oh. They like Hightower. They won't hurt him. Well, I guess that sort of officially opens this here roundup, huh? Yeah, I guess it does. Well, I'll leave you here, Zell. Yeah, sure. Sure, man. And, uh, Zell, I, uh... <laughs> I want to thank you for what you're doing tonight. I ain't done nothing yet, but I'll do plenty if someone shoots you in the back. <laughs> I can promise that. Yeah. Well, I'll see you later. Sure, Matt. return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, Sunday nights, you are cordially invited to escape via CBS Radio. Yes, every weekend for drama that will take you right out of this world, listen for Escape at the Star's Address. Also, tomorrow evening, CBS Radio brings you Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday night playhouse. Now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. When I came out of the Dodge House, Front Street was so full that if anybody had been shot, the crowd would have carried him along like one of the living. I had a feeling that the word was out about Torp and his bunch cutting cards to see who'd make a try for me, and that the crowd knew it and was waiting for it. I stood for a while with my back against Summer's dry goods store, and then I left the street and cut down an alley thinking to change my position with as much irregularity as possible. I was passing the back door of the Texas Trail when I heard the first shot of the knife. I entered the saloon from the rear and made my way into the crowd. It's all right, Marshal. There's no fight. It's not all right, Sam. I made a rule that there'd be no shooting for any reason. All right. Who fired that shot? Oh, it's outside. It was Torp, Marshal. He, he just took a shot at the moon, that's all. Yeah. All right, Torp. Put the gun away and come over here. I'm bothering nobody, Marshal, excepting maybe you. Stand back, everybody. I said that's enough, Torp. No, it ain't, Dylan. This time I got the jump on you. You ain't pushing me no more. Torp's bullet just grazed my arm. Then I put one in his head and another in his chest. And at the same time, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure with a gun in each hand move out of the shadow of the alley and turn toward me on the boardwalk. And without really looking, I dropped him with one shot. And then I faced the crowd and waited for the next move. But for some reason, none came. Marshal? Yes, Summers. That uh, man you just shot, Marshal. Torp got what he deserved. Yes, I know. It's the other one that so I... So did he. Marshal, you'd better go take a look at that man. He's dying. Who is he? I don't know him, Marshal. But you do. What? He's wearing a star. No. No. Oh, Zell. Zell. Matt. I think that did it. No, Zell. No. It's my fault. I crossed the street a while back. Left the carbine with Chester. No fault of yours. Matt? That old, oh, there you are. Oh, Matt. Uh, how, how is he? Oh. Oh, oh, goodness. No use, Doc. Thanks. So I, I don't... Now listen. Listen to me, Matt. You did right. The only thing you could do. 
it was my fault. I shouldn't have crossed over and come up behind you. Anyway, Matt, I ain't been living on my own time ever since that day you pulled me out of the mob in Almogordo. I never thanked you for that. I guess I never will now. Matt. So long. I'll find someone to carry him over to your office, Matt. No. I'll carry him. What happened? I heard the shooting. Put a blanket on the floor there, Doc. Yeah, sure. Yeah, spread it out right here. He's dead, Chester. Well, who shot him, sir? I shot him, Chester. I didn't know it was him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. It sounds like they're going to hoorah the town after all, Matt. Sure does. No. No, they're not. It's going to be kind of hard to stop now, isn't it, Matt? Maybe. You taking a shotgun, Mr. Dillon? Matt, why don't you just let them fight each other? What are you going to do? I'm going to close Front Street. You're going to close... Oh, no, the party's over in Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you can't do that. There'll be trouble if I don't. The mob's tasted blood now. They'll shoot you sure as I'm laying here. Will they? All right, I can't stop you, but I sure do wish I could go with you. Yeah, Matt, I'll go. Maybe if they see me, they won't be so quick. Thanks, kinda... but this isn't your job, either one of you, but thanks. Close up and turn out your lights. What? You heard me! Now listen to me! Front Street's closed! Now get out of here and go home, all of you! My home is in Texas, mister. If you ever had one. I ain't going home tonight. Not tonight, I ain't. Don't interfere, fella. You got no chips in this deal. I could buy in, mister. <laughs> Now I'll use this shotgun for what it was meant on the next man. Well? All right, Sam, close it up. Yes, sir. Closed. Put out your lights. Huh? You heard me. Lock the place up. I know. I ain't going to do it. Now, don't tell me what you're going to do. All right, boys. We're closing up. I took care of the Texas Trail and the Longhorn, and I moved on through the Oasis and the Olifraganza, and then to the smaller bars that infested the outskirts of town. When I came back up Front Street, the crowd had thinned, its fever broken. I'd left Torp's place for the last, thinking to give his men a chance to get out of town before they faced me. It was a gambling hall on the same side of the street as the jail. And when I reached it and entered, there weren't more than a dozen men there. And most of them stepped quietly past me out into the street. What was left didn't seem to count for much. Looking for somebody, Marshal? You a friend of Torp's? Well, yes, I was. Why? Who else here worked for Torp? I didn't know Everyone's gone, Marshal. They heard you were all riled up and they left. And you're alone. 
And still in bad company. I wouldn't ordinarily take that. Well, go ahead, mister. You're calling it. No. Not now. What's stopping you? No, if it's the shotgun... Now, does that make it easier for you? I haven't been looking for you, Marshal. You were in on the cut, weren't you? Torp's dead, Marshal. Isn't that enough? Torp! Mister, one of the best men I ever knew died tonight. And I killed him. I'm not a gunman, Marshal. You wouldn't be proud killing me. What does a man like you know about pride? Now, you get out of Dodge and you get out fast. But I don't... You want to die in this place right now? No. No, I'm leaving. All right, hurry. Hurry. The rest of the night, I walked the dark, empty street alone. And just before dawn, I got a spring wagon and loaded Zell onto it. A couple of hours later, I buried him out by the Arkansas in a little grove of cottonwoods. Maybe I should have put a marker on his grave, but I didn't. What I did instead, I did partly out of scorn for the kind of men Zell said have to notch their guns to keep their courage up. And partly as a kind of a cross that I'd bear from now on. So instead of a marker on his grave, I took out my gun and I cut a single notch on it. Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Boehner and Harry Bartell, with Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, and James Nusser. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen to CBS Radio for Spring Byington as December Bride. And say, after you hear December Bride tomorrow night, listen for the important announcement about its new night and time on CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers and that's with a U.S. marshal and the smell of gun smoke
Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Need any more cartridges, Mr. Dillon? No. I got the greener loaded. Unloaded. I don't want a shotgun. Yes, sir. Do you want me to come with you? You want to come? No, sir. I guess not. But I will. Better stay here then, Chester. This make me a coward, Mr. Dillon? How do you feel? Like a coward. Lasseter scares me, sir. But you were willing to come anyway. Figure it out for yourself. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. If uh, I'm not back, don't forget those reports have to be mailed tomorrow. I won't forget. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. You ever get scared? Sure. Better keep yourself busy. Mind if I walk along? Not at all, Doc. Yeah, kind of anxious to get a look at this new corpse of mine. Lassiter's sure done us a favor picking Dodge to die in. <laughs> this will put us in the history books for sure. You're a little premature, aren't you, Doc? Not a bit. Oh, maybe a little foresighted. You know, they say the Lassiter's packing 18 slugs in. 18 slugs? My goodness. He sure has been in a lot of gunfights. Yeah. So they say. Mm-hmm. Guess he's got the biggest gun rep in this whole section. Outside of maybe Ben Thompson or Wes Harden. And you, of course. <laughs> he's waiting at the Alafraganza, Doc. You better not walk in with me. Oh, don't you worry. I'm not sticking my snoot into no shooting. No, sir. <laughs> hey, Marshal. Yeah, what is it? You are going to win, aren't you? I sure hate to work on the bodies of my friends. Makes it too damn personal. I'll do what I can, Doc. You watch him close, Marshal. Don't let him pull a hide out. Hello, Lassiter. Hi, Matt. Been a long time. Yeah. Drink with me? Why not? Harry, two whiskeys. Harry, get up from behind the bars. Sure, Mr. Lester. Sure. <laughs> oh, don't spill it. Leave it on the bar, Harry. We'll pour our own. Yes, Marshal. Yes, sir. Here, sir. How's your shoulder, Lester? Aches a little, bad weather. Still carrying your lead, Matt. There you are. Yeah. You should have killed me, Matt. Maybe. It was a long time ago. Matt, I want you to know I bear no grudge. But it has to be. I know. We're gunfighters, you and me, both the same. Yet not the same. What's in our blood? That's why, Matt, that's why I have to brace you. I got to know for sure. There's no grudge, Lassiter. Hey, your health. And yours. Straight up. Straight up. You call it. Now. Oh, it was beautiful, Matt. Simply beautiful. Was it? Why, yes, and it was close to... For a moment, I wasn't sure who... Oh, yeah. well, Marshal, your neck, your hit. Just a scratch, it'll be all right. But here... Let, let it go. Go and get Lassiter, he's all yours. Hmm? Well, of course. And you'll be happy to know he's got 20 slugs in him now. I couldn't tell anyone, but the bitterness ice in my stomach made me sick as I remembered Lassiter as a friend now dead by my gun and then I got over it I always got over it 
The frontier code was a harsh one. I knew my job was one that had to be done if the West was to ever see peace. As long as killers like Lassiter lived, I'd carry a gun and use it. It was the way it had to be. Sometimes a man's dying was the end of it. And sometimes the beginning of something worse. Marshal Matt Dillon? Yeah? What can I do for you, miss? Died. Well, miss, I, I don't know. If... It's Mrs. Mrs. Lassiter. Oh. You see? You've done quite a bit for me already, Mr. Dillon. You've made me a widow. Sit down, Mrs. Lassiter. Here, let me get you some no, thank water. You. I, uh... I didn't know Lassiter was married. Would it have mattered? No, I guess not. You're just like all the rest of them. A killer. Lusting for blood like a wild animal. Mrs. Lassiter. Only your words. You hide it behind a badge. My husband was in town less than two hours, but you couldn't wait, could you? You saw your chance to get a little bigger reputation. Matt Dillon, famous gunfighter. Matt Dillon, murderer. It was your husband that sent the challenge, Mrs. Lassiter. I'm sorry for what happened. And if I can help you in no, any way... No, thank you, Mr. Dillon. I only came to tell you that you haven't heard the end of the Lassiter name. I'm going to see that you're stripped of that big reputation. And you're going to die. Mrs. Lassiter, is there anything I could say that you would listen to? Nothing. And good day, madam. Till we meet again, Marshal. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon. United States Marshal. Marshal. Marshal Dillon. Over here, son. What's the trouble? Marshal. Why, that's Will Thompson's young and Mr. Dillon. What is it, kid? What's wrong? Yeah. Mom, they burned our house. Got the fences. Four of them. My sister. My sister, they, they... They rode in and shot. He's been shot. Hold that lamp down here, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. Blood all over the back of his shirt. Will Thompson, he's a homesteader, isn't he? That's right. Came to Dodge City about three months ago. Took up a section over on Mulberry Creek. Uh, Mr. Dillon, you want me to go get the doctor? No. Boy doesn't need a doctor now. <laughs> House is right, Mr. Dillon. It's still burning. Yeah, what's left of it is. Watch yourself now, Chester. Yes, sir. No sign of life, though. Whoever did it's probably long gone by now. Mm. No reason to hang around. 
Now, let's tie up here and look around on foot. Bring up your carbine, Chester. I got him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, they even fired the corn crib. Now, why would anybody want to... What's there? What is it? It's a dog. Shot. A dog? When they even shoot the dogs, it's a... You see something? Yes, sir. It's Will Thompson. I think it's Will. What do you mean, you think it's what... Scalped. You was Indians, Mr. Dillon. They couldn't have been Indians. Only tribe reported in 20 miles of Kiowas, and they wouldn't do anything like this. They've been peaceful for years. Yeah, I don't know, but... Come on. Let's find out what happened to the rest of the family. Yeah. Besides Will and the boy who rode into town, there's Ms. Thompson and a daughter. Girl about 17, pretty as a picture. Yeah, there's something lying over there by that cottonwood. Yeah, I see. Well, I guess we found Will's wife. Mm-hmm. She's alive. Yeah, if you can call it that. Scott her on. Take a look for the daughter, Chester. Yes, Mr. Young. Uh, uh, it's all right, Miss Thompson. It's all right. It's all right. Mary. My, my daughter. They, they took her. They dragged her away. Easy, ma'am. Easy. I, I, I tried to stop them. I held on to one of them. He kicked me loose. And his, his spur came off. It's here, somewhere. It's on the ground, somewhere. On the ground. Yeah, I see it. My daughter. I took care of it. My baby. There now. My baby. There now. It's all right. We'll find her, ma'am. We'll find her and then... Miss Thompson... Well, you're better off, ma'am. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Over here in the willows. I found her. All right, Chester. She's pretty as a picture. Seen her in Dodge. Walking down Front Street. Pretty as a picture. Yeah. All right, let's ride. First, then if Alisco Pete's not there, we'll try the other salon. I bet his boss is here. He's here every night. Yeah, I know. Follow me in, Chester. Just keep him off my back. I'll take care of the rest of it. Yes, sir. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, thanks. Well, look who's here. Matt Dillon. Hiya, Kitty. What brings you in, sweetie? Business? Or pleasure? It's not pleasure. Ah. Plenty of other men in Dodge, Kitty. Are there? They come in here, don't they? Sure. They come in. I talk to them, and I drink with them. That's my job. You follow me, Matt? I follow you. I'm off at two every night. Kitty, have you seen Holisco tonight? No. He hasn't been in, Matt. Ben Rourke's sitting over there at a door table, though. Good, I'll talk to him. I'll see you, Kitty. Sure, Matt. Sure you will. Uh, I think 
I got a pretty good hand here myself. All right, boys, here's where money talks. I'm raising another hundred, and I'll stand pat. Ben? Huh? Well, it's the marshal himself. I'd like to talk to you, Ben. All right, Matt, talk. Not here. We'll go over there by the bar. I'm sorry. I'm busy. I got a fat hand and a cinch back. Maybe. This is official, Ben. Me? Hey? Ben and I want to talk to you. Now, come on. Take over my hand, Donnelly. I'll be right back. All right, Matt, let's have it. What do you want to talk about? One of your cowboys, Ben, Jalisco Pete. What about him? Know where he is? I'm around somewhere, I guess. Why? I'd like to know if he lost his spur recently. Tonight, in fact. It's pretty, ain't it? Mexican silver, needlepoint, raw gold inlay. Pete's the only man I know in Dodge who's got a pair like this. All right, I'll see that Pete gets it. He'll appreciate your finding. I doubt that. I found it lying beside a woman he just kicked to death. Will Thompson and his whole family were wiped out a few hours ago by four night riders. You know anything about it? How would I know about it? Your boys call you King Rourke, don't they? Never heard of one of them pulling anything without being sure you'd back him up. Matt, are you claiming I was in on this? You're a cattle rancher, been an open range man. You boys all hate the homesteaders coming in with their plows and fences. Been a lot of fences cut by night riders. No, it's murder. You haven't named me yet, Matt. A couple of months ago, here in the Long Branch, I heard you say you'd get the homesteaders out of Ford County if you had to burn them out. Well, did you? Sometimes a man gets known as a fast gunslinger and it goes to his head. I asked you a question, Ben. Then he gets himself a tin star and goes around bothering people. Ben, if you're figuring to draw on me, don't. Why not, Matt? I've seen you in action. You're not fast enough. Now, I asked you a question. And maybe I don't feel like... What's going on in here? Nothing. Oh, there you are, Marshal. How are you? <clears throat> Marshal, what's this I hear about an Indian uprising? There's been none that I've heard about. Whole family massacre, the way I hear it, sir. Murdered and scalped. Scalped? Two of them were. So it was Indians. What game are you playing, Matt? Indians don't cut fences, Ben. That's a cattleman's trick. Scalping, too? Could have been an afterthought. It wasn't an Indian who lost that spur. Well, we'll soon find out about it. I'm riding into the Kiowa country with Troop C tonight. I hope you won't do that, Colonel Blake. You know the Kiowas are peaceable enough when you let them alone, but if you push them, they'll fight. True enough, Marshal. We can't let them get away with it. The Indians weren't responsible, Colonel. I got evidence to the contrary. Give me 24 hours and I'll prove it. Well, I certainly don't relish stirring up a tribal war, but... Just 24 hours. Well, all right. Ben, if you know where Jalisco is, you better turn him in. It'll save trouble. When any of my boys need discipline, I take care of it. Not this time. Other people are involved. Homesteaders. Squatting on a measly 320 acres apiece. Ruining the whole country. They got rights, Ben. Who says so? I do. Morning, Marshal. Good morning. Any luck, Chester? No, sir. I just stopped by the jail here to see if you'd found it. I wish I had. I'll head out again in a few minutes. Oh, this fellow's been waiting for you all morning, Mr. Dillon. Is that so? My name's Ezra Hawkins, Marshal. We ain't met before. I got a homestead up the river. It don't leave me much time to get to town. I see. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Hawkins? Well, it's about what happened to the Thompson family last night. The other homesteader sort of appointed me to speak for the whole bunch. All right, speak. Well, we want to know what you aim to do about it, Mr. Dillon. I aim to get the killers. When? Mr. Hawkins, I've been up all night trying to get an answer to that question. If you've got any information to offer, fine. If you haven't, then... What's up, Chester? A trail herd hit town, I guess. Damn, pull up, boys. 
Give him a pretty sign. Dodge City Jail. Come on, let's decorate it. <laughs> let's go, Chester. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Hold it there. Hold it. My, my. Jail is occupied, boys. You men just blow into town? We ain't talking to men, Sheriff. These are curly wolves from the circle of far feet. They're rough as stuff as I'll fit in the pan. And you're not talking to the sheriff. I'm the U.S. Marshal. You the range boss? That's right. Red Dudley. What about it? Dudley, we got a new law here against shooting off firearms inside the city limits. Yeah? You mean like this? <laughs> no, Dudley, I mean more like this. Now, come on down off that horse. Well, come down off it. Watch it, you he's got a knife. Yeah, so I see. Well, nice work, Mr. Dillon. Drag him in and lock him up, Chester. Throw some water on him. Yes, sir. All right, curly wolves. Your boss is jailed and fined $50. You can get him out tomorrow morning. We got the money for that. Take him now. I said tomorrow. Now on the move. All of you. Get! You handle things right fine, Marshal, once you get started. Thanks, Hawkins. Only trouble is some of us homesteaders are getting kind of impatient. The cattle ranch has been treating us pretty bad for too long. The boys are all meeting at my place today. I reckon I can hold them back till tonight. You know what I mean, Marshal. Yeah. I saw it happen in Abilene. Dirty and bloody. I'd hate to see it happen here. Sure, I know what you mean. Range war. Well, yeah, I sure we can hold an inquest any time now. I'm all finished with the autopsy. All right, Doc. It goes pretty fast when you can line them that way, four in a row. Makes the job a lot easier. Yeah, I imagine. Doc, have you ever seen a range war? No. I hear there's one boo. There is. Plus Indian trouble. If I don't bring in Jalisco Pete before tonight and find out who his three partners were, you're going to have bodies lined up 20 in a row. Well, it should bring in a lot of fees. I could retire and buy myself a ranch. Sure, Doc. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh, that sounds like Chester, Marshal. Yeah, he's been scouting those thickets along the river bottom. Mr. Dillon, I brought in Jalisco. Where is he, Chester? Outside, tied on a pack mule. Good. No, sir. I'm afraid it ain't so good. He's dead. Been shot in the back and scalped. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, CBS Radio, in cooperation with Time Magazine, makes available to you, free of charge, a valuable convention handbook packed with facts and sidelights about American national political conventions. This convention handbook, containing a convention map and box score of interesting pictures and a complete history of this old American custom, will be yours if you send a postcard with your name and address to Time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. That's time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. And now, with William Conrad, starred as Matt Dillon, here's the second act of Gunsmoke. A second now, Martian. Here, here, here it comes now. Ah, ah. Ah, there's the bullet. If it'll do you any good. It won't, Doc. Uh, the slugs I dig out of the bodies all look alike. Someday, though, they may figure a way to tell them apart. 
Maybe even tell which gun fired which bullet. Oh, no, not a chance of it, Marshal. Well, I guess that's all I can do for the late lamented. Oh, you see he's only wearing one spur. Yeah, I know. I got the mate to it here. That's what I wanted to talk to him about. Uh, it's too bad, Marshal. He's talking days over. Yeah, somebody made sure of that, all right. Then tried to cover the trail by scalping him. Well, I can tell you one thing. It wasn't done by Indians. That's my guess, too. I've seen how Indians do it. Down in the territory, up in the Dakotas. Slick and clean. Nothing like this. Why, I could do a better job with my eyes closed. Yeah, I bet you could. Well, I guess I'd better get ready for the rush. Looks like a showdown, Marshal. And I don't see any way that you can stop it. Neither do I. <laughs> Hiya, Kitty. Business again, Matt? Well, I was looking for Ben Rourke. He isn't here. He left about an hour ago. Some of his boys came after him. Matt, I... I waited for you last night. I worked, Kitty. All night? Yeah. There's a bad feeling in the air, Matt. What is it? What's going to happen? I wish I knew. They called all the soldiers from Sea Troop back to Fort Dodge this afternoon. I hear they're planning to move out tonight. I hope not. There's been a lot of homesteaders in here drinking today. That's unusual for them. What's going to happen, Matt? <laughs> the bloodiest mess you've ever seen. And I don't know any way of stopping it. If I'd only found Halisco Pete before they killed him, now I got nothing to go on. Halisco came in here last night, late, after you'd gone. Huh? Well, why didn't you let me know? There wasn't time, Matt. He heard he was wanted, and he left right away. His friends with him. Friends? What friends? Oh, I'd never seen him before. I think Pete had known him in the Pecos country. They're all pretty drunk. How many were with him, Kitty? Three, I guess. One of them was named Red Dudley. Red Dudley. And one called himself Tulsa Jim. He kept talking about the Circle Bar yeah, B brand. it might be. It might be. They could have ridden in last night ahead of the herd to look up Pete and then they... Oh, Marshal. Say, you better come on outside here if you want to stop a lynching. Come in, Doc. Be careful, Matt. Be careful. What is it, Doc? It's Ben Rourke and some of the cattle ranches. They caught themselves an Indian and they're going to string him up. I doubt it. Let us stay clear of this, Matt. We know what we're doing. I hope so, Ben. Who have you got here? One of the murdering skunks who wiped out the Thompsons. Any objections? I might work up some, Ben. What's your name, fella? He won't talk to you. He hasn't opened his mouth. Look, fella, as an Indian, you're a ward of the government. I'm a U.S. Marshal. I represent the government. I'm here to protect you. Now, what's your name? Keith Doxwa. Work hard. Good man. No kill. What makes them think you did? Say kill people. No kill. He pleads not guilty, Ben. Sure he does. And maybe he can explain why we caught him two miles from my ranch house. Is that reservation? What was he doing there? Yeah. Come on, ask him. Ask him. Mr. Rourke? Maybe I can tell you what he was doing. What? Ezra Hawkins. One side, if you don't mind. You let me through here, please. Let, let him stand. Thank you. Thank you. We got tired of waiting, Marshal. We come on into town. Maybe that was a mistake, Hawkins. Maybe. You have to play it the way you see it. Look, mister, let's have it. What's this all about? I'm a homesteader, Mr. Rourke. Well, I accept your apology. It <laughs> <laughs> weren't no apology. I just wanted you to know who those hundred men across the street were. And they all got guns. A hundred, huh? Well, there's 30 of us, so the odds aren't bad. What's on your mind? This Indian's been working for us, Mr. Rourke. Tracking down fence cutters. Maybe that's why you caught him within two miles of your house. Got the nerve to come out and say what you mean, homesteader? 
You bet I have, fence cutter. All right, hold it. Now, you're covered, Ben, and you too, Hawkins. This play's gone far enough. Not giving a man a chance to draw, Matt? Not this time, Ben. All right, Katoxa, climb off that horse and get over here behind me. Move slow and stay out of the line of fire. You men, if either side makes a move, Ben and Hawkins will be the first to get it. You understand? Doc, take us in into your office. Oh, sure, sure. Right away, man. Well, Matt, what's the next step? You can't keep us here with our hands in the air forever. I don't intend to. I got one of the murderers locked up in jail. I want you two to come along and listen to his statement, but leave the questions to me, all right? It's just fine with me, Marshal. Sure show, Matt. Good. Come on. Chester? Chester? Looks kind of deserted, Matt. He may have gone back to the cells to see... Chester? Move on, Joe. Ben, Hawkins. What's the matter, Matt? Here, I'll get that gag off of him. You cut the ropes, Ben. Right. All right, Chester, here we go. Easy now. There. What happened, Chester? Oh, they slipped in and got the drop on me, Mr. Dillon. Took Red Dudley with him. There was two of them, not more than 20 minutes ago. Who were they? Did you know them? Nope. Circle Bar B boys, I think. They slugged me and thought I was out, but I heard them talking. They were all in with Pete on the Thompson killing. Yeah, I know. And they killed Pete, too. I was afraid you'd make him talk. The question now is, where are they? I know where. They are Kansas rooms. They are Kansas, huh? They planned to hole up there till it got dark. Maybe they've gone by now, though. Maybe not. Want some help, Matt? No, thanks, Ben. It's my job. Mine and Chester's. Come on, Chester. Let's go. The room in the house is all dark, Mr. Dillon. That doesn't mean a thing. Watch the windows. That's you, Dylan. Drop behind that water trough here. Use your carbine. It's more accurate. Yes, sir. All right, Dudley. Come on out. You're under arrest. Come and get it. Fire at the flashes, Chester. That came from the side window, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, and the one there's somebody behind the other corner. So... Yeah, there was. Break the front of the building, Chester. Yes, sir. I got one. He's hanging out the window. Yeah, it's two down. Dylan, and... hold your fire. I give up. All right, come on out. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. It may be a trick. It's up to him. Come on out, Dudley. Well, hurry it up. I'm coming. I got a, I got a bullet in my leg. I can't hurry very fast. You, you got me all wrong. Watch it. He's drawing. Ah! Wrong, Chester. He started to. See if you can find the doc and get him to help you pack these things over to the jail. Yes, sir. Right away, Mr. Dillon. Matt? Are you all right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right, Ben. Had a clean sweep, huh? Looks that way. Well, bullets are cheaper than a rope. I guess so. Ben? You and your boys aren't murderers like Red Dudley, but this business of fence cutting can lead to a range war, too. Like it or not, Homesteading's here to stay. There's more of them coming in on every train. I know all that. Those cattlemen built this country, Matt. A few more years now, they'll have us fenced out of it. Times change, Ben. There's range still left out west, New Mexico, Arizona. Yes, I know. Some of us have been thinking about it. Matt, they'll fence you out, too, you know. Yeah, I guess they will. <laughs> well, when that time comes, I'll move on. If I'm still around. Farms and families. Next thing they'll do is set up courts and bring the law in here. Law's here now, Ben. In Dodge City, I'm the law. <laughs> Gun 
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Lou Krugman, and Georgia Ellis, with Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Vivi Janis, and Johnny McGovern. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNair is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Jungle Legacy is the name of tonight's adventure with Tarzan. Listen as Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, faces a band of unscrupulous men who seek a uranium deposit in Tarzan's realm, through which they hope to rule the world. Don't miss Jungle Legacy tonight, when most of these same CBS radio stations bring you Tarzan. It's packed with thrills, packed with action, packed with tense atmosphere. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember... Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Howdy, Marshal. Hello, Mr. Biggs. Can I give you a hand? No, no. This is the last match. Here. Hey, wait till the flies get to these buffalo hides in the morning. Be enough vultures overhead to keep the place in the shade for a week. <laughs> yeah. You know, you'll sure have your hands full by tomorrow night. Yeah, it looks that way. When these boys turn them hides into cash, they'll bite the corks out of every bottle in town. <laughs> and some of them look mean enough sober. Yeah. Well, you better bed down and get some sleep, Mr. Biggs. Uh, where are your boys? I don't know. Jeff had some trouble with the dry axle up near Pony Rock, and Boaz stopped to help him fix it, but they shouldn't be this long behind me. Well, if I see him, I'll tell him where to find you. You, you can tell Jeff, but Boaz ain't even going to hear you. Oh, why? What's the matter with him? Oh, he's riding higher than an eagle. You know that white buffalo you've been hearing about? The albino? Mm-hmm. Why, well, it's just Indian talk. Oh, you think so, huh? Well, if it is, Boaz sure shot himself a mighty scared buffalo. <laughs> White as borax. Uh, that ought to fetch a price. Hey, anybody seen Marshal Dillon? Oh, over, over here, Chester. You better saddle up, Mr. Dillon. What's the matter, Chester? The Indian trouble. Two men dead and a couple of wagons burned up out there. I found this. A war rattle. Made out of buffalo toads. Arapaho. Well, they haven't been making any trouble. Well, these did. I, I was topping a hill when I saw the wagons go up in fire. It was Indians, all right. I saw one ride off. That's funny. I never heard of Arapahoes attacking at night. How far out, Chester? Ten mile, maybe. Toward Pawnee Rock. Pawnee Rock? Marshal, my sons are coming from there. Easy, Mr. Briggs. Lots of wagons in the church. <laughs> Marshal, I didn't see another wagon between here and Pawnee except the ones we had, but... The Indians killed my boys. There's only one way to make sure, Mr. Big. Saddle up and ride over to my office. I'll be with you as soon as I can get my horse. I cut back through those button willows over there when I spotted the wagons being fired. We must be close to it, then. Just over there. 
Right down yonder. See him? Yeah. I see him. We rode up and dismounted. The last glint of hope in Mr. Big's eyes died. His boys were there, all right. And it wasn't nice to see. Kill him. I'll get him, please. I'll murder every red skin in the territory. We gotta bring your sons in, Mr. Biggs. You know what the morning's gonna be like. You don't want to leave him out here. Now come on. Hey, look. Down there by the stream. Yeah, four of them. And they're not saddle horses. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs. You yeah. recognize those horses down there? I... Yeah. I know them. Teams belong to Boaz and Jeff. Indians must cut them loose from the wagons before they fired. Doesn't that seem curious to you, Chester? In what way, Mr. Dillon? Why didn't they take the horses with them? Yeah. What are you thinking, Marshal? No burned hides in those wagons. So they stole them. Yeah, they stole them. But Boaz and Jeff both have their rifles there beside them, and the horses are left behind, too. Horses and guns are the first things Indians would go for. What are you looking for, Mr. Dillon? Those buffalo hides weren't carried off without wagons. Yeah, here. Marks the two other wagons here, and they're fresh. I didn't see any other wagons, only these. Well, they'd finish and gone before you got here, Chester. Well, yeah, but I, I'd have caught up to any wagons on the trail to Dodge. Did you go by regular trail? Well, no, I... I figured the Indian I saw wasn't alone. I didn't want to get bushwhacked further on. You didn't see any Indian, Chester. But Mr. Dillon, just as plain No as... Indian would leave guns and horses. This job was done by white men. It didn't take anything that could be recognized or identified. You mean that somebody's in Dodge by now with the hides my boys worked and sweated to get? I'm afraid so, Mr. Biggs. Uh, there'll be more than 300 buffalo hunters there by morning. It could be any of them. We'll find the right ones. Oh, how? The albino. Whoever killed your sons will have that white buffalo hide. <laughs> It was almost sunup when we got back to town, and more wagons had jammed the main street lining up for the unloading barns. I rode down the line, looking them over one by one. Howdy, Marshal. Some of the men would take their money, drink it up, and drift away. A few would stay long enough to be buried on Boot Hill. Then suddenly a wagon driver up ahead pulled out a line. Oh, hey, hey, wait a minute, Jim. Hold it there. Take your hands off that seat. Now take my hands off since you get back to your place. Hold on. I'm tired of waiting now. Let go of that bit, mister. Don't do that, stranger. Get your hand away from that gun. Well, now. No, there's any law around you. There is, so don't try making your own. You got no right grabbing my team. I got plenty right when he tries to in in front of me, Marshal. That's a lie, Marshal. He cut Never his mind. Blood. You both want to cool your heads out in jail? Now, what's your name? Tennessee is good enough. A lot of people from Tennessee coming into the territory. Most of them are pretty peaceful. That sounds like you're saying I'm not. You move pretty fast for that gun. Man can lose his temper. You lost yours four times, according to the notches you've carved into that gun butt. But don't try for number five, not here. How about you? What do you call? Charlie Kell. Charlie Kell, huh? They ever call you Chuck? No. Heard of a Chuck Kell a couple of years back. Come from Kentucky. Not me. Man I heard about was a gunfighter. So he never wore gloves. See, you don't either. It's pretty rough on the hands. Thanks, Marshal. I'll make sure to take better care of them. Yeah, do that. I'll be around a while, Marshal. Maybe we can have another talk. 
Any time. They'd need watching. But what I wanted now was a white buffalo hide. Searching the wagons wouldn't do. There wasn't time. And the search had let the killers know that something in the hides they'd stolen could be identified. The time to find out would be when the buyers checked them. I got Biggs and Chester to cover two of the unloading barns, and I covered the third one. And then finally, daylight came, and the haggling started. Son, you want to sell those hides? Better learn how to handle your skinning knife a little better. They're as good as any. They're full of holes, they ain't. Give you four dollars a hide for the bunch. You gave that last fellow eight. <laughs> He looked tougher than you. <laughs> six. I'll take six. Four. Take it or leave it. You think you can rob me, mister? Watch your mouth, boy. Here, you just... Here none of that. Let me go. Easy, son. Go. Let me have that gun just so you won't be tempted. Here, that's better. Give me that. Give it back. You can pick it up at my office whenever you're ready to leave town. Yeah, you look like a city boy to me. Where are you from? St. Louis? None of your business. When something's got you beat, son, there's no shame to admitting it and going home. Sometimes that takes a real man. Don't tell me what to do. Why don't you watch your own job? Why don't you leave me alone, Marshal? I ain't got a white buffalo hide. What'd you say, boy? You heard me. What do you know about a white buffalo hide? What everybody else knows, that you're looking for one. Everybody in town knows it. How? Because the old man whose sons were bushwhacked all liquored up over at the other barn, shooting off his mouth. Don't go away mad, Marshal. <laughs> Mr. Biggs wasn't at the barn where I'd left him. I cut through an alley to Front Street and headed for the saloons. I never got to him. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? What's the matter, Chester? Old man Biggs. Where is he? I'm looking for him. Well, he... He was over by the barn I was watching. Drunk. Going through the wagon. Yeah, I know about that. I was trying to get him to go back to his own barn, but all of a sudden, he took off. For where? I don't know. But there was one wagon he was watching in particular. The driver walked away from it with a package of some kind. That white hide? It could have been. I don't know. But Big sure thought so. He lit out after a fellow with blood in his eye. Which way? Down there where the boy's been hitching the empty wagon. Well, let's go. The old boy's drunk enough to make trouble. He's liable to kill somebody. Or get killed. Too late, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. It came from there behind that row of wagons. You stay here, Chester. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. When I rounded the corner wagon, Mr. Biggs was sprawled across a wagon tongue, his eyes dead and open, staring at the ground. And standing over him was Tennessee, a smile on his face, and his gun extended to me butt first. Looks like I'm in the mite of trouble, Marshal. He's dead, Tennessee. That's more than a mite. Uh, you take my gun for a while. You mean until after you hang? Wasn't figuring to be that serious. Not when a drunk follows me out here and throws down on me. If you're figuring on self-defense, forget it. Look at his gun. It isn't even caught. Well, it's out of his holster, Marshal. That's enough. Law don't say I have to wait till he kills me. You'll have to make a jury believe that. No, you I... shouldn't have much trouble doing that, Marshal. What are you doing here, Mr. Kell? Oh, I just happened to follow Tennessee out here. Why? Well, you broke up our little argument in town. Thought I'd get him alone here. See if maybe he was still nursing a grudge he wanted to settle. But the old man beat me to it. Now, Tennessee here ain't exactly a friend of mine, as you know, but... I hate to see any man hang when he ain't guilty. Is that your personal verdict, Mr. Kill? That's right, Marshal. The old man threw down on him, and Tennessee had to kill him in self-defense. Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Which one of them had the package? This one. This is the fellow the old man was after. All right, Tennessee, where is it? I don't know anything about a package. Look in the wagon, Chester. Chester. 
See anything? Nothing here. I reckon you can give my gun back to me now. All right, Tennessee. Here. Thanks. But if you decide to use it again while you're in Dodge or any place else in Kansas, I hope I'm there when you do. Well, now, don't you fret, Marshal. I'm sure you will be. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, action excitement thrills. That's Gangbusters. Gangbusters helps to fight crime by fearlessly naming the criminals... Listen for it later this evening on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Just before sundown, we buried old man Biggs and his two sons up on Boot Hill... By the time the service was over and I rode down, darkness had fallen. And everything was going full blast. The town was roaring. Seemed like a good man, old Biggs. He was, Chester. So were his boys. Yeah, but there are too many men like Tennessee and Cal coming in, Mr. Dillon. They won't last, Chester. They'll keep coming, but they won't last. They'll take a gun and go against a man, but they won't sweat. They won't take root and build. We still gonna look for that hide? Yeah. Well, just what do you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? Tennessee and Kel will be in town, but their wagons are back there with the other empties. Ride back and look them over. Well, they might have had somebody carry that package off for them. It might be, but they don't seem like partners, Mr. Dillon. From what I heard, you stopped them from gunfighting. Took more than one man to kill the Biggs boys, and more than one man and more than one wagon to cart the hides in. Well, you mean they staged that trouble just for you? Just for me. After they heard, I was looking for that white hide. Well, why do you figure that, Mr. Dillon? When gunfighters start for their guns, nothing stops them, Chester. They both started, but they both stopped. I reckon you better take a look through those wagons. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Uh, where will I meet you? I'll be checking the saloons. <laughs> One by one, I made the stops. The Long Branch, the Alafraganza, the Texas Trail. And one by one, they got quieter as I went in. As though each place was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. The last place was a Mexican hangout. A long, dark walk. Marshal? Can't see me, can you, Marshal? No. No, I can't see you, son. Too bad. Because I got another gun. They sell them around here. And I ain't going back to St. Louis. You'll fire once, son, and if you don't kill me with that, and I'll kill you. I'll gamble on that, Marshal. <laughs> He lurched from the shadows into the street, staggered, and fell. And then he rolled over on his back, and his eyes struggled for a minute like they were trying to remember something. And then he went blank. Well, he is right about one thing. He wasn't going back to St. Louis. Well, what do you know? The marshal's real handy with a gun. Stay out of this, Kel. But I may have something to talk over with you later. You mean what? If you don't know it, then you got nothing to worry about. 
I've been hearing a lot about how fast you are with a gun, Dylan. Anything to it? I'm still alive. Yeah. This your hobby, shooting kid? He was old enough to try to kill me. I don't like it, Marshal. That's too bad, Mr. Kell. The Chuck Kell I heard about would have loved it. They said he'd killed two kids under 16, one of them his own brother. No, you didn't hear the whole story, Marshal. The Kell you heard about killed a Marshal, too. You made the bid, Mr. Kell. And you got a gun. Use it or I'll take it away from you. Come and get it. Anytime. Here it is. How you feeling, Mr. Dillon? I'm all right, Chester. Doc fixed your head. Wasn't much he could do for Kel, though. I hit him. If you didn't, he sure died for nothing. He was fast, all right. Boys say you made him look like a sleepy burro. Never even cleared his holster. And my head says different. You didn't get that from Kel. What do you mean? Tennessee was up the street with a rifle. He creased you. Huh? Where is he now? I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He rode out of town before I could stop him. I was the only one who saw him. I was coming up street to find you. All right. Let's get out of here. Did you find anything in the wagons? No, sir. But I found Tennessee's wife. Wife? That's right, Mr. Dillon. In a small wagon next to his. He's a squaw man. His wife's an Indian girl. Well, let's find her. All right, Chester. Which way? Edge of town, Mr. Dillon. Well, let's go. You talked to the wife? Yes, sir. Found out Tennessee and Kell were friends, all right. They left her here night before last and arranged to meet her here today. She said they were driving empty wagons when they left her. Ask her what tribe she belonged to? Didn't have to ask, Mr. Dillon. I could tell by her beads. She's an Arapaho. She was there, all right. Crouched by the wheel of a wagon. Her face was bloody. And she stared into a small campfire. Rocking back and forth without a sound. She wasn't beat up when I left her, Mr. Dillon. Where's your husband? He... gone. Gone where? He... gone. Tell me which way he went. And I'll bring him back to you. No. You... lawman. Your husband had a white buffalo hide, didn't he? Tell me. No. Other man... Kill what buffalo. Then your husband took the hide away from him? Well, he buy. He buy hide. He didn't buy him. He killed two men to get him. He killed with Indian paint on his face. He left an Arapaho war rattle. He wants the blame to come to your people. If the white men think the Arapahoes are on the war path, the soldiers will come. No. Arapaho, peaceful. Where's the white hide? What'd your husband do with it? He tell me. Bury it. Where? Where's it buried? There. Back there. By tree. Go dig it up, Chester. And then stay with her till I get back. You going after him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, as soon as she tells me which way. All right, Mr. Dillon. You're white man. No good. Now, tell me which way he went. You let him go. He not come back. I can't let him go. If I do, the soldiers will come after your people. He beat you, 
and he ran away from you. Now he'll bring death to your tribe unless I get him. Where did he go? He... He ran to where moon sleep. I rode east. Tennessee had had about an hour's start, but I figured to make up most of that before sunrise. The prairie was open and flat except for an occasional roll. And the Arkansas River would keep him from cutting south. His best bet for a fresh horse would be Kinsley, and I rode hard for it. It was just turning daylight when I rode in. Well, howdy, Marshal. Morning. Good morning. Got a place I can water my horse? Trough right there. Just let him loose. He'll find it. Thank you. Looks like you come a long way. Dodge. Now, the fella here just a few minutes ago been riding hard, too. He come from up Pawnee Way, though. Tall, dark, riding a vinegar roan? Yeah, that's right. You get a fresh horse here? I'd send my boy out to Corral to get one for him. He'll be back soon. You mean he's still here in town? Yeah. Asked about breakfast, so I sent him over to the Witter Hilliard's place. Uh, right over there, across the road. Thank you. I'll be back. Say, you after that fellow, Marshal? Understand your servant breakfast, ma'am. Why, sure thing, Marshal. Dylan! That's right. Give me a clear way out the door. Or I'll kill you. Come by me, Tennessee. I'll come shooting. That's all right. But just be sure you get me this time. You hurt, ma'am? No. I'm all right, Marshal. He looks kind of dead. Yeah. Bad one, hmm? Huh? Yes, um. Gunfighter, thief, killer. What's your name, Marshal? Dillon, ma'am. Matt Dillon. I, uh, I'm sorry about Marshal, when my husband brought me out here 15 years ago, Indians burned this place down three times. I'm used to killing. You want to carry him out? I'll go fix you that breakfast. Thank you, ma'am. It's a long ride back to Dodge. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Joel Murcott, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Stan Waxman, John Daner, and Larry Dobkin, with Sam Edwards, Lillian Bayef, Tom Holland, and Mary Lansing. Barley Bayer is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Something new in CBS Radio Newsroom coverage, World News with Robert Trout presents as a special weekly feature an interview with a crack CBS Radio News correspondent. This correspondent flies in from his post overseas to give you his authoritative eyewitness viewpoint on latest developments. Tomorrow afternoon on most of these same stations, World News with Robert Trout. 
This is Clarence Cassell speaking. And remember, from now to November, you'll find intensive, impartial campaign coverage on the CBS Radio Network. West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. That's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Sure is hot today, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Used to get hotter in Sweetwater, though. Uh, Texas? Yes, sir. It, but I wasn't there very long. No. <laughs> what'd you do there, Chester? Oh, I was a salesman, Mr. Dillon. Salesman? <laughs> well, what'd you sell? Lightning rods. Lightning? Oh. Well, now, they're good things to have, Mr. Dillon. Why, I had a line of well, lightning rods. Why, now, don't explain you... it to me, Chester. <laughs> Too hot. Well, I'll go get us some beer. Maybe that'll help. I don't think I want any beer, Chester. Well, then, why don't you just go take a CS to Mr. Dillon? I'll stay here in the office. <laughs> Why don't you just leave me alone, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. Hey, the marshal. Yeah, what do you want, Doc? A couple of cowboys been feeding their liquor over at the Texas Trail. That's what saloons are for, isn't it? Yeah, they were giving Kitty a bad time. Oh? She got rid of them now. But they're down at the end of Front Street now, making remarks and pestering the town ladies. It just might lead to trouble. Well, I'm not going to walk down there in this heat just to lecture a couple of hard-nosed cowboys. I'll go, Mr. Dillon. Oh, good, Chester. You go, huh? Just tell them to take it easy and leave the ladies alone. Yes, sir, I will, Mr. Dillon. Texas, real men down there, not like these short grass Kansas. <laughs> All right, boys. Now that's enough. Who's this? The preacher, maybe. That's him. Boys, <laughs> Marshal Dillon sent me down here, and we're gonna send you right back, fella. Mister Dillon said you can have all the fun you like, but to leave the ladies alone. That's all dang trouble these Dodge ladies. They've been left alone too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what they need is a couple of big-handed Texas men. Yep. <laughs> Look, now, now, why don't you go over there to the Alphaganza? I- I'll buy you both a beer. You will, huh? Well, that's mighty thoughty of you, mister. We just don't want any trouble, that's all. Sure we don't. And I got an idea how we won't have any. Wait till I get on my horse here. Stay with our friend a minute, Trevor. Hey, mister, I'll make a bet. What kind of bet? What do you mean? Any kind. You name it. Come on. 
Well, but I don't... I got him! He spilled his gun, Trevor. Pick it up and grab your horse. Get this rope off of me. Maybe it'll wear off, mister. You're going for a ride. Drag him! Tobo, drag him! Let's go! Chester, Marshal. What? What? Who got Chester? A couple of cowboys. The ropesmen dragged him out of town. Come on. Well, well, which way? West. I'm going with you. Hurry. Uh, come on, right. There they are, but they're not dragging anything. They must have cut him loose. Now, there he is, by that sagebrush. Yeah. Chester. Chester. Get that rope over his feet, Channel. Look at him, he's bleeding all over. They tore him to ribbons. I'll stay with him, Marshal, if you'd like to. No, Shiloh. Go get our horses, huh? I want to get him back to the dock right away. All right, Marshal. So, Chester, I got you now. We'll be at the dock soon. Easy, Chester. Easy, fella. Easy now. I'll uh, carry him when you get tired, Marshal. I won't get tired, Shiloh. Not for a long time. Well, Doc? Yeah, he's in bad shape, Marshal. The worst is something's bothering his breathing. I don't know what it is. We'll just have to wait and see if it goes away. If he lives the next few days, he'll pull through. Oh, Doc. No, I, I know, I know, I know. But I'll stay right here with him. Now. Why did I have to send him? Why didn't I go? Oh, and I don't blame myself, I Marshall. told him to go, didn't I? Yes, but... Uh, Doc, can, can I talk to him? No, no, Marshal, no. Not for a while. All right, then. Would, would you tell him this for me? I'm going after those men. I'm going to bring them back. Alive. Or at least half alive. In the street outside, waves of heat move back and forth, making things seem unreal. Like Chester lying up there at docks. That seemed unreal somehow. I walked down to the jail, and I went inside, and I sat there for a while. And then all at once, I got up and unbuckled my guns, and I hung them on a peg behind the desk. And I went over to the Texas Trail. I'm over here, Matt. Sit down. Matt, I heard about Chester. How is he? Doc doesn't know for sure. Oh. They were in here bothering you. Who were they, Kitty? I never saw them before. One was a kind of weasel-faced man named Trevitt. And the other? Big man. Real brute. Named Stobo, I think. I see. What outfit, they say? Would it be the crow track? Yeah. The crow track's holding a herd up the river. Thank you, Kitty. Wait a minute, Matt. Yeah? It's no business of mine to ask, but where are your guns? It would have been easier for Chester if they'd have shot him and killed him. But I don't see... So I'm not going to shoot them. If Chester dies, I'll see him hanged. Otherwise... Otherwise what, Matt? I don't know. But I'm going to bring him back and... And we'll wait and see. 
You're taking an awful chance. Maybe. Oh, Matt. Please be careful. Sure. Uh, Kitty? Yeah, Matt. Look in on Chester once in a while, will you, maybe? Oh, of course I will. Don't worry about him. Thank you, Kitty. So long. What is it, Shiloh? I'll walk outside with you. Marshal, I want to ride after those cowboys with you. No, Shiloh, I'm going alone. But we could use you here at the jail. Here? I'm going to take two prisoners. I don't know when or how, but I need a jailer when they come in. So I'll bring them in with you, and then I'll... No. That's something I have to do alone. Marshal, you're a stubborn man. But... Okay, I'll do it. Keys are in my desk. Uh, here's my horse. I'm going now. Hey, uh, wait a minute, Marshal. You're not armed. I know it, Shiloh. Goodbye. Who's the trail boss here? Where is he? Here I am. And I don't need any riders. Maybe not, but you got two riders I need. How's that? Just what do you want, mister? That's the crow track outfit, isn't it? That's right. I'm looking for a couple of your men called Stobo and Trevin. They ain't here, mister. And where are they? They come back this afternoon, picked up the gatherings and left. Didn't even wait to get paid off. I'm telling you this just because they're no good, and I'm glad they're gone. Which way'd they go? I wouldn't tell you if I knew, mister. I didn't think you would. Who are you, anyway? I'm a U.S. Marshal out of Dodge. That's so? <laughs> well, I don't know what you want them for, and I don't care, but... How you going to take them, Marshal? Put salt on her tail? <laughs> <laughs> you ought to at least take a club if you're going after that Stobo. He's mean, he's big. Besides being a Texan. <laughs> We've hung Texans up here before, mister. Marshal. Yeah. I heard Stobo and Trevitt say they were heading west, following the Arkansas. Where are you from, son? Texas. Near Waco. And what are you sniveling around and forming on these men for? That Stobo kicked me. Knocked me down and kicked me. All right, son. I'll ride along the Arkansas. But you ride back to Texas and learn how to fight your own battles. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the conventions start next Monday when the Republican Party takes over Chicago. CBS Radio's greatest reporting names and a core of technical experts manning mobile units and studios covering the convention floor and corridors are all set to bring you history as never before. Whatever happens, wherever it happens, you'll miss nothing when you tune in the conventions on CBS Radio starting next Monday. Now... The second act of Gunsmoke. I cut straight down to the Arkansas and followed it west. I rode close to the water where I could use the sound of it for only my cover. After an hour or two, I spotted a hobbled horse alone. Stobo and Trebek must have separated I got down and followed the animal's tracks as best I could in the moonlight until I caught the dying coals of a campfire on the bank ahead. To one side, I could make out the huddled figure of a man asleep in his blanket. It took a long time to crawl to his head where I saw the weasel face of a man trepid. 
His gun belt lay on a saddle blanket in easy reach. I stood up and heaved it out into the river. And as Trevitt sat up with a snap, I kicked him back. <laughs> Don't shoot! Don't shoot! You sit up again and I'll smash your skull, Trevitt. Don't kill me! Don't kill me! Shut up! Now, where's your rope? <laughs> I told you to lie down! Now, where's your rope? Under my saddle there. He gonna lynch me? No. But you may hang legally if you live that long. Now keep your arms in that blanket and lie still while I get you roped up here. Who are you, mister? Yeah, that'll do it. Let's just say I'm a good friend of a man you dragged out of Dodge this morning. Stobo was in on that, too. It was his idea. He did it. Don't worry. I'll find Stobo. You gonna leave me like this? I'll be back. You ain't even carrying a gun. Too bad for you, I'm not. Now, Trevor, I'm gonna throw you across my horse and tie you on. He'll take you under Dodge right to the jail. When you get there, tell Shiloh who you are if you can still talk. And he'll give you a nice, clean cell. You're the marshal. I'll be back when I find Stobo. You can't do it, Marshal. I'll die in that sun. Ride like that across a horse. No, no, listen. Stobo's about a mile upriver. We had a row and I left him. See, I, I told you, Marshal. Uh, let me go now. Trevor, how would you like to go to Dodge behind my horse with a rope around you? No, 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 don't, no, no, don't, Marshal. Don't kill me. I'll pack you on now. <laughs> Tied Trevor across my horse and started him off in the direction of Dodge, and then I forgot about him. Stobo was next. I rode west on Trevitt's horse. Dawn was just breaking when I saw him. Crouched behind a campfire, cooking breakfast. His horse was saddled and stood nearby. I rode straight up, got down, and walked over. You lost, stranger? No. I'm not lost. Stobo. No tricks, mister. I don't see a gun, but no tricks. Relax, Stobo. I'm unarmed. Who are you? Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Out of Dodge. You're a long way from Dodge, Marshal. Stobo, you and your pal had some... Fun with a friend of mine yesterday. You hurt him bad. Maybe you killed him. <laughs> you rode out here without a gun to tell me that? You're the craziest marshal I ever saw. <laughs> I'm going to shoot you, marshal, and bury you in the river. What do you think of that? I expected you would. Huh? But unless you want it on your conscience that you refuse to feed a man on the trail, you better give me a piece of that pork first. You're about the coolest man I ever saw, Marshal. Do I eat? <laughs> sure you do. Sure. You just stand right there across the fire and don't move. I have to shoot you before you've been fed. I know. It's too bad I... Only got one dish for your last meal, Marshal. A man can keep sassy on meat alone, Stobo. <laughs> yeah, he sure can. Well, looks about done. At least this here piece says you can't... All right, I got your gun, Stobo, so don't try anything. You burn me, you burn me! You Just a few coals that won't hurt you. Now shut up and get on your horse. Oh, kill you for this, Marshal. You can't hurt me like that. On your horse! Come on now. Get up there. Now, you just sit there, Sobo. I'm going to throw a noose around your neck, so keep your hands down. There now. Now, you ride toward Dodge. And you do anything I don't like, and I'll jerk you off your horse and drag you the rest of the way. Now, ride. <laughs> J. 
Tails on the left. You see it? I see it. All right, pull up. Shiloh! Shiloh! Well, hello, Marshal. This other one? Yeah. Try to get here. More dead than alive, but he's here. It was rough, Marshal. Real rough. Yeah. Shiloh, how about Chester? Tell me. Doc ain't sure yet, but he's alive. Lock Stobo up. I'm going over to Doc's. All right, you get down. Walk straight or I'll shoot you through both knees. Chester was asleep, but the doc let me take a look at him. Seemed to me he had more trouble breathing than before. But the doc said another day might see him out of it. And there was nothing I could do. So I went up for a steak and some sleep. And the next morning I went back to the jail. Morning, Marshal. Is everything all right, Shiloh? Doc looked over your prisoners. Trevor's pretty sick yet, but Stobo's all right. Got a few burns is all. Nothing could hurt that moose. A hanging might. Sure, but what if Chester pulls through? You can't hold us in, Marshal. There's no law that says... I don't like the sound of your voice, Trevor. But you can't Be hold quiet. Don't worry, Trevor. There's nothing... You too, Stobo! Uh... Shut the door, Shiloh. I don't even want to look at him. Stobo's a mean one, but I feel kind of sorry for Trevor. And go cry about it someplace else. I don't feel sorry. Don't you take it out on me, Marshal. I didn't send Chester off to do my job. I, uh... Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry. Go get some breakfast, huh, Shiloh? I'll, I'll, I'll wait here now. Uh, I'll be back later. <laughs> Doc? What? Well, what is the doc coming? <laughs> Chester. He's going to be all right. But... You sure? Why, of course, Marshal. His breathing suddenly changed. The pressure's off somewhere. Oh, he's going to be fine. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. <laughs> of course, he'll be in some pain for a while yet. But... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Doc, I'll, I'll come see him in a little while. I'll tell him for you, Marsh. All right, come on, Trevin. Where to? Come on, I said. What's up, Marsh? I'll be back for you, Stobo. Now get going. Come on. <laughs> Stobo did it. Not me. You, you can't do anything to me. Shut up. Trevor, your horse is down at the National. Go get on it. You turning me loose? Get your horse and ride, and don't ever come back to Dodge. Not while I'm alive. Now go on before I change my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Sure, I'll go. I turned him loose. Now, come on, get out of that cell. Am I free, too? You will be in a little while. So the doc, Marshal. Chester's... Hey, uh, where are you going with Stobo? Going to shoot me in the back, probably. That right, Marshal? I'm going to do what I should have done three days ago when I sent Chester after you. Bring him outside, Shiloh. Let's go, Stobo. Slow and easy. Bring him over here, Shiloh. You're going to drag me, is that it? You try that. That's what you do, isn't it, Stobo? Don't try. Never mind. Shiloh, hold my guns. Here. What the... (laughs) Oh, I get it. You're going to fight me. Marshal, you're crazier than I thought. Why, I'll tear your throat out. 
If he wins, let him go, Shy. Maybe I will. I said you'll let him go. All right, Marshal, all right. Maybe you are crazy, but I guess this is your party. Come on, Marshal. <laughs> I'll make it short for you. Real short. Stand back, everybody. Get back, do you hear? You're big, Stobo. But you're stupid. You're ugly stupid. Why, you... I'll kill you! I'll kill you! No! Give me my guns, Shallow. Here. You don't look too good, Marshal. I'd better get that doc. He's hurt, but he isn't dead. If he can't ride, throw him on the stage. But get him out of here. If I see him again, I'll shoot him. Chester, can, can I come in? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. My, what happened to you? I, I've been lecturing a couple of hard-nosed cowboys. One in particular. Oh, I, I see. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. Those two sort of got the drop on me. Yeah, they sure did. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I've been thinking, and, and, uh, yeah, what is it, Chester? Well, Mr. Dillon, I, I, I'm not much help to you here. Maybe I better just... That's uh, enough, Chester. Well, but I, I've been thinking Well, that... just stop thinking. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Now, look, Chester, I'm going to tell you something. I, uh, I, I need you here. You see, you're the only man in Dodge I can really trust. The only one. Yes, sir. Well, you you can trust me, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I, I, I know. And I'm thanking you, Chester. <laughs> but you, you're sure no help to me lying there, you know. No help at all. Well, I, I don't even stay here long. The doc says I'll be up and around again... Look, uh, Chester, I, uh, I, I tell you what, I, I'll go get patched up and then we'll make Kitty come over and fix us some steaks and we'll, we'll have some beer too, huh? Well, what do you say? My, that'd be fine, Mr. Dillon. My, I'd sure like that. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Paul Dubov, Lou Krugman, and Georgia Ellis, with Don Diamond, Gil Stratton, and Jack Crucian. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Millie, this delightfully funny little secretary is heard from every Sunday evening here on CBS Radio. 
Audrey Totter stars as Millie, a gal with a one-track mind on the subjects of love and marriage, especially where the boss's son is concerned. Remember, you can now meet Millie every Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, tune in history starting next Monday. Hear the Republican Convention on the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. United States Marshal. Hey, all you pretty travelers, you listen to me. You gotta get welcome to Dodge City proper like. Hey, you there, mister. I said you. You addressing me, sir? I reckon I am. You a preacher? Not exactly. You dress like a preacher. If you'll excuse me. Back up, fancy pants. If you ain't no preacher, I figure I'm making you dance some for the folks. You think you can hoorah me? Dude, I said dance. Dance or the next shot will take off one of your toes. I don't think I'd like that. Doc, no. All right, Thorne, put up the gun. Marshal, you got a wild and woolly town here. Marshal, you move aside. I'm going to make this grinning dude kick up his heels for us. I'd say that might be quite a trick, Thorne. Unless he's changed a lot since I last met him. Have you, Doc? Not for the good, Matt. <laughs> I was afraid. For you pacey face tenderfoot. I said for Shut you... Shut up, to... Thorne. He's drunk, Doc. He's dead. You just don't know it yet. I'll take it good if you'd meet me later at my office. All right, Matt. To you. Well, that's sure a lot of talk. Now I'm going to shoot that dude's boot heels. Fire one shot and I'll pistol with you, Thorne. What's that? You're kind of forgetting who's holding a gun, ain't you? Oh! I wasn't forgetting. Oh, my wrist. You broke my wrist. I doubt it. Now let's go to jail. Oh, you can't put me in jail. I'm Thorne Finley. Move. Oh, you wait like hell, Big Jack, about this. And I will, too. Do that. He might be grateful to me for saving your neck. You pulled some fool stunts, Thorne, but you've never been closer to dying than just a minute ago. Do you mean from that fancy pants? Oh, I could handle six like him. That makes you a lot of men. I can name a dozen pretty good gun hands who can't handle one of it. What? That's Doc Holliday. <laughs> Salute, Doc. That sounds worse, Doc. Yeah, I got orders to go to Arizona. 
air is dry there. Better for my lungs. Going? Thought I might. Wyatt invited me to visit him. He and Virgil and Morgan of the law down there. Some little mining town called Tombstone. <laughs> well, it sounds peaceful anyway. If it isn't, it will be by the time Wyatt Earp gets through. He is the peacemakingest man I ever met outside of you. <laughs> Matt, who was the teller head down at the depot, anyway? No, oh, Thorne. He's just a spoiled kid. Kid? Couldn't be much younger than you. Sure, but Thorne never grew up. His father has coddled him and protected him and gotten him out of scrapes ever since he was a pup. He's never had to be a man. Not with Big Jack Wet nursing him. Big Jack. Big Jack Finley. Oh, you know him? I've heard of him. Well, that figures. He owns about half of Kansas. Star in a box runs more cows than he can count. Swings a lot of weight and dodge. Yeah, too much. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, somebody said that Doc Holliday had come into town today and he... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's all right, Chester. Why don't you shake hands with him? Don't mind if I shake with my left hand. It's a kind of habit. Yeah, I know. Mr. Dillon has the same habit. He would. How about dinner tonight, Matt? Sure, sure. <coughs> How long will you be in Dodge? Not long. <coughs> Just till I finish a chore. Oh? Uh-huh. That uh, chore have anything to do with Big Jack Finley? Might say so. It's gonna kill him. Got to close the door, Mr. Finley. You're going to turn my boy loose? Or I'm going to have to do it for you. You got a writ of habeas corpus? Writ? Thorn didn't commit no crime. The charges are drunk and disorderly, disturbing the peace, and attempted assault with a deadly weapon. I was. You still need a writ. But man, Judd and Nathan does what I say, and you know it. Don't you think I can get a writ? I'm sure you can and will. You always do. Then what's the point, Dylan? It's just a lot of useless red tape. It's a law. Close the door on the way out. All right, Thorne. Didn't I tell you Big Jack would get me out? When are you going to learn you can't play? Save the speech. The law can't touch a Finley. You ought to get smart, Marshal. Like you? Sure, like me. Hi, Big Jack. You okay, son? Fine. Anything else, Mr. Finley? Why, yes. Uh, uh, my boy here is a little boisterous sometimes. I know. High-spirited, you understand? Uh-huh. So? So, I want to put a stop to all this nonsense of yours, arresting him every time he kicks up his heels a bit. Now, go on. Well... I'm offering you a job. Let's say, protecting my interests. Two hundred a month. And no work, naturally. <laughs> I see we understand each other perfectly. No work, of course. All I have to do is just shut my eyes whenever Junior here breaks the law, huh? I said we understand each other. There's no need to elaborate on it, Dylan. There's a big need. Only how do I explain to a person like you that some men don't wear a price tag? Huh? How do I explain how I feel about a so-called respectable citizen making the law his private doormat? Hey, you're nothing but the stupid gunman I've always thought you were. I understand you took the part of Doc Holliday against my son. I kept Thorne from committing suicide, yeah. You sided with a notorious killer against an important citizen of this community. Now I'm telling you, Dylan. Holiday. I don't want him in Dodge tomorrow. Doc may be a gunfighter, but he's clear with the law, Finley, and a better man than your son will ever be. What? Why, I... That hurts, doesn't it? You... I'm serving notice, Marshal. You run that killer out of Dodge City, or I'll do it myself. <laughs> Big Jack Finley. Cattleman and self-made king of southern Kansas. No better or worse than most of the men carving empires out of the West. Until love for his son blinded him to the fact that Thorn Fenley had gone bad. 
From here on, I knew the war was on between Big Jack and me. So Big Jack Finley's going to run me out of town, huh? Yeah. Unless I do it first. Oh? I do something naughty, man? Well, you threaten a man's life. <laughs> that. <laughs> And just between friends, man. Anything else, Doc? Not murder. Murder? I can give him an even break. Uh, with you, that's still murder. Uh, don't you think you better tell me about it? Mm-hmm. What if I don't tell you? Now, yeah, then my job's to warn Fenley and try to protect him. You're a tough man to be friends with, man. <laughs> it applies to you, too, doesn't it? Guess maybe it does at that. Didn't realize how I put you on the spot by spouting off my good intentions. Sorry. Oh, forget it, forget it. <coughs> you want to talk to me? <coughs> All right. Remember a girl named Ruth Davis? Mm-hmm. Died in a riding accident a few months ago. I always wondered if that wasn't suicide. She lost her brother two weeks before that. No accident. No suicide. You sure? Sure. You know, Ruth and her brother ran the ranch alone. Mm -hmm. A man started pestering Ruth, and she hated him. Her brother kicked the man off the ranch. This fellow dry gulps Ruth's brother made it look like a robbery. You have any proof of this? Yeah. Ruth was afraid to go to the law, so she sent a letter to me. Here, read it yourself. She says the man was Finley and says she expects him to try and shut her up for good. Well, that doesn't mean it's Big Jack. I went to see Ruth's folks. They had her belongings. Among them, I found this. Hmm. Watch chain. Engraved J.F. on the clasp. Jack Finley. You see why I've got to kill him, Matt? He forced Ruth's horse over that cliff, sure. But do you still think she died accidental? No. But who's responsible is something for a court to decide. Court? With Finley's money and influence, he wouldn't spend five days in jail even if he was convicted, which he wouldn't be. He doesn't own the court. Maybe not, but it's still the most powerful man in the state against a dead girl whose only friend is Doc Holliday. How do you think a judge will decide? Doc, I'm going to ask you a favor. Make it one I can give. I got an idea, but uh, you must let me handle it my way. Give the law a chance. All right, Matt, I can wait. Thank you. I'll keep this letter in chain for a while. All right, but if the law fails, I'll brace Big Jack Finley when he walks out of the courthouse. And you'll be bracing two men, Doc. Finley and me. Fine day. Well, you're up kind of early just to bring me a weather report, aren't you, Judge Nathan? Huh? Oh, well, I I want to see you. Now, go right ahead. You mind if I finish shaving? No, no, please do. Uh, just thought I'd chat with you about the... About uh, the Fenway's? Uh-uh. Uh, yes, sir. It seems that Big Jack's very upset by your attitude. I'm not surprised. Feels you're a little rough on his boy. I am. Then his boy's a little rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, perhaps Thorne is high-spirited, like uh, yesterday. Yesterday he was just plain high. Tell me, Judge Nathan, how do you like being on Fenley's payroll? Uh, what? You know, you used to be a pretty decent person. Oh, uh, you can't talk to me like... Yes, I can. I'm sending a copy of Thorne's record to the governor. Governor. And with it, I'm sending a list of the rich you've issued to get him out of jail and a copy of the court records. I've only tempered my justice with mercy, that's all. Thorne's been arrested for 18 offenses, convicted of 10, spent no time in jail, and paid a total of $15 in fines. I'd say you've been very merciful. Um, you said you were sending this to the governor. You haven't actually mailed it yet? No. You got an out. Not that I don't feel justified in any decisions I've made, but 
Uh, such a report might cause undue talk at the Capitol. And ruin your political hopes. Well, my conditions are simple. Get off Finley's payroll now. Very well. And give me cooperation from here on, no matter who's involved. Do that and I shelve the report. I'll do it. Mr. Dillon, trouble's a making. What kind of trouble, Chester? It's Big Jack Finley, Mr. Dillon. He's rounding up his crew at the Alfraganza. They're going to ride Doc Holliday out of town on a rail. Did you cut yourself shaving? <laughs> Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, don't forget, starting Monday, CBS Radio's tremendous new staff will start bringing you the complete coverage of the Democratic Convention in Chicago. As you found during the Republican Convention, CBS Radio never misses. So, starting Monday, stay with CBS Radio all day and evening for the Democratic Convention. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. escort you out of town. On a rail? Yeah, that's the general idea. Here, take a shotgun. Yeah, I'll hide it under the covers, modest like. Yeah. I'll wait against the wall here. Good. That'll put him in a crossfire. If it comes to that. If there's enough of them, we're in a spot. Yeah, likely we are. You're risking your neck to save me some bruises. One I owe you, friend Matt. It's my job. Still one I owe you. I'll shoot the man who takes another step. You think you're going to stop us, Dylan? I think so. Me and Doc. Doc. Show him, Doc. Sure thing, Marshal. Look, boys, surprise. I sure do love surprises. Dylan, I've got a dozen men with me. Well, sure, about six of them will die, Finley, if you don't crawl out of here fast. And guess who'll die first, Big Jack? You there, Moncrief. I always figured you for some brains. Get your boss out of here, quick. You sure talking sense, Big Jack. Shut up, Moncrief. You showing yellow. Oh, but man, there's nothing here for us to die over. Listen to him, Finley. That greener Doc is holding has 18 buckshot in each barrel. He'll get slaughtered if he triggers that thing. And I'm getting edgy, Finley. And me, if I get a coughing spell, I'm liable to shoot without meaning to. All right, all right. <laughs> this is twice you have made a Finley back down. You'll never get a third chance. Let's get out of here. Matt, when are you going to arrest him? When I'm ready. Not long. I hope not. Getting impatient to see that man dead. your message, Marshal. I hope it's important. It is, Moncrief. How long have you been foreman for Big Jack? Fifteen, sixteen years. You know him pretty well. Would he be the kind to kill a girl? No, of course not. Because he'd kill a man if he got mad enough that he wouldn't kill no girl, Marshal. Well, I have proof that he did. A girl and her brother. But it doesn't set right. I'm hoping you can help. What's your proof, Marshal? A letter that names Finley as the man. Ruth Davis wrote it before she died. Ruth Davis. And this watch chain was found with her belongings. It's engraved on the back. I know. I uh, was with Big Jack when he bought this chain in Chicago. 
It was right after his wife died. Big Jack wear it all the time? Mm. You, uh, rode the right hunch, Marshal. What? Thorne is your man, just like you figure. He had a yen for the Davis girl, but he kept it quiet. Because he didn't want it known, she throwed him over. But the watch chain... Big Jack gave that to Thorne on his 25th birthday. Whole ranch can testify to that. Mm. Good. All right, thank you, Moncrief. You, uh... Gonna try and arrest Thorne? Why? If Big Jack believes Thorne killed that girl, it'll break his heart. Broke her neck. If he don't believe it... Then? He'll protect Thorne. And, Marshal, there's not enough lawmen in the state of Kansas to make Big Jack give up his son. Judge Nathan. Uh, uh, Holiday. Oh, yes, I've heard of you. I've heard of you too, Judge. Wonder which has heard the worst. Uh -uh. What's that? Uh, Why, I... uh... Judge, I'm here on business. Oh, of course. Uh, Come in, won't you? In my study here, so we won't be disturbed. Now... What is it, Marshal? I want you to swear out a warrant for Thorne Finley's arrest. Charge murder. You sure you want to go with me, Doc? I'm sure. (coughs) All right, hold up your right hand. Oh, no, Matt, you wouldn't make me a lawman. If you go, you go as my deputy. I'm not letting you make this a private fight. And with my friends, if they hear I wore a star... All right, Matt, it's your show. You swear to uphold and enforce the laws of this community, the state of Kansas, and the United States, to the best of your ability as deputy marshal, so help you God? All of that? All of that. I swear... Here, pin on this badge. All right, man. You know, I'm feeling this badge is going to cramp my style something terrible. Better breathe our horses going up through this pass. We've still got a good ride ahead. How far? Oh, about ten miles. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Matt? Will they fight? Well... on the other side of the pass behind you. That's being smart, Dylan. Queen will drop you if you touch a gun butt. You're handy at this bushwhacking, aren't you, Thorne? If Doc He's is... all right. My slug seems to have bounced off his thick skull. Good. Yeah, let's pull your teeth. Well, better you do it. With your left hand, reach down and across slow. Pull your gun out with your fingertips and toss it away. Nervous? Just cautious. Or maybe this queen doesn't exist, huh, Thorne? Queen! Queen's one of Dad's men, but uh, I pay him extra to work for me. Any more questions? I guess not. There's my gun. The rifle next. I, uh, I got a pen knife in my pants pocket. You know why Holiday came to Dodge? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you do. You wouldn't be riding with him. Well, he's not going to tell any stories to my dad or anyone else. Uh, you can't kill us, you stupid... Not planning on killing you. And what have you got planned? A queen's kind of a magician. He's going to make Holiday just disappear folks won't care much about one of his kind. I would. 
I'd care so much I'd hang you for it. No. No, with Holiday gone, it's your word against mine. And you won't be able to approve a thing, Dylan. You sure of that? I'm sure. Otherwise, I'd take care of you along with Holiday. Now get out and start walking back to town. It's like I told you. Law can't touch a Finley. <laughs> no time for heroics, so I walked. When I reached a turn, I cut back through the rocks, but it was too late. They were gone. And with them, the horses, guns, and Doc Holliday. Two miles up the road, I found my horse turned loose. And with a mind full of cold hate, I raced onto the star in a box. On the front porch of the ranch house was one of Big Jack's men. Hold it right there. Out of my way, mister. I'm in no mood to shake hands. Where are you heading, lawman? You don't hear well. Dylan! Where's Holiday? Friend? How should I know? Get off my ranch. And where's that prize son of yours? What? Trot him out. I want him. Do you now? What on earth for? Thorn. Put that gun away. Oh, no. This is just in case the marshal loses his temper. I've lost it, Junior. Sure. Dylan, I've had all I'm going to stand from you. You just think you have. Where's Holiday, Thorne? Where'd Queen take him? Holiday? Why, well, I haven't the faintest idea. Where is Queen, Dad? The righty fence line, but... See, what... Marshal, we don't know where your friend is. You're under arrest, Thorne. What's that? Ask him to show the warrant. Here. Read it, Finley. What? Oh, no. No, th th that's not possible. The judge wouldn't issue a warrant without proof. He has proof, Thorne. This is a lie. Thorne couldn't be guilty of murder. No. Take a look at his face. Son. Daddy's trying to frame me. D don't let him get away with this. No, I won't. I won't. Get out, Dylan. Man, open your eyes. This is not going to help you. You heard me. I don't believe you, your warrant, or your proof. I believe my son. So get off this ranch. Get out of the state. You let me see you again, so help me, I'll kill you myself. Forget me, a buck in the law, you can't. I'm in do my own law. You so do I. Doc Holliday. But you're supposed to be dead. Queen was supposed Queen's to. Queen's the one who's dead. I carry a knife in my boot just for men like him. Thorne. God help me. You are guilty. He sure is. And if he knows any prayers, he'd better get them over with. No, Doc. He goes back with us as our prisoner. You're wrong, Marshal. I'll take care of my son. Dad. Dad, no. You rotten, lying, murderous. Please, pup. please don't, I Dad. should have strangled Stand you in the me. cradle when you were... Stand away from the Don't shoot you all. Manley, look out. I threw myself at Fenway and both of us hit the floor, rolling away from Thorn as he raised his gun to fire. Then in the doorway, the blood-stained, terrible figure of Doc Holliday went into action. His pale hands blurred over his holster. Ah! The Ruth Thorn! Uh, uh, Ruth? Uh, Thanks, Chester. You sure you want to stay around a while, Doc? Yeah, we're good friends, Matt, but you're a peace officer. I guess I'm not a very peaceful man. <laughs> you could be, Doc. <laughs> no, I'm not going to change, and you shouldn't. Law needs men like you. No, if I stayed there, there's too good a chance I might cross you. Yeah. Then I'd have to meet you over gun barrels, and it's one thing I'm afraid of. So long, Matt. Good luck, Doc. My. I never would have thought Doc Holliday was scared of meeting anyone in a gunfight. Hmm. You don't understand, Chester. Doc's afraid because he might beat me. Gun 
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Harry Bartell as Doc Holliday, with Lee Millar, Nestor Piva, Ralph Moody, and Tom Tully. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Sunday evening, we invite you to join lovely Doris Day, Spring Byington playing a December Bride, and Audrey Totter as Millie. They're here on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Good morning, Chester. Matt, I've got to talk to you. Sure. Uh, Chester? Uh, you folks will have to excuse me. I, I can't be puttering around the office all day. I'll be in the back if you want me. Yeah? Matt, he's here in Dodge City. I just saw him. He came in on the morning train. You mean Ed Beaudry? Yes. It's been four years, Matt. I'd begun to hope he'd forget. Hope he wouldn't find us. From what you've told me, Beaudry doesn't sound like a man who ever forgets. He's come here looking for Bert to kill him. He swore he would. Matt, what are we going to do? I don't know. What's Bert think about it? He doesn't know yet. He's busy at the blacksmith shop. Ma Matt, you've got to help us. You're the only real friend we have out here. It might make it easier if I weren't, Jeannie. <laughs> I'm supposed to maintain law and order and dodge. That's my job. Doesn't leave much leeway to mix in on personal quarrels. Well, there's no quarrel. It's just that Ed Beaudry's a hot-tempered fool. Bert never did anything to him. He married you, didn't he? A woman has a right to change her mind, Matt. Maybe Beaudry doesn't think so. Matt, you... You promised me once in Louisville... Yeah. Yeah, I know. All right, Jeannie, go on home and... Uh... Don't say anything to Bert. I'll talk to Beaudry. Thank you. I'll never forget it. I... I... Goodbye, man. Ch 
Chester. Yes, sir, I'll, I'll be right there, Mr. Dillon. Did Ms. Wells leave? Yeah. Fine couple of Wellses. Did you know them before they came out west? I'm not Bert. I do, Mrs. Wells. I guess we better drop over to the Texas Trail, Chester. There's a fellow in town planning to do some killing. <laughs> Been a long time. Are you kidding? Hello, Chester. Miss Kitty? Uh, come sit down, Matt. Tell me about things. I can't right now, Kitty. We're looking for a fellow. Thought he might have come in here. Sooner or later, they all do. Stranger, Matt? Uh, yeah. He came in on the morning train. His name's Ed Baudry. Oh, him? There, the bar, Matt. Third from the end, next to Tulsa Jim Nixon. He's buying Irish whiskey for everybody. Thank you, Kitty. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. Watch yourself, Max. Yeah, sure, Kitty. I'll see you later. All right, bartender. Set up another round of Jamesons for the house. Yeah. Your name, Beaudry? Well, oh, that's right, mister. Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal here. I'd like to talk to you. Fine. Go ahead and talk. Uh, Tulsa, suppose you'll move on down the bar for a couple of minutes, huh? No, well, now, uh, dear Marshal, this man's a friend of mine. You're not very particular about your friends. Now, go on, Tulsa. Drift. Mr. Beaudry, you, uh, you came here to kill Bert Wells, didn't you? Did I? Well, here's some advice. Don't do it. Take the next train and get out of town. Is that official? Just what's the charge, Marshal? None. Yet. Murder, if you go through it. Well, not the way I understand it. Murder's one thing. Calling a man in a fair fight, that's another thing. Baudry, I'm the law here in Dodge, and I don't see it as a fair fight. Bert's a blacksmith, and he's not used to handling a gun. You are. And so I'm told. Who told you, Marshal? I don't know anybody here. And... Wait a minute. Dylan? Yeah. I heard Jeannie mention you. You knew her back in Louisville before she ran off. We'll leave her out of this, Baudry. So that's it. This isn't official. You're just doing a personal favor for an old friend. Probably a very close friend. Jeannie always did have a weak... I warned you once. (laughs) All right, hold it. Now get up, Baudry. That was a mistake, Dylan. Now I'd have to kill you, too. I'm not a blacksmith, Baudry. I'll look you up just soon as I've finished with Bert Wells. If you kill Bert, you won't have to look me up. sometime. Has he been bothering Jeannie? No, she just happened to see him get off the train this morning. She came and told me. She shouldn't have done it, Matt. It's not your problem. Maybe it is, Bert. I'm the law in Dodge, and the law doesn't like the idea of personal grudges ended up in a killing. What do you aim to do? Yeah, prevent it if I can. Well, I wish you luck. You haven't worn that gun for two years, Bert. Why start now? I've got no choice, Matt. You know that. You mean you got no chance. If you let Baudry call a showdown, he'll kill you. Maybe. Look, Bert, why don't you take to the prairie, hold up for a week or so while I figure some way of running Baudry out of town, huh? Would you do it, Matt? Hide out and let somebody else do your fighting for you? Well, what I'd That's do is... That's beside the point, Bert. Jeannie. There's a law against killing. And it's Matt's job to enforce it. If you went away, there wouldn't be any fight. Wouldn't be much honor either, Jeannie. Man can't run and still call himself a man. 
He can run from a mad dog. And that's what Ed Beaudry is. He never had any claim on me. It appears he thought he did. Matt, you know where Beaudry stand? I talked to him in the Texas Trail. He probably took one of the rooms upstairs. Like to walk over there with me? Well, if that's the way you want it. No, Bert, you... you... I'll get my hat. Be right with you. Matt, you've got to stop it. Yeah? How? I don't know. But there must be something you can do. Yeah, there is. Boy, it's shaping up. I can probably arrest the survivor. There's still time to turn back, Bert. Afraid not, Matt. I should have had it out with Beaudry back there in Kentucky five years ago. Jeannie wanted to run away and avoid trouble, and she was so beautiful it was hard to argue with her. Yeah, I know. Be hard on her if anything happened to you. Life's always hard on a woman, I guess. Worse out here on the prairie. Look out for her, Matt, in case I... Well, I mean if anything... Mr. Dillon? Huh? Oh, what is it, Chester? Beaudry left the saloon a little while ago. Went over to the livery stable to hire a horse. Oh? Huh? I think he's riding out to your place, Mr. Wells. He's been doing a lot of talking. Jeannie will be there alone, Matt. I better get back home. It won't be necessary. Here comes Beaudry now. I won't draw unless he does, Matt. Heads up, Chester. Yes, sir. Just riding out to call on you, Wells. I decided you'd had plenty of time to look me up. No reason to, Baudry. Most men would figure they had reason. Somebody been in a local saloon, telling their wife's history. What? Baudry, you... All right, hold it. Don't draw, Bert. Chester, cover Baudry. Just keep your hands still, Mr. Baudry. You're fast with that gun, Dylan. Fast enough, Mr. You make Baudry. a good bodyguard. Too bad you can't ride her 24 hours a day. I told you what to expect if you keep pushing this thing, Mr. Baudry. Now use some sense and get out of town while you're still alive. I've been in lots of towns, Dylan. I left them all alive. Wells, I've been planning to kill you for five years. Plans don't always work out. Listen, Will. You got till sundown. After that, I'm going to shoot you on sight. All right, Mr. Beaudry. If you finish speaking your piece, move along. Why, surely, Mr. Dillon. See you later. Well, still a couple of hours before sundown. I think I'd like to spend them with Jeannie. I'll see you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Goodbye, Bert. I declare I, I just can't see any way of stopping it, Mr. Dillon. I can't either. I'd sure hate to be in Bert Wells' shoes. I'd hate worse to be in Beaudry's. He'll never submit to arrest. Chester, I'm going to have to kill him. Why don't you relax, Matt? You're nervous as a cat. Yeah, and I'll stay nervous, Kitty, until I find out what's happened to those two. Baudry slipped out the back way just at dusk. The piano player saw him. Yeah. Well, Bert pulled the same trick. I had a couple of boys watching the blacksmith shop, but he managed to give them a slip. There's nothing you can do now, Matt. Yeah, well... Another killing. And you in the middle again. Why, Matt? Why do you do it? It's a job, Kitty. Somebody's got to do it. But why you? 
There are other things in life if you look around for them. Well, maybe I will someday. Will you look my way, Matt? Well, Matt, I... I brought my kit. I'm all prepared. Ah, uh, where are the victims? No victims yet, Doc. You're jumping the gun. Well, I understand it's going to be a real showdown. The boys at the bar are offering two to one on Baudry. That's about the odds, I figure, if the shooting really starts. Oh, it'll start all right. Oh, and there's not a thing in the world can stop it. Dill? Chester, what are you doing in here? I told you to watch that street. Yes, sir, I know you did. The fight's as likely to start out there as any place else. No, sir, Mr. Dillon. I guess there's not going to be any fight. What? They just found Baudry lying in an alley down the block. Matt. Somebody sneaked up behind him with a hammer. He's sure dead. We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, what is the connection between the statue in the square and a pair of thugs who are definitely not on the square with the law? Tonight on Gangbusters, hear the complete details of this exciting case taken from actual police files. Remember, it's Gangbusters later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. Don't miss it. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Showing around the house, Mr. Dillon. No. Another shop either. He might have skipped out. Well, what about his wife, though? I don't know, Chester. I can't figure any of this. It's not like Bert to pull a sneaking trick like that. Hold it. Don't move. He's there by the tree, Chester. Yes, sir. Bert. Who is it? Who's that? Matt. Chester's with me. You better put away the gun. All right, Matt. I thought it was somebody else. Who, Bert? Well, you, you know who. Baudry, of course. Guess I better take your gun. Official, Matt? Official. Well, I got no quarrel of the law. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Now, why did you do it? What do you mean? If it had been a gunfight, the law couldn't have touched you. Now, the circumstances are all in your favor. But this way, they'll call it murder. And they'll be right, because that's what it was. Matt, what are you talking it's about? It's no use. You left the hammer lying right beside his body. It's got your shop brand carved in the handle of it. Whose body are you talking about? You mean Baudry? Yeah, sure, Baudry. Matt, you're making a mistake. I went looking for Baudry, yes, but I didn't find him. Then I come back here. I was afraid to leave Jeannie there in the house alone. I, I didn't do it, Matt. You're wrong. It's not up to me, Bert. It's the court's job. All I can do is take you in. The evidence is too strong, and I got no choice. No choice? I didn't have a choice either. We must have had a choice somewhere back down the line. When? Where was it we could have stopped and turned back? I'm a marshal, not a philosopher. Now, let's go. What about Jeannie? i got to tell her. Chester will take care of it. It'd be better if you'd do it, Matt. You're a friend. That'd make it easy. I'd rather not if you don't mind. Now, come on, let's go. Step inside. Four years we've been friends, Matt. I never thought it would come to this. Neither did I. You said you didn't find any money on him. It could have been robbery. Or made to look like robbery. But either way, there's nothing I can do. Now, you better step inside. I love... 
I'll bring you some blankets and tobacco. If you want anything else, let me know. Wish I knew how Jeannie was taking it. She'll be all right. She's a fine girl. Matt. Matt, look out for her, will you? Bert, a man's job is one thing, friendship's another. This prairie country is rough and tough and wild at the best. And without the law, nobody could survive in it. And that means putting friendship aside sometimes. But a man still doesn't forget. Yeah, I, I'll look out for her. Thanks, Matt. I'll see you later. Get your prisoner tucked in safely, Matt. <laughs> what about Baudry? He's dead. Absolutely dead. Like I never saw anybody any deader. Blacksmith hammer makes a mighty fine weapon. Yeah, at least for sneaking up behind. I can't figure Bert doing that. It's not like him. Sometimes a man changes under pressure, Doc. Yeah, I can't figure it either. What would you say his chances are? Bad. Straws all point one way. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe somebody's been messing with the straw stack. Who? That's a good question, man. Well, the court will ask it. Yeah, if he ever gets there. What do you mean? I just come from Texas Trail a while ago, and some of the boys are kind of riled up. They're talking real loose. No law against talking. Yeah, doubt that they aim to leave it at talking, Matt. They figure the evidence is a little on the weak side. A court might turn Bert loose. So they're saying it's up to them. Yeah, they're just mad because they've lost their source of free drinks. Well, maybe so, but you better keep your eyes open, Matt. Yeah, I know that pack, Doc. They hunt in the dark and pull down stragglers. And mostly they just talk. So don't worry. Bert's in jail, and that's where he's going to stay. <laughs> I want to see Bert. No visitors after dark. It's a jail rule. Rules don't have to be enforced. Mine do. Bert's a prisoner, same as any other prisoner. He's charged with murder. He didn't do it, Matt. It's not for me to say. But you know he didn't. You know Bert. You know he wouldn't do a thing like that. Sneak up behind a man's back in the dark. I'm not the court, Jeannie. I know. And they'll believe he did it. Yeah, the night train's coming in. Hope it's not bringing in trouble. The morning train did. Matt, I want to see Bert. I told you that you... Why, you little fool. <laughs> Give me the gun, Janie. No, I warn you, Matt, stay Give back. Give me the gun. No, Matt. So help me, I I'll... said hand it over. <laughs> You knew I wouldn't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> now, what did you hope to gain by I that? I don't know. Get Bert out. Maybe I don't know. None of this is his fault. Something's got to be done. Matt, you've got to help me. Easy. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? I, I just come from the Texas Trail. I think there's going to be some trouble. Trouble? The bunch that hangs out around there are doing a lot of drinking and talking up the idea of coming over here to the jail. Oh, no. Well, maybe we ought to go over there and do some talking ourselves. Jenny, I think the best thing for you to do is to go back home and stay there till morning. But... Now, don't worry about this. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, but, Matt, you can't handle that crowd alone. I've been handling things alone for a long time. All right, Chester. Told 
to Jim Nixon, the one who's been agging him on, Mr. Dillon, over there at the end of the bar. Yeah, he struck up an acquaintance with Votary when he first got off the train. Guess he figures he's an old partner by now. Well, come on. Yes, sir. Matt, Matt, wait. Later, Kitty, I got some business with the boys at the bar. That's what I mean. Tell the Jim's been buying them drinks for the last two hours. They're in a real nasty mood. So? So be careful, Matt. That's all. Just be careful. Kitty, I'm the carefulest man you know. Sure, sure. We got the law here in Dodge. Supposedly. But what kind of a law is it that lets a man sneak up behind somebody in the dark and murder him in cold blood? I don't know, Tulsa. Suppose you tell me. Dylan. Now, don't let me interrupt you. You were doing fine. Well, this is quite an audience you got. All the panhandlers, bums, and barflies and dodge. It's quite a collection. Well, calling names won't change the facts, Dylan. What facts? A friend of yours, Bert Wells, had sneaking, cowardly murder. That's for the court to decide, Tulsa. The court. They'll turn them loose. They work hand in glove with you. Dylan, we're not going to stand for it. All right, shut up! So you're not going to stand for it, huh? Well, just what are you planning to do? You'll find out in due time, Dylan. Go oh, tend to set them up again all around. Yeah, you've turned into quite a free spender, Tulsa. I never knew you to... A ah, double eagle gold piece. You mind if I take a look at it? It's good. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Where'd you get it? That's my business, Dylan. So you're the one who killed Baudry. That's a lie. I thought robbing him was just a cover-up, but it wasn't. There aren't many double eagles around Dodge. Baudry had a lot of them. Now you. Why would you get a pocket full of gold pieces, Tulsa? Wells killed Baudry. The blacksmith hammer was lying right beside him. Yes, where you left it. Hey. What does she mean? Tulsa Jim came into my husband's shop late this afternoon. His horse had thrown a shoe. He had plenty of chance to steal that hammer. She's lying. Where did you get the gold, Tulsa? I, a liar. I won it, well, I won it in the poker game. Last week when, well, when the trail herd would... Tulsa, you're under arrest for murder. Oh. No, you'll never take me! Get out! All right, Doc. You better get up an inquest. Uh, Confound it, Matt. You you never give me any chance to practice on live people. Yeah. You wouldn't know what to do with them, Doc. Well, I I do get fewer complaints this way. Matt. Matt, does this mean that Bert's free? You shouldn't have come here, Jeannie. Yeah, he's free. Chester will go with you over to the jail and let him out. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for everything. You told me one time in Louisville that... Louisville? That was a long time ago and a long way off. So, uh... Goodbye, Jeannie. Goodbye, Matt. What's it all about, Matt? What? What's anything all about, kidding? Professor, what do you say? Well, let's have a little tune, huh? Why, sure thing, Mr. Dillon. What'd you like to hear? Oh, uh, how about that one of Foster's, uh, Jeannie. Jeannie with the light brown hair. You bet. You knew her before, didn't you, Matt? Yeah, I met her in Louisville one summer. Saw her quite a lot for a couple of months. And then I drifted out west. A man misses out on things by drifting. I told her then if she ever needed help to to call on me. Well, she called, and you helped her. Yeah, I guess. Well, anyway, uh, that's that. Matt. Yeah. Yeah, Kitty. When are you going to help yourself? Gun 
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Tom Tully, Lynn Allen, Larry Dobkin, Georgia Ellis, and Barney Phillips. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. What are the tunes most people like best? For the answer to that question, listen to Robert Q. Lewis's Waxworks later tonight over most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for Broadway is My Beat, which follows immediately over most of these same radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. On a Sunday afternoon, the music's delightful on the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It was the dust. The heat was bad enough in Dodge City, but out on the plain, it was the dust. The sun was a burning red-brown chip in the sky. And the sweat on a man never had a chance to drop. It was blotted and dried with dust. Doc, Chester, and I had ridden to old man Gore's place ten miles out. He'd had some trouble with one of the hands. The fellow had gone loco with liquor and had been shooting up the cattle. We found him, stripped naked nearby on his haunches, crying, drunk over a parched water hole. Doc had got him to bed and fixed him up some. And now we were heading back for Dodge. Darn horse. Seems he's just bound to stomp all the dust and candles in my eyes. (coughs) Maybe the marshal will buy you a camel, Chester. This keeps up. We'll all buy camels. I remember the time back in Waco when I was just Doc, a small... Chester, boy. you see something ahead on the side of the trail there? Um, yeah, maybe. It looks like some poor calf strayed off and dropped. I don't think so. Yeah, it looks like a man. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. 
Chester, get the water bag. Yes, Mr. Okay. Let me have a look, Marsha. Yeah. Let's see. Heat. Is he all right? Well, depends on how long he's been lying here. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Huh. Open up his shirt, Marshal. Chester, get some of that water on his wrist. All right. It looks like an Easterner, huh? Sure not dressed for this country. Oh, well, that's better. That's better. Try to get a few drops in him. All right. Uh, no, not too much, Chester. <coughs> not in his nose, Chester. His mouth. Well, my gracious, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon, but he moved his head. It's not so easy to... Hey, look, he's awake. Mm. You're all right, mister. Just take it easy for a bit now. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself. Into a Jew. What did he say? Oh, it's out of his head, Chester. For this relief, uh, much thanks. Forget it. Chester, get around the other side and shade him from the sun. Yes, sir. The sun. I begin to be a weary of the sun. I don't blame you. Uh, what happened? My wagon shed a wheel, I fear, along the high road. I know not where I am. Uh, you're about four miles out of Dodge City. Uh, Kansas. Kansas. Uh, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. You better get him to town quick. He's in a bad way. Still here. Uh, you think you can make it on a horse? We'll take you into... We'll take him into Dodge. And he passed out again. We tied him across Doc's horse. Doc and I doubled up and Chester rode behind. The stranger was a tall, skinny man with a face like a friendly mule. Big hands and thin wrists stretched out from his sleeves. He had no papers on him, nothing. And until he woke up, we wouldn't even know his name. Doc settled him down in the back of his place, and he was still asleep when Chester and I rode out to where we figured he'd left his wagon. It wasn't hard to see when we found it. What color wagon would you call that, Mr. Dillon? Puce, Chester. Puce. I guess so. Seems to be some writing on the side there. Yeah. Oh, Irving Henry... Thespian Supreme Disciple of the Immortal Bard. Mm. I should have known he was a religious man. Uh, he's an actor, Chester, the Immortal Bard. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, wrote plays, poems. Ah, ah, hi. Oh. Ah, You think he let the horses go, Mr. Dillon? Well, I was wondering that. Seems to me he'd have ridden for help instead of trying to walk. Horses couldn't have got out of the harness ourselves. Well, let's take a look at the wheel. Huh? Wish we could wait till the sun goes down. It's going to be awful hot work, Mr. Dillon. <coughs> eh. It's not too bad. The pen fell out. Must be another in the box at the back. Take a look, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. I'll prop the wheel up here. Now. Ah. Mr. Dillon? Hey, yeah, can't you find it? Will you come here a minute? Uh, what's the matter? Take a look in there. It took a second or two to get used to the darkness inside the wagon. And then I saw the hand sticking out from behind the trunk. You didn't have to be the doc to know that it was a dead hand. The body was of a man about 40. He was dirty. And in a greasy, torn waistcoat, I found a pocketbook with his name. Sam Matchett. And that was all. Below his left shoulder and his back was a patch of dried blood. And in the middle... A bullet hole. We got the wagon wheel on, hitched up our horses, and drove into Dodge. Doc? Oh, that's you, Marshal. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I'll be right out. All right. Get that fella's wagon fixed up? Yeah, I brought it in. Is he awake? Oh, I haven't looked in the last half hour. I was making coffee. You want some? Uh, no, thanks. Sir. Oh, it's a funny thing about coffee. When it's hot weather like this, drink it scalded and it makes you feel cooler outside. Uh, look, Doc, i got to see that fellow. I want to ask him a couple of questions. Oh, that's so? I found a dead man in the back of his wagon. You don't say. You better take a look. Chester's bringing him in the side. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You want to go on back? Uh, yeah, thanks, Doc. Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry, wake up. Yes, what? Oh. Your name, Irving Henry? Oh, Irving Henry. What is this place? Now, you got to listen to me for a minute. We found your wagon. Ah? Uh-huh. Did you let the horses go before you sat on your own? Of course. I could not let them remain to die. Well, how come you didn't take one to ride? I have a loathing of horses. I cannot bear one under my body. <coughs> there is a carafe of water beside the bed. Would you be good enough, uh, Mr... Uh, uh... Uh, Dillon, Matt Dillon. I'm the marshal here in Dodge City. Here you are. Oh, my thanks. Now, what were you doing with a dead man in your wagon, Mr. Henry? A dead man? A dead man shot in the back, lying in your wagon. This is very midsummer madness. I won't argue about that, but I'll thank you to answer my question. But it is impossible. It isn't true. I say it is. You lie in your throat if you say that I'm any other than an honest man. Look, mister, I didn't say you weren't honest. You're an actor. And you got a fine way of saying things, but murder's murder. I don't care how you say it. Now, I'm asking questions, and I want straight answers. Your pardon, sir, but... What you tell me, in truth, if, if it were played upon a stage, I would condemn it as an improbable fiction. I swear to you, I know nothing of a body. Did you come through Hayes City? Yes. Yeah. Do you know a man there called Sam Matchett? No. You had no trouble in Hayes City? No. What are you doing in these parts, Mr. Henry? Uh, I'm... I am... Touring the provinces. An actor eating the bitter bread of banishment. And my talents are not taken for their worth in the East. And therefore, I bring the immortal bard to the hinterlands. And now, sir, that the interview is ended, pray give me leave to depart. I'm sorry, I can't do that. You'll have to stay until we get this thing cleared Mr. up. Mr. Dillon, Doc would like to see you. Ah, all right, Chester. Stay here with Mr. Henry, will you? Well, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. If, how are you feeling by now, Mr. Henry? Would you like more water? These evil manners live in brass. Doc. Right here, Marshal. Yeah. Fill me cup, the father's boy. What was that? What'd you find? Well, there's one thing. This man didn't die right away. I mean, not right when he was shot. Is that so? No. More likely bled to death. Inside. Uh-huh. Uh, you think he might have been able to climb up in the wagon after he was shot? Uh, he might. There's another thing. Yeah? You see the way he's dressed? Now, you take a look at that. Oh, oh, what what the hell? Help! 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 Come on. Come on, Doc. <laughs> Chester. What, what's he the matter with him? Chester. <laughs> My gun when I was pouring him some water, Mr. Wait. Dillon. He must have gone through the window, Marshal. I, I tried to get it back here. Window. Take care of Chester, Doc. I'm going after him. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, do you know how old the school building in your community is? If it's over 25 years old, the chances are that it's woefully inadequate to the present demands on it. Certainly thousands of schools all over America are unable to meet the needs of a greatly increased enrollment. And all our school children will suffer unless all of us work actively to improve conditions. Join with the groups in your community working for better school conditions. Remember, better schools build a stronger America. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. When I went
got out of there, I didn't know how badly Chester was hurt. There was a lot of blood on his head and over his face. It was nearly dark outside, and the street was empty. It was supper time. I could see the women through the windows getting food ready. The kids were inside, too. Sure looked peaceful. But with Henry out with a gun, well, that wasn't a good thing to have running around loose in Dodge. you see a man run down the street, Miss Fletcher? Why, well, no. Well, you better get inside and lock your door. Don't come out again. There's a killer loose. I walked the length of the street, listening, waiting. And when I got to the end, there was Nothing. He hadn't taken a horse, I'd have heard that. And in a way, I was sorry, because if he'd tried to hide and dodge, there'd be no way to get out of shooting that wouldn't get women and kids hurt. A breeze came up, and swirls of dust flew around, and then settled as the air became still and hot again. I went back to Doc's place. Find him, Marshal? No. How's Chester? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Dillon. Just creased my head. More mess than hurt. Oh, good, Chester. Uh, look, you want to go home or you want to work? I want to work. All right. Go down to the office, get yourself another gun, and round up some men, as many as you can. As long as Henry stays in town, we're in trouble. Now, keep your eyes open. Meet me back here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Take my gun with you, and if you see him, watch out. All right, I'll get going. Yes, sir. Now, Doc, I'm going to have to make you a deputy, too. Well, <laughs> well, maybe instead of digging out bullets, I'll be putting some in. It's not funny, Doc. Now, come on. All right, we'll start here. I'll take this side, you take the other. Get the men to go through their houses and tell them to look for their horses. Tell them what's happening. But ten o'clock that night, as far as we could tell, Henry hadn't left town. There were plenty of places for him to hide, though. We had 50 men out searching. Chester and I were working along back of the express office. There were a couple of houses there we hadn't covered. You wouldn't think a man like that would be a killer, now would you, Mr. Dillon? I never saw a man yet couldn't be, Chester. Depends on your reasons for killing, I guess. Now, let's take a look behind these boxes, huh? got this far? Yeah, he might. A lot of back streets to sneak around in the dark. That's Miss Cullen's place there, isn't it? Yes, sir. Looks like she's still awake. Light burning back there. Yeah. <clears throat> Seem a bit cooler to you tonight, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, a bit. Oh, uh, evening, Miss Cullen. I'm sorry to get you up, but we're looking for a man, a stranger around. He's tall, thin. You seen anyone about tonight? No. No, I haven't. Uh-huh. Uh, how, how's the kids? Oh, they're fine. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Fine. Uh-huh. Well, you keep the place locked tight, Miss Cullen. Don't let anybody in tonight unless you know who it is. All right. Good night, Mr. Dillon. Good night, ma'am. Well, now, that's strange. She didn't even say hello to me, and I know her better than you do, Mr. Dillon. Chester, round up the others. Get them over here. I don't know why she... He's understands. in there with her. I think he's got the kids in the sleeping room. Oh. Sent her out to get rid of us. 
Now, I'm going to try and get in. Don't do anything when you come back. Just put the men around the house. Yes, sir. I'd seen Miss Cullen make a move with her head. And her eyes said the rest. When I told her to lock up, I shook my head and I hoped she understood. I wanted that front door to stay open. As soon as I can. He was in there, all right. I could hear him. I wanted him alive. But I wasn't going to risk hurt to Miss Cullen or the kids getting him. I did what you asked. Don't hurt the children, please. They will never know this night. And in the morning, when they awake. What's that? You said you locked the door after you. No, don't. Don't. I shall keep the pistol turned to the girl's head now. Someone is here. They try to take me. Who is it? Who? Mr. Dillon, go away. Please. He'll kill us. You lied. You lied. Oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. Listen to me, Marshal Dillon. Throw your pistol in here and then come in with your hands before you. I have no stomach for child killing, but I will not hesitate to do so. Now, give me the gun, Henry. No. You won't be able to get out of this. I must. There is living to be done. You know, that fancy talk isn't going to help either. Now, why don't you climb down? What happened to Match it? Nothing happened to Match. Why'd you kill him? I didn't. In five minutes or less, there'll be 50 men or more around here. Now, what are you going to do? I don't know. If you didn't kill Match it, you'll get a chance. I'll see to that. There's no use going on this way. Give me the gun. I cannot. It is my prop of salvation. No gun is salvation to anybody. Put it down. You must tell the men to go away, Marshal Dillon. I'll have to take one of these children with me for my protection. No! <laughs> Shed a tear for me, madam. I have the greater need. You do a lot of talking, mister. I'd like to see you turn the gun away from that kid's head. That'd take more than talk, wouldn't it, though? I have no skill with such a weapon. Why should I match with you? I want to live. You're going about it the wrong way. The smallest worm will turn being trod upon. Meaning... You gave me no choice when you brought me here. Would have been better to have left me lying in the dust. You don't understand. You don't know. Well, why don't you tell me? What good would it do? It depends. My life has been the theater. As a boy, I, I was a student of Shakespeare. <laughs> he would look at me. <laughs> Who would accept this face for Hamlet? This ill-shaped body for Romeo. <laughs> His speech has become my speech, but when the fools only look. They cannot listen for laughing. There have been ugly men before you, and... Hasn't been cause for murder. Why'd you kill Matchett? In New York, there was a man. A gross, stupid man who 
fancied himself an interpreter of the bard, he, he took me, <laughs> me, as his apprentice, and together we set out for the tour. I, I would play only the voices, never Richard, never Henry, never Leah, only, only the voices. Whilst he, stumbling, drunken, he muddled and tore to a tatter the, the words that I should have spoken. You killed a man because you wanted to play a hero? How easily murder is discovered. Yeah, sometimes, I guess. It was yesterday. We were leaving Hayes City. We'd played there for two days, and it made me a laughing stock. It was night, and he became drunk and, and threatened to leave me in the next town. I made him stop the wagon, and taking up a pistol... I shot him. He did not die at first. And when I saw what I had done, I, I wanted him to live. And I put him into the wagon and, and I drove on, hoping to find a doctor. Then, as, as the night passed, I saw that he had died. And I was afraid. The wagon broke down? Yes. I, I put my purse into his clothes and took his name for mine. How I've hated the name of Sam Matchett. But you wouldn't understand. I wouldn't? Well, what now? I want to live. I want my chance. You've done a murder. I can't let you go. You know that. Don't make it harder. I lost my husband two years ago. I know what it is to be alone. You've been alone, haven't you? I'm sorry. But you killed someone... We may pity, though not pardon, dear. <laughs> I'm going now, Marshal. If you walk out of there with your gun, you're a dead man. Uh, death's a great disguiser. I must have my chance. Don't do it, Matchett. There'll be killing. Madam, forgive me. I would not have harmed your children. Matchett, put down oh. your gun. Let me go my way. Please. There are a lot of men waiting for you out there, Matchett. You know what'll happen if you open the door. Don't do it, Matchett. He knew he was going to die. The minute he opened that door, he knew it. And maybe he wanted to, because he fired first a single shot. We buried him in back of the church, and I found some words in a book. 
to put on his grave. He that dies pays all debts. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Hans Conrad was featured as Henry, with Mary Lansing as Mrs. Cullen. Parley Bear as Chester, and Howard McNear as Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, gangbusters going to action Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. They told us a man we'd been looking for, a murderer, was in a cow camp on the north fork of the Canadian River, about 100 miles south of Dodge. So Chester and I rode down to take a look. We found a fellow there with the right name but the wrong face. So we started back. First night, we camped in a dry, buffalo-rutted depression. The next morning, I woke shortly after daybreak to find Chester already cooking breakfast. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Meat will be done soon. Uh, the coffee made, Chester, that's what I need. It's uh, boiling. I didn't make much, though. I thought I'd better save our water. You know, Chester, I'll bet right now the doc's back there in St. Louis holed up in some fancy hotel and still asleep. <laughs> that's quite a thought, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Him right in the middle of St. Louis and us way out here on the prairie. <laughs> I'll bet he's even got sheets on his bed. I wouldn't be surprised, Mr. Dillon. Doc said this was one vacation he was going to splurge on. <laughs> he's riding the Santa Fe both ways. Huh? Well, meat's done. I cleaned off this rock here to cut it on. Oh, good. Oh, well, you got it warm anyway. Well, now, meat shouldn't be overcooked, Mr. Dillon. That takes a taste clean out of it. I then we ought to be able to taste everything about this steer. Eggman's disappointment. How's that, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Never mind, Chester. 
Now, how come you woke up so early this morning? Oh, I always do. Seems as soon as it gets daylight, my feet start to sweat, and then I just got to get up. Well, that's as good a reason as any, I guess. Wow. Well, looks like we got company, Chester. What? Oh. Where? Right out there. Heading straight for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some cowboy, probably. I don't know. He doesn't ride quite like a cowboy. Why, it's just a kid, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Sure needs a haircut. <laughs> what? Say, Mr. Dillon, it's a girl. Now, what could she be doing out here? I'm carrying a rifle, too. Well, uh, get on, miss, and have some coffee. Who are you, mister? Hi, this is Chester Proudfoot, and I'm Matt Dillon. How do you do? You rustlers, or what? <laughs> uh, not exactly. I'm the U.S. Marshal out of Dodge, ma'am. U.S. Marshal? Oh, that's good. It is? Why? I need help, Mr. Marshall. My daddy's awful sick. Sick? Well, well, where is your daddy? We got a homestead about a mile over that rise back there. Oh, what's he sick with? It's his leg, Mr. Marshall. A horse threw him and his saddle both in the corral, and then it stepped on his foot. Now his whole leg's all funny. He's got a fever, too. Mr. Dillon, that sounds like... It. Yeah, I know, Chester. Uh, tell me, miss, when the horse stepped on him, did it cut his foot, uh, break the skin anywhere? Just a scratch. He tore his boot off, though. Oh. Please, Mr. Marshall, please come see him. I'm scared, the way his leg is and everything. Well, sure, sure we'll come. Your mother with him now? I don't have a mother, Mr. Marshall. Oh. Well, then, what are you doing out here if your daddy's sick? We ran out of meat about three days ago, and... I don't have anything to feed him. Oh. All right. Uh, Chester, I'll ride back with... Uh, uh, what is your name, anyway? Tara. Tara Hantry. Oh. I'll be 16 next January. Well, that's, that's fine. Uh, we'll go back to the Hantry place, Chester. You scout around for some meat. All right, sir. And if you don't find any antelope, shoot the first calf you see. Anybody's calf. I'll do it, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> in the sleeping room, Mr. Marshall. No. Daddy. <laughs> I, Daddy, I found a man, and he, he's going to help us. And, Daddy, he's a Marshal, a U.S. Marshal. Matt Dillon, Mr. Hendry. Uh, uh, how are you feeling? Dillon? Oh, I've heard of you. You're from Dodge, aren't you? <laughs> That's right. Well, Marshal, I... Ain't feeling so good. My my foot don't hurt no more, but it my leg is all sort of well, it ain't pretty. I don't know much about these things, but maybe I better take a look at it anyway, huh? Sure. Sure, Marshal. There. There she is. Uh, all right, you can cover it up. I was in the war, Marshal. I know what gangrene is guess you do, too, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing, a friend of mine is out getting you some meat, and then we'll load you in your wagon. Well, and we'll... Ben took the wagon. What? Ben Warling. He took the wagon when Daddy got hurt. Said he'd find a doctor and bring him back. Well, who's Ben Walling? Oh, he, he's been sort of working here, Mr. Marshall. I should have run him off long ago. That's what. Well, where is he? What do he take the wagon for? Where's he going to find a doctor around here anyway? Closest doctors in Dodge, I know of. Yeah, and he's in St. Louis, and he won't be back for a couple of weeks. Uh, I couldn't get to him anyway. Well, tell me, when did this happen? About six days ago, Mr. Marshall. Uh -huh. Ben left the day after. Well, you think he's coming back? Did he steal the wagon or what? He he comes back here and me not able to get around. I, I don't know what I'll do. I ought to take a bull with take now, him. Now, take it easy, Mr. Just a Hand. Bull with... Take it. He won't cause any trouble, so don't you get all worked up. Uh, Tara, we'll uh, let him get some rest, huh? All right. Uh, we'll have some food for you soon, Mr. Hantry. I ain't very hungry. 
Tara, what's he so riled up about this Ben Walling for? What's between them? Oh, it's nothing, Mr. Marshall. Daddy's sick and... That's all. Look, Tara, you asked me to help you, didn't you? Yes, but... You trust me, don't you? All right, Mr. Marshall. Daddy hates Ben because Ben... Well, Ben likes me. Oh, I see. He even wanted to marry me. Said he would. How do you feel about Ben, Terry? You like him? No. Of course, it's time I had a man and all that, but... I'm afraid of Ben, Mr. Marshall. It's like there's something wrong with him. He's always sneaking around when you don't expect him. Makes me uneasy, like... Well, we won't worry about Ben now. Uh, you you stay here in case your daddy wants anything. I'll go outside and wait for Chester. Mr. Marshall. Hmm? I'm awful glad you're here. We'll see it through, Tara. Don't you worry. I won't. Now. <laughs> went outside and walked over to the small corral that stood nearby. There I rolled a smoke and looked out across the flat distances of the prairie. And I wondered how anyone could survive in all that emptiness. Hantree, lying on his bed back there in the house. He wouldn't survive. The prairie had got to him all right. And its vast loneliness had put him out of reach of any help. And Tara, what could she do out here in this endless land of grass? I was glad to get my mind off it when Chester rode in with an antelope across his saddle. We hung it on the corral, dressed it, took a hind quarter into Tara, and we went back outside and sat down. Yes, sir. She's a plucky girl, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, a fine girl, Chester. Yeah, but this Ben fella... I just don't understand his going off with the wagon like that. Well, it doesn't matter much now. Entry won't last more than a day or two, anyway. It's that bad, is it? Yeah, blood poisoning, Chester. As soon as it reaches his heart, he's done for. Well, isn't there any way to stop it? Yeah, sure. Cut his leg off. Oh. Too bad Doc isn't here. Yeah. Would that stop it, Mr. Dillon? Uh cutting his leg off of me? I don't know, Chester. I don't know. Maybe too late anyway. I... Well, I sure wish we could do something for him. I don't take to just sitting around and waiting for a man to die. Well, nobody does. It isn't right somehow, that, that poor fella and, and Tara. Why, why, Mr. Dillon, that girl will go crazy out here all alone. All right, Chester. What do you want me to do about it? I'm not a doctor. Now shut up. Well, I... Mr. Dillon, you could do it. I know you could. Do what? Be a doctor. Long enough to save Mr. Hantry's life. Are you anyway. out of your head? No, sir. Then what are you talking like that for? The most I ever did was doctor a horse for the colic. That's fine training for this, isn't I it? I know. I couldn't do it. I just plain don't have the spirit. But you do. Oh, why didn't I leave you back in Dodge? It wouldn't have mattered anyway, Mr. Dillon, because you would never just stand by and... Let a man die. Let's go talk to him, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Daddy's fever's worse, Mr. Marshall. I I'm going to get some more water. How do you feel, Mr. Hentry? I don't feel much, Marshal. Outside of burning up. I've been trying to tell Tara I just can't last long with blood poisoning. She's just got to figure on it. Well, that's what I came to talk to you about. I, I guess you know the only thing that'll give you a chance. I know. I've been thinking about it. But I couldn't ask any man to do that. You didn't ask me. Well, it's up to you, Mr. Hantry. I'll, I'll try it if you're willing. Only thing is, I... I 
won't know much about what I'm doing. I seen it done in the Union Army, Marshal. I could tell you some things. All right. The only thing is, Marshal, I don't know I'd be much use around here with one leg. Well, you'll have to decide that for yourself. I know. You could move to town, Mr. Hendry, you and Tara. That's it, Tara. If it was just me, I wouldn't do it, but I can't leave Tara alone. Now, if I can help it, I, I can't. Uh, all right, Marshal. Let's do it. You're a brave man. No. No, Marshal. I just don't have any choice. Come on. Let's get it over with. You got any liquor in the house? There's a jug of corn out in the kitchen. Get it, Chester. You can start drinking it while we're getting everything else ready. Tell Tara to start boiling a lot of water. Yeah. I'll talk to her in a few minutes. I'll be right back. Now, I want you to tell me everything that you know about this, Mr. Hendry. First, I'll tell you what you'll need. Mm -hmm. There's a straight iron out by the corral somewhere. Yeah. You can heat it in the main room fireplace. Right. Now, what else? Tara will find some cloth for bandages... And the rest of the stuff you can get in the kitchen. Uh -huh. The only thing worrying me is what will we use to tie off the arteries with? Plain thread won't hold. Well, uh, uh, maybe some thin strips of raw hide. No, they, they'd soak through. you got to have something. Uh, I, that... I know. At least I think it'll work. What about horse hair? Oh, that's it, Marshal. Pull it off the tail. Uh -huh. It'll work fine. Here's the judge, Mr. Hantry, and I brought you a cup, too. Uh, pour me some. Uh, I want to get good and drunk. Here you are, Mr. Hantry. Sir. Sir. You know, I ain't been drunk in the daytime since we got the news about President Lincoln in the spring of 65. Uh, you better have your talk with Tara before that takes hold. Ask her to come in, will you? Come on, Chester. we got work to do. Yes, sir. Uh, Good luck, Mr. Hantree. Thanks. Well, uh, Mar Marshal? Yeah. Marshal? I'll try to make it easy for you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Shortly after noon, I operated. Whether it was the corn whiskey or his own hard courage, I don't know, but Hantry never whimpered. Chester stood outside the door and brought me whatever I needed. Tara waited in the kitchen, boiling more water and thinking her own thoughts. Maybe it was harder on her than any of us. And toward the end, Hantry mercifully passed out. When I'd finally finished bandaging him, I was kind of faint myself. I'd done everything I could. I just hoped I'd done it right. How is he, Mr. Dillon? You'll have to clean up in there, Chester. I've got to get outside for some air. Yes, sir, I'll do it. And put that fire out. It's hot enough around here. I don't know how you did it, Mr. Dillon. Tara? Uh, Tara, will you come on outside for a while? Daddy, all right? Is he all right, Mr. Marshall? It's all over, Tara. We'll just have to wait and see now. <laughs> all right. There now, Tara. He's all right. I'm sorry. But it took so long. I I thought you'd never finish. It, it didn't feel much, Tara. The corn liquor worked fine. Fine. Will he get well now? Well, I, I hope so, Tara. I, I hope so. Mr. Marshall, are, 
Are you going to wait and see? Oh, now, Tara, you don't have to worry about that, Chester, and I'll be here as long as you need us. Oh, I I just wanted to be sure. Can I can I go see Daddy now? Well, uh, as soon as Chester comes out, Tara, uh, then you can. All right. I'll wait, Mr. Marshall. It beats me, Mr. Dillon, how he can just lay there so quiet and peaceful. It's only been four or five hours, Chester. The liquor hasn't worn off yet. He drank nearly the whole jug. No, he needed it. Mm. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon, look yonder. Huh? Somebody coming with a wagon. Oh, yeah. It's probably that Ben Walling they were talking about. I'll bet that's who it is, all right. Wonder what he'll have to say for himself. Ah, oh, you'll think of something, Chester. His kind always do. You recognize him? No, sir. Do you? No, oh, I never saw him before. Hello. What are you doing here? You Ben Walling. How'd you know? The hand trees. They've been wondering about you. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he's an old hand tree, anyway. He's all right. He is, huh? You've been gone a long time, Ben. Where were you? I don't know you, mister, but you sure ask a lot of questions. You can answer them one at a time. Now, where were you? Who are you anyway, mister? I'm a U.S. Marshal. Ain't no U.S. Marshals around here. There is now. Generally, I'm in Dodge. Is your name Dillon? It is. Well, what are you doing here, Marshal? Tara ran into us, asked us to help. Seems the only able-bodied man around here took off in a wagon. I went to fetch a doctor. Is anything wrong in that? Not at all. Where is he? Well, first night the horses ran away, and I've been chasing them ever since. I didn't catch him till this morning. And then I've been gone so long, I thought I'd better get back to you right away. I was worried about Tara and old Hantry, of course. I see. Well, you better get your horses unhitched, Ben. You can see Tara later. She's in with her father now. Going to be all right, huh? I was kind of worried about that foot. Looked to me like it might have poison in it. It did. What do you mean, it did? I took his leg off about noon today. You what? Mr. Dillon did it all by himself, just like a regular doctor. Oh, but how'd you know what to do? You might have killed him. Somebody had to do it, Ben. It's a sure thing Tara couldn't. You're blaming me, ain't you? Well, I did everything I could. It's my fault those blasted horses run off. Antre's pretty sick, Ben. I wouldn't bother him for a day or two if I were you. Oh, I won't bother him. Oh, now look, Marshal. You can leave now. I'll handle everything here. We'll leave. As soon as Hantree's able to take care of himself again. All right. Stay as long as you like. I don't care. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I think that Ben is a no-good liar. You're right on both counts, Chester. And I'll tell you something else. You see that saddle over there? Well, that belongs to Mr. Hantry. Yeah, I know. I looked at it this noon. Somebody cut the cinch strap on it. Cut the cinch strap? Mm-hmm. No wonder that bronc bucked him and the saddle off both. Well, do you think Tara did it? Oh, my goodness gracious, no, Mr. Dillon. Tara would never do a thing like that to her own... It was Ben, wasn't it? That'd be my guess. He figured the old man would get hurt, maybe killed. Why, sir? So he'd have a free hand with Tara. Why, is that low down... Mr. Dillon, let me arrest him. Not yet, Chester. There's plenty of time. All right, sir. I'll wait. wasn't as much time as I figured. Antree had a bad night, and by morning he was so weak he couldn't lift his head. I tried to take his pulse, but I could hardly find it. Maybe, maybe I'd operated too late. Maybe the poison had already moved up into his body. I didn't know. I had no way of knowing. So there was nothing to do now but wait. Want some more coffee, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, thank you, Chester. We'll fill it up, huh? Tara won't eat anything at all, sir. 
She just sat there by his bed, hasn't slept a wink, I know of. Well, it's her father, Chester. He's all she's got. I never thought much about it before, Mr. Dillon, but seeing Tara, I kind of wish I had a daughter. You'd have to change your profession if you were going to take care of a daughter, Chester. Why, I, I don't have any profession, Mr. Dillon. Oh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yeah, what is it, Tara? Please, please come. Daddy wants you. I, I think he... He's... You better come too, Chester. Yes, sir. It's Matt Dillon, Mr. Hendry. Can you hear me? Marshal, I can't hold out no more. Now, don't say that. Keep fighting, man. You'll pull through. No, Marshal. I'm going to die. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Tara. It's about Tara, Marshal. Don't leave her here. Ben Walling, he's no good. He'll try to keep her. Now, don't you worry about Ben Walling, Mr. Hendry. I promise you he won't get anywhere near Tara, now or ever. Thanks, Marshal. He's a bad one. Tara can't stay here alone. She can't work this place. It's a bad way to die. Not no. Now, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me now. Yeah. I promise you something else, too. I'll take care of Tara. I'll see she's all right. I'll see she's cared for. Now, I promise that. I thank you, Marshal. I sure... Where's Tara? Daddy, I'm right here. Daddy. Tara. Come on, Chester. Daddy? Daddy? I don't know, Mr. Dillon. I don't think they'd have made out on this place anyway. Why not, Chester? Well, there just isn't enough water. That one little old spring is all I've got. Well, if they had a lake, it'd still be too much for Tara. What are we going to do with her, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. We'll have to think of something, though. My, I wish she'd come out of that house. I don't like it, her in there, breaking her heart. Give her a little time, Chester. She, she'll be all right. Don't you move her finger, either one of you. Well, well you're mighty careless with that rifle, Ben. Don't get smart with me, Marshal. I know what I'm doing. And what would that be? I heard you in there. Heard you promise to take Tara away. I was right by the window. I heard it all. You got a curious way of courting the girl, Ben, trying to kill her father. Yeah, and I saw you yesterday looking at that saddle, but I didn't kill him, Marshal. You did. That's a lie, Ben Walling, and oh, you, you know it. I won't shut up. If we'd have just got here sooner, Mr. Dillon would have saved him, that's all. Yeah. Well, it's too bad you got here at all. Because you're going to die for it. Both of Put the gun down, Ben. You're under arrest for attempted murder. You stay right where you are, Marshal. You know, I have an idea you've smelled powder before, Ben, and that you're afraid of it. Marshal? I have an idea that's why you tried to get Hantry like you did instead of facing it. Stop, sir. And right now you wish you didn't have that rifle at all, don't you, Ben? Because I might have to shoot you. No, all right, huh? no, don't, Marshal. Give me that. You all right, Mr. Dillon? You didn't even try, Chester. Rifle went off when I knocked it aside. That's all he was scared to death. Well, I, I didn't feel exactly comfortable. Well, tie him up and keep an eye on him. I'll go see Tara. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Late that evening, we buried Hantry out on the prairie, out in back of the little homestead. They would die now, too, and fall apart without him. The next morning, we loaded everything we could get into the wagon. With Tara beside me, we started out for Dodge. Ben Wallen never said a word. Chester led his horse, and they rode along ahead of us. I had plenty of time to tell Tara all about Dodge and how there were some good people there and how we'd find her a home and a family. She sat there, tight-lipped. She didn't say much, but she never once looked back.
Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Sammy Hill, and Larry Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. In case you didn't know, Jack Benny and his gang begin their new season tomorrow night. Jack, Mary, Don, Dennis, and Rochester welcome a new member to the team, the head man of CBS Radio's Club 15 show, Bob Crosby. Roy Rowan speaking. Remember the top dramatic show of them all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. You know, Chester, a morning like this makes a man glad to be alive. Oh, it's a fine one, all right, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. A little nippy, maybe, but just fine. Indian summer hanging on and winter holding off. You know, Chester, this time of year, I wouldn't trade western Kansas for everything east of the Mississippi. Oh, good. Pedro's got a fire going on. I built the fire, Marshal Dillon. Oh, good morning, Caleb. I've been waiting in this jail office for a full two hours. What time do you start work, Marshal? You know Caleb Andrews, don't you, Chester? Oh, yes, indeed. How are you, Mr. Andrews? Marshal, I have an order here from the U.S. District Court. I believe it's your job to serve such orders. Yeah, it is. I don't get them often, though. Yeah. Order of foreclosure and eviction on Ed Blake. Why are you doing this to Ed, Caleb? The man borrowed money from me. He gave me a mortgage on his farm and household effects. He can't pay it. Why do you think I'm doing it? It only came due three days ago. You sure didn't waste any time. I'm not interested in your opinions, Marshal Dillon. Yeah, amount of the mortgage. $420. What do you need with $420? You own half of Ford County now. Marshal, it's not your place. You know as well as I do why Ed Blake can't pay this off. His horse rolled on him last spring and broke his leg. And his wife and kid nearly broke their backs trying to get a crop out. I didn't come here to listen if to you. If you let this ride on through the winter, you'll get your money out of it. But if you go ahead and foreclose now, you'll wipe him out. Marshal, I already have foreclosed. You'd break a man for $420 you don't even need, huh? As I said, your opinions don't interest me. All I expect from you is to serve these papers. All right, I'll serve them. You'll notice they're to be served today. I said I'd serve them. Now get out. What? This office belongs to the United States government, and as far as I know, that's one thing you got no mortgage on, so get out. 
You may find I have some influence in Washington, Marshal Dillon. Then see if you can get me a decent salary for this rotten job of mine. It sure was a fine morning, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it was. All right, Chester, let's saddle up. This is one job I surely wish we didn't have to do, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. My, this sure is a nice farm. Ed and Martha have put in a lot of work here the last four years. We don't have any choice, Chester. Yes, sir, I know. It's a downright shame, though. Hey, Marshal! Oh, boy. Well, hi, Jimmy. Look at here what I got, Marshal. Well, looks to me like a mighty dead coyote. Sure, that's what it is. <laughs> He's been killing my chicken, so last night I hid off behind the barn. Yeah? I got him with one shot, Mr. Dillon, and there wasn't even a full moon. Well, that's fine, Jimmy. Matt Dillon, how are you? Uh, uh, good morning, Martha. And Chester, too. Miss Blake? Well, I'm glad to see you. Get down, come on in. Oh, uh, thank you. Jimmy... <laughs> Now that you showed that thing to Mr. Dillon, take it away somewhere. All right, Mom. <laughs> he sure is a big one, ain't he, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> yeah, about the biggest I ever saw, Jimmy. <laughs> He's real proud of those chickens of his. He's done fine with them. Well, here I am, though, keeping you standing out here in the yard. Come on, let's go inside. Well, uh, we really can't stay, Martha. Oh, nonsense. You don't get out here once in a coon's day. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you And see... you're just in time. Your favorite dish, Matt. I was about to take it out of the oven when you rode up. Cornbread. Buttermilk cornbread, eh? That's right. <laughs> Ed's not here, but you will say, won't you? Well, Martha, I'd like to, but, well, we just can't, that's all. The thing is that, uh... Uh... You say Ed's away? Yes. He, he's in town. Matt, you're not yourself. What is it? Well, I... suppose I ought to talk to Ed about this, but... Maybe it'll be better if he hears it from you. Here's what? Martha, I, I got a court order here. It has to do with that mortgage of Caleb Andrews. It's a order of foreclosure and eviction and sale. No. Oh, no. Here it is. We were so sure he'd extend it. He knows what happened and why we couldn't pay it. We were sure he'd extend it. Well, he won't. I talked to him. Matt, uh, how long before we have to get out? Five days. So soon. You were right, Matt. It, it is better that Ed hears it from me. Coming on top of everything else, it'll... Well, I, I can't let it break him. I, I just can't let it break him. Martha, if there's anything I can do, you you let me know, huh? Matt, I, I don't blame you for this. I understand. Well, come on in now and have some cornbread with well, us. Well, I, I, I couldn't. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you anyway, Martha. But I, well, I just couldn't. Matt, you've looked low all week. Oh, it's just things in general, Kitty. Sometimes you get to wondering if it's all worth it or not. The Blakes, huh? Huh? Chester was telling me. Ah, Chester talks too much. It's not your fault, Matt. Somebody had to serve the order. Somebody has to be hangman, too. <laughs> Life's never all good, Matt. There's always a little bad in it. Well, in my job, it's more than a little. <laughs> Try making your living sometime as a dance hall girl. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But when you gotta go out and boot somebody like the Blakes off their land and out of their home, then you start wondering what's right and what's wrong, and so. Well, if you find out, Matt, let me know. I've always. Oh, oh there you are, Marshal. I stopped by the jail. Well, all right, Caleb. What's on your mind? Uh, that Blake family, Marshal. They were supposed to vacate today. Well, they haven't done it. I rode by there a little while ago. According to the court order, they got until sundown. But they haven't made the slightest preparation to... 
Marshal, I believe I'd prefer to discuss our business elsewhere than in the presence of this, uh, this... Easy, Caleb. Matt, uh, I'll go. Caleb, you're going to apologize to Miss Kitty right now. No. Apologize? <laughs> if you think I'm going to apologize to this cheap little baggage who's in this... <coughs> hey. Matt, you shouldn't have done that. Finnegan, take him outside and throw some water on him. Yes, sir, Marshal. Why not, Kitty? He had it coming to him. He'll do everything he can to hurt you now. He'll take it out on the Blakes, too. Yeah, maybe. Look, Kitty, I I just got an idea. Uh, I'll see you later. All right, Matt. But, Matt, the mere fact a man runs a bank doesn't always mean he's got a free hand in everything he does. A bank has stockholders, a board of directors. I've got to listen to them. I think they'd approve the loan, Clem. Another thing, Caleb Andrews is the biggest account I've got. If I crossed him by taking this loan you suggest, Matt, he'd break me. I see. All right, Clem, forget it. Matt, I, I realize I'm under obligation to you. You saved my life that time the James brothers held me up. Saved the bank, too, in fact. But that was part of my job, Clem. There's no obligation. I I was just asking you as a friend to help out another friend. Matt, I'd like to do it, but I just can't. Don't you see? Yeah, it? sure, Clem. I see. Yeah. Just forget it. Got to think of my wife and the two girls. Yeah, of course you have. It's not that I don't want to I help, understand, but... Clem. I really do. Forget it. There. That ought to hold it a while. That fire feels kind of good, Mr. Dillon. It's getting chillish out tonight. Yeah, I guess we better have Pedro lay in some more wood. Yes, sir. When winter sets in, it always makes you feel good to know you got a warm place to hold up. Be mighty rough not to have a... Not to... Yeah, I was thinking of the same thing, Chester. You suppose they... Vacated this afternoon? I don't know. We'll ride out there in the morning and find out. Sure is a shame. It's just too bad that... A... Come in. Can we bother you, bother you Matt? Ed! Oh, oh well, come in. Come in, Martha. Well, hiya, Jimmy. Uh, well, uh, come on up to the stove, folks. <laughs> come on. Matt, the fact is that we... We kind of like to impose on you for tonight. We haven't got any place to go. No money. Wondered if we could sleep in the jail tonight. Oh, sure, Ed. Uh, uh, Chester, would you, would you get a fire going back there? All right, Mr. Dillon. And dig up some blankets out of the storeroom, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, Want to come help me, Jimmy? Jimmy? <laughs> no, you... Yeah. You go along with Chester now, boy. Go on. All right. He, um, he doesn't understand all this, Matt. He, he... Uh, Ed, we, we may as well get your stuff out of the wagon, I guess. Well, there ain't any wagon, Matt. We walked into town. Six miles? With that leg? I know, but that wagon, the horses, all the household goods, they're all covered by that mortgage. We didn't take anything. Except the clothes on our backs. Oh, so help me, Ed. So help now, me if it, I could... It's all right, Matt. We know how you feel. But after all, we started with nothing before. We can do it again. But there's no reason you should have to. We do have to, though. And that's that. Ed and I can accept it. We're not bitter any longer. Jimmy can't understand. He's He's been carrying on pretty bad, but he's just a boy. And in time, he'll be able Mr. to... Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? It's Jimmy. He grabbed a rifle from off the rack and took out the back way. I couldn't stop him. Huh? Where on earth is he going? I think I know where he's going. And heaven help Caleb Andrews if we don't catch him. We will return.
return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, that widely traveled man of music, Mr. Vaughn Monroe, will land in Pottstown, Pennsylvania this Saturday night. The Moon Maids, the Moon Man, and the Monroe Ensemble will be on hand to enliven the session. Remember, tomorrow night and every Saturday evening, it's Vaughn Monroe and his musical caravan on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Mr. Andrews' house there on the corner. Looks dark, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he may not be home. I sure hope he isn't. No sign of the boy around. Reckon he broke in the house, Mr. Dillon? Maybe. Any hot's ten to one, this is where he headed for. His mother said he was real upset about it, and it's just like a kid to... Chester? Mm Hmm? There's somebody back of that tree up there on the left. Hmm. Yeah. Think it's him? I don't know. Just keep on walking. Yeah, it's him, all right. I can see the moonlight on the rifle barrel. Will we try to rush him, Mr. Dillon? Not unless you're thinking of suicide. I'm going to talk to him, Chester. Jimmy? It's me, Matt Dillon. Go away, Mr. Dillon. Better go away now. Don't bother me. I can't do that, Jimmy. You're a friend of mine, and I figure you're waiting here to do something that you'd be sorry for, and I, I can't let you do that. Nothing you can do about it, Mr. Dillon. I got a gun here, and I'm going to kill him. You go away now and leave me alone. Jimmy, I know how you feel. I don't like Caleb either, but killing him's no answer. You folks feel bad enough already. Think how it would hurt him if you did. Stop, didn't. Mr. Dillon. I'll stay where you are. Don't come any closer. I have to, Jimmy. It's my job. So if you're going through with this, I guess you'll have to kill me first. No, no. No, Mr. Dillon, now stay back. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I don't have a choice. But you do. No. No. I couldn't shoot you, Mr. Dillon. You know that. Sure. I knew you couldn't. I kept waking up nights and hear a mom crying. Dad would sit up all night without the lamp lit, no fire, not say anything, just sit. Easy now, Jimmy. Why is he doing it to us, Mr. Dillon? Jimmy, <laughs> listen to me. Will you do something for a friend? Yeah, if you say so. All right, then take that rifle back to the jail and put it in the rack. And go to bed. Now, you promise? Yeah. I promise, Mr. Dillon. I'm sorry. I'll do like you say. You're all right, Jimmy. Good night, son. told you Clem Bates wouldn't do anything, Matt. He wouldn't dare. He'd be scared Caleb would take his money out of the bank. Yeah, that's about what he said. I don't know, Kitty. I've done everything I could possibly think of. Well, the worst of it is everybody in town is just as scared of Caleb as Clem is. (laughs) I doubt if they'll even have the nerve to bid against him at the sale. Yeah, I know. He'll probably get the place at not much more than the amount of the mortgage. Four hundred and twenty dollars. Matt, I've seen more than that change hands across a poker table here in one deal. You think that's all it takes? I beg your pardon, Miss Kitty. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, Jack. I'm not usually one to eavesdrop on people, but I have been listening to you, too. Uh, Jack, have you met Marshal Dillon? No, I haven't had the pleasure. The reason I butted in, Miss Kitty, I heard you talking about these people losing their home. I don't know, this fellow Blake, he's never done any business over my table and probably never will. No, I I don't think he's ever been in here. And I don't know if this will make sense. But the thing is, I left home when I was ten years old and I've been drifting ever since. When I see somebody like this Blake that sticks it out and works and fights and and gets a raw deal. Well, what I'm getting at, 
Here's fifty dollars if that'll help him any. Ah, oh, Jack. Well, this is awful decent of you, Jack. Matt, I said a while ago that nearly everyone in town was afraid of Caleb. Yeah. Well, there's some who aren't, like Jack here and me. And the rest of the dealers and the gamblers and the, the girls and the bartenders. That's right, Miss Kitty. Because we're drifters. We got nothing to lose. Matt, I'll raise $420 right here in the Texas Trail. By heaven, Kitty, I think you could. Well, I can't do as well as Jack, but... <laughs> uh, here's 20 from me. Boys! Everybody! Now listen to me for a minute. I got something to say. He's sure taking his time getting here, Chester. Well, I told him what you said, Mr. Dillon. Well, that ought to bring him on the run, if anything, Will. Anytime Caleb figures he's about to lose a dollar or two, it's hitting him where it hurts. The Blakes turned in for the night? Yeah, I guess so. It's been quiet back there for the last few minutes. Marshal, what's this all about? Well, shut the door, Caleb. We're trying to keep it warm in here. Would you mind telling me why I've been called over here at this time of night? Yeah, sure. Here's $420. The Blakes want to pay off the mortgage. They do, do they? The court costs up to now probably run about $10. I'll pay that myself. That's mighty generous of you. Well, good night, Marshal. Is it a deal, then? I am not the least bit interested in having that mortgage paid off, Marshal Dillon. The Blake farm is worth about $2,000 now, and in five years it'll be worth three times that much. Land's going up in Ford County. That's why I'm grabbing every piece I can get. So I don't want the money. I want the farm. And when it's put up for sale, I'll get it at my own price. The foreclosure still goes. I see. Good night, gentlemen. Well, I guess that's that, Mr. Dillon. I don't know why I even thought he'd take the money. The Blakes won't get a cent out of the sale. He'll scare everybody off and bid it in a few dollars over the amount of the mortgage, and nobody in town will even try to... Even try to... Try to what, Mr. Dillon? Chester, I'm going over and wake up Clem Bates. I got an idea, and if it works, we'll hold that sale at noon tomorrow. That's pretty short notice to find an auctioneer. I don't need an auctioneer, Chester. This one I'm going to run myself. All right, everybody. All right. Now, all of you know what we're here for. This is a foreclosure sale of the property and household effects of Edward and Martha Blake, ordered by the court at the request of that fine-spirited, good-hearted public benefactor and friend and neighbor of us all, Caleb Andrews. Marshal Dillon, I refuse to tolerate this. Caleb, I think we better get one thing straight right now. The law tells me I gotta conduct this sale, but the law doesn't tell me what I gotta say while I'm conducting it. Get on with it. Get on with the sale. All right. Now, uh, the first item I'm offering is a breadboard. Ms. Blake tells me she's used this for nearly ten years. That's a lot of loaves of bread. A lot of years. As you can see, it's pretty badly battered up. I doubt if it'd be worth much to anybody unless they were used to it. Suppose we started at 50 cents. Is there anybody here low enough to bid 50 cents for Mrs. Blake's breadboard? How about you, Caleb? I'm not interested in the item. Get on with the sale. Anybody else? No? All right, then. The second item. It's a crib. Now, you'll notice it's handmade. Rough construction. Never been painted. And it's been well used. Ed built it himself 12 years ago, just before Jimmy was born. There are teeth marks all over the slats here, but that doesn't really hurt anything. Marshal also... Dillon, may I suggest you lump the household effects together and offer them as one bulk item? I'm sorry, Caleb. I'd rather offer them one at a time. 
Unless, of course, you'd care to waive all claim to the household effects and withdraw them from the order of foreclosure. I waive the claim. The household goods are withdrawn. Now get on to the house and land. So ordered. Now, the item offered is 160 acres of tillable land, a four-room house, and a barn. I won't read through the description. You all know the property. It's a good farm. The amount of the mortgage is $420. Held by Caleb Andrews. All right, the bidding's open. What am I offered? $450. I have $450 from Cable Andrews. Do I hear another bid? Oh, the farm's worth $2,000. You're going to let him have it for $450? How about another bidder? Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Well, I've been thinking some lately of getting me a little place like this and settling down. I'll, I'll bid $1,000. I have $1,000. Do I hear another bid? It's a trick. He doesn't want this place. $1,000. Going once. $1,200. Caleb Andrews bids $1,200. What do you say, Chester? Well, sir, I, I think I kind of like this farm. $1,500. This is ridiculous. The bid is $1,500. Going once. Going twice. $1,600. $1,600 from Mr. Andrews. Chester? $8,420. He never had that much money in his whole life. Do I hear another bid? Oh, what do you say, Caleb? Do you think I'm a fool? Go and once, go and twice, sold. The Chester Proud put for $8,420. The buyer will come forward and complete the sale. Don't you worry none about me, Mr. Andrews. I got it right here. There, there, there's $8,000 in $500 bills, and here is the four twenty. Where did you ever get that much in cash? Well, I saved my pay, Mr. Andrews. Then, of course, I, I drink just mostly beer. It adds up after a while. Caleb, I guess $420 of this is yours. And that takes care of the money. Well, Ed, looks like you made a pretty fair profit on the place. Here's a lot better than I expected. Here's your money. Thank you, Matt. But I tell you, I'd still still rather have the farm than the money. Well, now, I've been sort of thinking it over, Mr. Blake. (laughs) Maybe I kind of lost my head. But when you come right down to it, I don't know what I'd ever do with a farm, so... If you'd like to buy it, I'll take a $420 loss and sell it back to you for $8,000 cash. (laughs) Don, here's your money. This is unheard of. They can't do it, Marshal. Well, as far as I know, there's no law against a man selling his own property. Now, the way I see it, Mr. Andrews, is right this minute you're a trespasser on my property. Come on, let's go. I'm going, Gracie. Who do you think you're laughing Chester. You better get that $8,000 back to the bank. Clem Bates is probably worrying himself into a breakdown for fear somebody will find out that he let us have it. All right, Mr. Dillon, I'll see you in town later. Yeah. Oh, Matt, Matt, I I don't know how we can ever thank you for what you've done. Uh, Not me, Martha. Thank the bunch that work at the Texas Trail. You know, they're bums and drifters, most of them. But when Kitty told them the story, they really came through. We'll pay it back, Matt, every cent of it. And, well, that that girl, Kitty, I I guess I've said some hard things about her in the past, but... Matt, will you ask her to come out to dinner some afternoon? What? I'd like to thank her myself. (laughs) Sure, Martha. I'll ask her. And I think she'll appreciate that more than you'll ever know. Smoke under the direction of Norman McDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Paula Winslow, and Richard Beals, with Joe Duval, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jim Nusser. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. 
Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Here's a suggestion for Saturday listening. Fun for All, starring Bill Cullen and Arlene Francis, and John Reed King's great show, Give and Take. Hear them tomorrow on CBS Radio. Clancy Cassell speaking. And remember, you'll find Western adventure and music with Gene Autry Saturday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Except for that coyote. He's wailing his head off out there. <laughs> Mad at the moon, I guess. Or in love, maybe. Oh? Yes, sir. The way I've noticed it, any time you find a man or an animal out squalling around in the dark, it's usually love. <laughs> yeah, but this one sounds kind of mournful, Chester. Well, sir, love is mournful sometimes, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, so I've heard. Matt? Uh, Is that you? Oh, good evening, Miss Morley. How have you been, Matt? Oh, fine. Fine, thank you. You, uh, down here on Front Street this time of night alone? I'm looking for Red Lawson. He's a new man, works for Al. I was meeting him sometime after midnight, and they're going out on a cattle buying trip. I want to talk to him first. You satisfied? <laughs> well, it's... Just that this is no place for a woman alone, Miss Morley. Uh, maybe you better go home. There are other women down here. They belong here, Miss Morley. They work here. Oh, don't be so stuffy, Matt. And call me Ava for once. Everybody else does. Well, your husband might take exception to that, Miss Morley. Now, you're blaming me for what happened before, aren't you? I'm not blaming you for anything, Miss Morley. I didn't tell him to get into a gunfight over me wasn't my fault. I didn't say it was. Chester, you better see that Miss Morley gets home, all right? Yes, sir. I can get home by myself. My. She's pretty as a picture. It makes you wonder. Yeah, maybe you were right, Chester. With a woman like that, love might be kind of mournful. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So I'd just give my rope a couple turns around that juniper stump, and I'd jerk back on uh, it. Lawson? Oh, hi, Marshal. I wonder if I could see you for a minute, huh? Yeah, sure. Be right back, boys. Right, yeah. What's on your mind, Marshal? Lawson, I, uh, I just ran into Ms. Morley in the street outside. You did? Yeah, I suggested she go home. She's got no business being down here this time of night. It uh, might be a good idea if uh, you'd tell her that, huh? Seems to me that's up to her husband. Look, you're new here, Lawson. I, uh, I guess you didn't know Fred Curtis and the Santa Fe kid. I heard about it. A couple of fools, as far as I can see. Yeah, I guess they were after they met Ms. Morley. Hey, look, Marshal. What's your stake in this? I got no stake. What Ms. Morley does is her own business, as long as it doesn't cause any trouble. I'm just trying to keep her peace, that's all. I... I feel kind of sorry for her, that's all. Al treats her like a dog. Uh-huh. Fred and the kid used to talk the same way. Like I said, a couple of fools. I'm not. I hope not. See you around, Marshal. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, I would think so. Sure. Hi, you kitty. Can I speak to you? Oh, sure, man. Uh, excuse me, boys. I'll be back. All right, all right. All right. You hurry back. What, Matt? Kitty, has Al Morley been in tonight? Oh, no. I haven't seen him, Matt. Should he have been around? Oh, not necessarily. He and Lawson are riding out around midnight on a cattle buying trip. I I just thought they might be meeting here. Oh, well, not yet anyway. Jesse Wells would know what the plans are, though. Jesse Wells? Yeah, the bartender down there at the end, the young one. You know him. Oh, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, why would he know? Well, he's going along. I'll ask him to help out there. Going to follow the Lazy Bee Roundup. Try to get in ahead of the buyers from Chicago. Oh, yeah. He, uh... He's a nice-looking kid. I wonder if, uh... Yeah. Yeah, he's another friend of Ava's. Marshal? Marshal Dillon! Oh, come on. Wake up, Marshal! All right, all right. Take it easy. Who is it? Jesse Wells, Marshal. Open the door. All right, just a second till I get it. There. What's the trouble, Wells? Al Morley, Marshal. Then you better get your horse, because we got to ride back out there. Out where? What happened? Buffalo Flats. We camped there to wait for the roundup crew. And Al's dead, Marshal. He's knifed in the back. Did you do it? No. It was Red Lawson. He knifed Al and he stole the money we were going to use to buy cattle. What in the world is going on, Mr. Dillon? You better saddle up, Chester. We got a ride. What's the trouble? Ah, oh, the usual. Nothing new but the names. Seems Red Lawson turned out to be a fool in spite of himself. <laughs> This way, Marshal. Camp is right there by that plum thick. Right. Be daylight in another 20 minutes. Hello, boy. Oh, oh. He's laying over there by the bushes. <clears throat> yeah, I see him. Whose knife is it, Jesse? It's Al's. We were all asleep. We built a fire, made some coffee, and then turned in. 
Could wait for daylight. The Lazy Bee Bunch plan to work their stock up this way. I see. Yeah, here, Chester. Wrap the knife in something and hang on to it. Huh? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Now, go on, Jesse. What happened? Well, well, like I said, Marshal Dillon, we were all asleep. I guess it was the sound of the horse's hooves woke me up. Mm-hmm. Red lost and he was pulling out. No, I run over to Al, shook him to wake him up and tell him. Then I saw the knife. He was dead. Where were you sleeping, Jesse? Well, oh, right about here, I guess. Red was across the fire over there, and Al was where he's laying now. What about the money? How'd you know it was gone? Well, I thought about it right off, and I figured that's why Red done it. Al was carrying about $10,000 in a little leather sack. He'd stuck it under the blanket before we'd gone to sleep. So I went and looked for it. It was gone. You figure Red killed him for the money, then? Well, sure. Of course, I doubt he meant it, though. I think Red was trying to ease the sack out from under the blanket when Al woke up and caught him. Yeah, it's possible. Be light enough to start tracking him in a few minutes, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Sun's poking up over there now. Looks like it's going to be a clear day. Which way'd Lawson head out, Jesse? East. Seemed to be following the wagon tracks. Odds are bad, Mr. Dillon. He's got quite a start on us. Yeah, too much of a start. Well, let's load the pack mule, Chester. I think we'll ride back into Dodge and then take the train from there to Abilene then work back from the east. Say, that's a good idea. Lawson probably won't be expecting anybody ahead of him. I can't understand it. I just can't understand how anybody could... could do a thing like this. It sounds like a metal arc, Chester. Yes, sir, he just flew into those bushes. Red seemed to... Pretty nice fellow, as far as I could tell. It's a funny time of year for a metal arc, isn't it? Guess $10,000 was just too much temptation, huh? Oh, some of them hangs around all winter, Mr. Dillon. No, that sure sounds a lot better than that coyote, Howlin. Mm. All right, Chester. Get a hold of his feet. Let's load him up. <laughs> Sumac Creek water tanks right around the bend up ahead of us there. How long we stop here? Oh, about five minutes. Just long enough to take on water. Might as well relax, Marshal. It's a long ways yet to Abilene. Why, we ain't but 24 miles from Dodge City. Feels more like a hundred. These seats are harder than a saddle. Yeah. Uh, say, uh, this here fellow you boys looking for, I uh, guess he's a real mean enough. Huh? Oh, yeah, mean enough. Well, it's just like I always say. This prairie country ain't never going to be a law-abiding place to live. Well, every time I pull out of Kansas City on the Northwest, I'm expecting every minute to be shot or hung or scalped. Chester. What's the matter, Mr. Dillon? Look out the window here. Around the bend there by the water tank. Huh. Looks like we don't have to go to Abilene. Mm, oh, yeah. There's some fella waiting to catch a train, I guess. You boys recognize... Is he the one? Yeah. His horse is there, tied there by the tank. Must have decided on a quicker way of traveling. Yeah, it looks that way. All right, Chester, he won't be expecting us. Let's get out in the vestibule and then drop off and take him as soon as the train stops. Yes, sir. Hey, Marshal, whatever you do, don't let him get on this train. Just keep the passengers away from the windows. In a way, it's too bad, Mr. Dillon. Miss Morley would have really enjoyed that $10,000. You're guessing, Chester. And he hasn't seen us yet. All right, let's go. Lawson, get your hands up. Bill, you're under arrest. Get your hands up. Bill, he's running for his horse, Mr. Dillon. Lawson! He's going to fight. You can't get away on foot. Let's go, let's go. Lawson! Come on, Chester. That's a cutting it awful thin, Mr. Dillon. Giving a man three chances before you haul down on him? Well, we're still on our feet. He's not. Yeah, but it's a push in the odds, though. Yeah, I guess. Uh, All right, uh, pick up his gun there, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, Lawson? Uh, uh, he's still alive, Mr. Dillon. Can you hear me, Lawson? Uh, sure. Sure, I can hear you. 
There's a sack of money. Looks like it fell out of his coat. Yeah, I see it. Lawson, there's no doctor on the train. We're going to try to stop the bleeding and do the best we can for you. There'll be a train back toward Dodge City in about a half hour. We'll wait for it. <coughs> Is that all right with you? I, I don't... don't have, have any choice, do I? No, I guess you don't. You made your choice last night. Was she worth it? We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... Every Saturday night, Gene Autry invites all his friends to visit him at Melody Ranch for a half hour of songs and stories about the Old West. Tune in the Gene Autry Show tomorrow night over most of these same CBS radio stations. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. That's a bad one, Matt. Yes, I'd say the bullet's lying right in against his heart. I just tried to wing him, Doc, but we were both moving. You can't always call him, you know. No, I guess not. Well, I'm afraid that's about all I can do for him, Matt. It's not enough, is that it? He won't live an hour. I wish he was conscious. I want to talk to him. Well, the stimulant might take effect, and... Then again, might not. With this kind of a case, you never know. <clears throat> uh, what is it you're after, Matt? Ms. Morley. Accessory before the fact? Yeah, she could have been. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a broken down old man, Matt, but if that woman rolled her eyes at me just once, well, uh, I don't. I do not know. I just might. <clears throat> uh, Matt. Yeah. <sighs> Lawson? Lawson, can you talk? Can you hear me, Lawson? Yeah. Sure. Was Ms. Morley in on it? Nobody was in on it. Did she know you were going to do it? She had... She... She had nothing to do with it. Was she going to meet you somewhere later? She had... Nothing to do with it. It was my idea. Nobody else. Lawson. Lawson, listen to me. You're dying. Do you know that? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I I can feel it. She wasn't in on it. All right. That's the way you want it. At least Al won't treat her like a dog anymore. What do you mean? I mean, a dead man can't bother anybody. Al? You ought to know. You killed him. No. 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 What? He was asleep. I I took the money and, and rode away. And they were both asleep. I didn't touch him. You're telling the truth. I swear I didn't kill him. I only stole the money and I... 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 I didn't get... Well, I guess I was wrong, Matt. The bullet was closer to his heart than I thought. Yeah. And I was wrong about something myself, Doc. I thought this was the end of it. Now it's wide open again. Wide open. I don't 
see why you got me here, just ask the same things all over again, Marshal, because I told you how it happened. Yeah, I know, Jesse. You caught Red Lawson with the money on him. Now, what more proof do you need? It only proves he took the money, Jesse. It doesn't prove he killed Al. Well, what do you mean? Chester, you better punch that fire up over there a little, huh? It does seem to be getting chilly in here. Now, what do you mean by that, Marshal? You killed Al yourself. Didn't you, Jesse? You're out of your mind. You woke up and saw Red steal the money and take off, and it gave you ideas. You slipped over and knifed Al in his sleep. You knew Lawson had got the blame for it. Well, sure. Sure, because he did it. He said he didn't. Dang, stove. Well, Marshal, did you expect him to tell the truth? He was dying, Jesse. Knew he was dying. I think he told the truth. I see. His word against mine. Word of a thief. I didn't say I could prove it, Jesse. But you did it, though. We both know that. And sooner or later, I'm going to get you for it. Yeah. Chester, I think it'd draw better if you'd open the damper. Mr. Dillon? It was a quiet night last night. And two men who were alive last night are gone tonight. Sure makes you stop and wonder. Well, at least one thing hasn't changed. That coyote's still there. I guess there'll always be coyotes around, Mr. Dillon. What are you going to do about Jesse Wells? Oh, I don't know, Chester. He's he's guilty. You can see it written all over him. But there'd be no use bringing him in. I haven't got one piece of evidence. I, I don't know. Yes, sir. She's quite a woman. Mercy. Quite a woman. Yeah, she is that all right. Matt? Is that you? Uh, good evening, Miss Morley. Who are you looking for tonight? Can't be Red Lawson. He's dead. So is my husband. You forgotten? My deepest sympathy. Don't bother. You know better. I am sorry about Red, though. He was nice. You're the one who did it, aren't you, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. Oh, yeah. I couldn't do anything else. I don't know why you say for me. It wasn't my fault. Yeah, sure, I know. You know. You don't know anything. You don't know how it feels to sit in the house alone with your husband dead. No one in town coming near you. Like he was poison or something. Sure, I don't feel sorry about Al, but I would have once. He's the one who changed me, made me feel different. I know it wasn't your fault. And you didn't even come to tell me he was dead. Why not? It's part of your job, isn't it? I didn't come and tell you, Miss Morley, because I figured that you'd... Chester? Yes, sir? Would you mind walking on ahead? I'll meet you on the Texas Trail in a few minutes. Well, I... All right, Mr. Dillon, if you say so... Why, well, I'd just send him away, Matt. I, uh... I was just wondering if, uh... you were going to be home later tonight. Well, I could be. Around, uh... 10 o'clock, say? Sure, Matt. I'll be there. <laughs> Kitty. Chester and I were trying to think of some way to rescue you from Ava's clutches. Only one thing, though, Mr. Dillon. I wasn't sure you wanted to be rescued. Uh, Kitty, has Doc been in tonight? Oh, I haven't seen him, Matt. Chester, will you see if you can find him and have him meet me here? Yes, sir. Right away, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Kitty, God. Uh, yeah? I wonder if you'd help me with something. Well, sure, Matt. What? Drop a hint to that bartender, Jesse Wells, that it might be smart to slip out of here and pay a visit to Ms. Morley's around, oh, say, 9.45 tonight. All right. Um, is it anything you can talk about? I don't exactly know how to talk about it, Kitty. I got a murder on my hands. 
I know who the killer is, and I can't touch him. So? So I'm going to try to make him touch me. Oh. All right, Matt. I'll take care of it. Um, will you be around for a while? Yeah, yeah. I'll be here till about 10. Matt Dillon. Who'd you think? Just a minute. Well, hurry up. Let me in. All right, Dillon. Come on in. Well, Jesse, I thought you were working. I was, till just a few minutes ago. Well, what's on your mind? <laughs> uh... Well, I... Uh... I think Mr. Dillon probably wants to ask me some questions or something. Yeah, 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 I, I, I do, as a matter of fact. Uh, Jesse Wells, for instance. Well, he didn't tell me he was going to be here, Ava. Well, I... What do you mean, she didn't tell you? Wait, Ava, what about this? You were expecting him. You knew he was coming. Of course you knew I was coming. You and Matt Dillon. For how long? And what kind of a fool does that make me? I'm afraid you were born a fool, Jesse. That's why she picked you. She's so wonderful, you said if only Al didn't stand in our way. I didn't tell you to kill him. I didn't mention it once. You didn't have to. Just kept dropping hints, leading me on. And all the time, you and Matt Dillon. She's too smart for you, Jesse. You should have realized that. Yeah. And instead, I played right into your hands... Both of you. How, Jesse? Killing Al, getting him out of your way, giving the two of you a clear field. You're under arrest for murder, Jesse. What? Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Both of you would. Sit around and laugh about it while you're waiting for me to hang. I said you're under arrest. Now hand over your gun. No, you don't, Dylan. You're not going to carry it that far. You're not taking me in for something both of you wanted me to do. Hand over your gun, Jesse. You want my gun, you got to take it away from me. Get away from the door. Oh, sure, I'll get away from it. Holy, Mr. Wells! Ah! Are you all right, Chester? Yes, sir. It was close, but he missed me. Well, you two didn't miss him. I don't know which one of you fired first, but either bullet would have done it. Well, you got his confession all right, Mr. Dillon. Doc and I heard every word from the front porch there. We sure did. Only one thing, though, Matt. He he didn't implicate the woman in it. Yeah. I know. Will you take charge, Doc? Oh, sure. Be glad to. Part of my job, you know. Matt. All right, Chester. Let's go. Matt. Could I see you for a minute before you go? Matt? What's it add up to, Mr. Dillon? Three men have been killed since this same time last night. Yeah. And you know, Mr. Dillon, I think maybe it's kind of all her fault. A and you can't pin a thing on it. My. Well, there's one lucky thing. There aren't many women like her. Smoke under the direction of Norman McDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lillian Bayef, with Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jack Crucian. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke.
Strange Island tells the remarkable story of a tropical paradise that sank into the sea. Hear all about it on Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Hear about the miracle that saves Tarzan from drowning and brings the island back from the sea. Remember, it's yours for thrills on tomorrow night's exciting adventure with Tarzan. Created by Edgar Rice Burroughs and brought to you now by CBS Radio. Clancy Cassell speaking. And remember, Broadway's My Beat brings you startling mysteries Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. to you tonight by Plymouth with an invitation for you to visit a Plymouth dealer's tomorrow. Meet the new Plymouth and enter the big $25,000 contest. Throughout Kansas and in the territories on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. It's here, a new kind of low-priced car. The exciting 53 Plymouth, completely new, completely beautiful. Yes, it's the new Plymouth for 1953. The first truly balanced car in the low-priced field. More glamorous lines, more powerful engine, more luxurious comfort. What a beauty. The new 53 Plymouth is lower to the road with a lot lower look. New color schemes and two-tone color harmonies available in all models. How does she travel? Man, Plymouth puts out the best ride in the business. Smooth as sailing, even in the back seat. And the Plymouth engine's been stepped up to 100 horsepower for pickup with plenty of flash. Visibility? Say, there's a one-piece curved windshield, a new type with no troublesome distortion, and you sit chair height in a Plymouth, so you get the full benefit of Plymouth's new down-sweeping hood. You really see right down in front of your car. Bigger side windows, too, and a huge wraparound rear window, so everyone gets a view as big as all outdoors. The new 53 Plymouth's an exciting car any way you look at it. A great advance in car value at no advance in price. In fact, four new Plymouth models actually cost less than last year. So don't put off seeing it. Meet the new 53 Plymouth at your nearby Plymouth dealers. If you go in tomorrow, you may win one free in the big Meet the New Plymouth contest. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon. United States Marshal. The cook sure must have had a bad night, Mr. Dillon. Well, how do you figure that, Chester? Well, sir, I never saw so much chili pepper on a couple of poor eggs. <laughs> he must figure everybody's got a hangover this morning. Almost everybody usually has of a Sunday around here. <laughs> well, now, I clean up forgot all about it being Sunday. No. <laughs> uh, so that's why Jim Cobbett's all dressed up over there, huh? 
first time I've ever seen him with his hair combed in. Well, well, haven't you heard about Jim, Chester? He's going to get married. He's got his wife-to-be coming in on the train from back east today. Jim Cobbett? Yeah. Well, now, what sort of a woman would that be, Mr. Dillon, who'd come clear to Dodge City to marry a fellow like Jim? No, Jim's a good man, Chester. It's just that, well, living out on that homestead of his year after year has made him grow a little off-center, so... Loneliness will do that to a man sometimes. Morning, Marshal. Chester. Morning, Hank. Well, what do you think of that old goat Jim Cobbett getting himself hitched? It's a fine thing, I'd say. Well, Jim's no older than you are, Hank Lewis. No older, maybe. A lot less respectable. Now you're talking your usual nonsense, Hank. Am I, Marshal? What about Jim's first wife who disappeared off of that place he had up north on Hackberry Creek? Just plain disappeared, she did. Jim never explained that. And nobody ever saw her again, either. Oh, you're worse than an old woman with your gossip, Hank. Jim's never done anything to you, Hank. Nothing except stake his homestead on the only spring south of the Smoky that didn't dry up. Cheated me out of it, that's what. He filed his claim two weeks before you did, Hank, and everybody knows it. Sneaked into town, that's what he did. Sneaked into town, behind my back. Still telling your lies, ain't you, Hank Lewis? No. Now, you keep away from me, Jim. Keep, keep away. I've never bothered you, Hank. But I hear you talking around Lila. When she gets here, I'll hurt you. I'll hurt you bad. What is it you want to hide from her, Jim? Maybe that business about your first wife? All right, don't touch that gun, Hank. Not a move. You arrest her, Marshal. You saw it. Get up. Put put him in jail now. I I didn't touch him. Shut up. Now, you're just lucky you weren't killed. Now, you get out of here and stay away from Jim. It's his wedding day, and if I find you bothering him again, I'll throw you in jail. Now, go on, move. Fine, fine, all we got around here, Maggie. Tighten up and have him. Sorry to make trouble, Marshal, but I won't hold for his making that talk around Lila. Oh, forget it, Jim. Just keep clear of him for a while. Uh, what time's the wedding? Well, about three o'clock. At least that's when the preacher said he'd come down. It'll be at the church, won't it, Jim? Well, no. The preacher thought maybe it'd be better to do it somewhere else. It's uh, because of... Yeah, yeah, sure, Jim. Uh, you know, Dodge City House would be a fine place, wouldn't it? That's just what I'd plan, Marshal. Uh, I brought a jug of corn in with me in case anyone came around, maybe. <laughs> Jim, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm going to be there for sure. Yeah, me too, Jim. I certainly do enjoy wedding. I never got married myself, but I sure do like to watch. <laughs> See you later, Jim. Sure, Marshal. It will be there, Jim. Bye. Jim's bride, Lila, turned out to be a handsome, high-strung woman with nervous black eyes and a manner that bespoke a gentle breeding and background. I watched her and I wondered how she'd ever make out in this crude, raw country she'd chosen to come to. It was never mentioned how she and Jim had got together, but the few friends who gathered for the wedding didn't care. We were all pleased that Jim finally had a wife to break the loneliness that he'd set upon himself for so long. And after the brief ceremony at the Dodge City House, we told him so. <laughs> well, it's about time, Jim. If you don't mind my saying so, ma'am, you should have filed on him long ago. Why, uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, of, of course. Open the jug on the table there, si. It's good corn. Well, thank you, Jim. My throat is a mite dusty. Help yourselves to the liquor, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Jim. And Miss Cobbett, my best wishes to you, ma'am. Thank you, Marshal Dillon. Now, you make Jim bring you to town and see us once in a while. <laughs> he never came in much when he was alone out there. Oh, I'm sure he will, Marshal. I, I sure hope so, ma'am. Help yourself to the jug there, Chester. Well, well, thank you, Jim. If I can get it away from Cy long enough, I will. <laughs> uh, you stay in here tonight, Jim? Well, no, Marshal. I brought the wagon on account of Lila here, and it's a slow way of travel. It'll take a day and a half at best. Uh, but... Where will we sleep tonight, Jim? Oh, I've got some blankets, Lila. We'll be fine. You mean out on the prairie? Well, sure. We'll bed down in the wagon if you're afraid of snakes. Oh, snakes can't get to you if you're in the wagon, ma'am. But, but 
What about everything else? Indians? Are... No Indians have been seen around here for months. I don't oh, know. Oh, no, you're wrong, Jim. A man from Walnut Creek told me he run into some Pawnees a couple weeks ago. Only about a dozen, though. Pawnees? Well, they didn't bother him, did they, Si? No, no, they didn't, Marshal. Yeah. You see, Lila? Well, they didn't bother him because he saw him first. He hid himself under a bank in the creek. Uh, are there... Many Indians around? Oh, no, very few. Well, the Army's been after him pretty steady ever since them crows raided the Gillette place. The engine's been making themselves scarce the last few months. What happened at the Gillette place? They had a little trouble, that's all, Lila. Little trouble to kill Bob and rode off of Mrs. Gillette and the child, that's all. Oh, no. Uh, Si, why don't you go get yourself another drink, huh? Mm, yeah, well, I was just thinking about doing that. Well, no, I suppose it'll be easier than Mrs. Gillette once she learns to talk crow. But still, it's a hard life on a white woman suddenly being made a squall. Oh. The uh, oh, jug's well. almost empty, Si. Yes. You better hurry, huh? By golly, dear. Hey, fellas, I got another swatter coming up. Liquor's out. working on Si, now. They don't pay no money. Jim, is it true what he said about that poor woman? Now, Lila, don't you fret about that. Is it true? I want to know, Jim. Yes. Uh, Jim, if you stayed in Dodge City tonight, well, you could start out before dawn tomorrow. Oh, maybe it'd... no, Marshal. Jim thinks it's best we leave tonight. There's nothing to fear, Lila, but if you'd rather stay, we can... No, we'll go, Jim. If you'll excuse me, I'll go change into something more suitable. Goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye, ma'am. We'll see you in Dodge City real soon, I hope. Of course. I'll be down shortly, Jim. Maybe it was best that way for Lila to face out her first night on the prairie not far from Dodge. Nothing would bother him at close to town and it would make it easier for her on the next night. And they left. And that's all we heard about him for oh, a month or so. Dodge City was fairly quiet except for one week when a Texas herd arrived. Two boys were killed the next night and another a few days after. But then things cooled off and became peaceable again. Hank Lewis is in town, Mr. Dillon. Oh, no, Chester. Well, there ought to be a law against it, that's all. He said he was coming here to see you in a few minutes. <clears throat> Look, you talk to him, Chester. I think I'll go upstairs and pick on the dock for a while. Oh, oh, he doesn't want to see me, Mr. Dillon. I, I'll send him up when he comes. Uh, Chester, no. Yes, sir, but he'll ask me where you are, sir, and then what am I going to tell Marshall, him? Marshal, if... I want to talk to you. Well, all right, Hank. Go ahead, talk. You think I was lying about Jim Cobbett, don't you? Well, listen to this, Marshal. Lila's disappeared, too. What? I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, I saw she isn't there. What are you talking about, Hank? I'm telling you, Marshal, Lila's gone, just like Jim's first wife up on Hackberry Creek. She's plain disappeared. Well, go on. Well, I got a runny bay mare that's always running off, and I rode by Jim's place to see if he'd seen her. Jim was just sitting there, and he'd hardly pay me any mind at all. He was all alone, and when I asked him about Lila, he, he just walked off, wouldn't say a word. Well, maybe she was just out on the prairie somewhere. Then she stayed a long time. I was back next day and still didn't see her. Stock's gone, too. When was this, Hank? About a week ago. Now, Marshal, I think you ought to get I out... I do my own thinking, Hank. Well, all right. But you better get out there, Marshal. I've told you now. Yeah, you've and... told me, and you can forget it. Just stay away from the Cobbett place, you understand? All right, Marshal. I've done my duty. You better do yours. Goodbye, Hank. Well, I... Goodbye. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? The only thing we can do, Chester. Go settle our horses, will you? I got some things to clean up around here. Yes, Mr. Dillon. doings at all Plymouth dealers. Tomorrow, go in and meet the new Plymouth, the new kind of low-priced car. And enter the big $25,000 Meet the New Plymouth contest. All you do is look her over, compare, ask questions. 
There'll be people on hand to explain the new body design, new type suspension, new springing, how they combine to give you a ride that's unbelievably smooth. The first truly balanced ride in the low-priced field. Believe me, you'll be enthusiastic. So just transfer that enthusiasm in 50 words or less to a contest entry blank. Tell what you like most about the new truly balanced Plymouth for 53. That's all there is to it. And you may win a 53 Plymouth or one of hundreds of cash prizes. But entries must be mailed by Monday midnight. So hurry, get an official entry blank containing all the easy rules tomorrow when you go in to meet the new 53 Plymouth. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Sure looks quiet around here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, come on, they're probably inside. You think Lyle is here, don't you, sir? I will soon find out, Chester. Hello, Jim. Hello, Marshal. Chester? Hello, Jim. Come in. Have you been, Jim? Hank Lou's told you, didn't he, Marshal? Where is she, Jim? Hank Lou said I killed her, didn't he, Marshal? Oh, now, Jim, you know I don't pay any attention to what Hank Lou says. Then why'd you come here, Marshal? To help you. If you're in trouble. Lila isn't here. And I'm in trouble, all right. Well, what happened, Jim? Where is she? I don't know. What? Well, Injuns, party of crows, they took her. They, they, they took her. Injuns? My goodness. You mean you were raided here? Maybe ten days ago, a war party, about twelve crows. Well, what happened? Well, Lila was out there by the spring. It was just getting dark, and I was sitting on the floor right there. Men in the saddle I'd torn the stirrup off of when I heard her come running up the path out back. All in the sweat and yelling. Hello, what is it? Oh, I saw something out there. Oh, Jim. Jim, I think it was an Indian. Come inside. Get on, get on the floor in the corner there. How many? How many did you see? Oh, just him. I saw his skin behind that little rise. Oh, Jim, don't let him get Easy me. Easy now, Lila. Oh, oh. I don't see a thing out of this window. Take a look over here. Nothing. I must have heard you yell. Oh, Jim, what'll we do? Stand them off, that's all. Wait a minute, there's one. Oh, no. Getting hard to see. Jim, the other side. They'll sneak up on the other side. Might be one behind that log out there. Oh, no. We'll just wait. Oh, they get bolder oh. in the dark. I can pick them off easy. Oh, Jim. Jim, they'll carry me off like they did that other woman. I can't stand it, Jim. Here. <laughs> take that six year old. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. He won't take you while I'm alive. Oh. I promise you that, Lila. <laughs> wait a minute. They're down at the corral. Oh, no. They're after oh. our horses. Oh. That'll show them. Here he goes. There was one behind that log. Oh, Jim, I can't stand it. They're sneaking up on us. Now we'll just wait. Let them get in the open. Wait till a little more. Then when they jump and run on us, I... Oh. Go on, Jim. What happened then? Yeah. What did they do when they rushed you? Well, one of them must have got in the window behind me. When Lila screamed, I was knocked out. And when I come to, the engine was gone. Lila was gone, too. 
Were you shot, Jim, or what? No. Engine must have got behind me somehow and clubbed me, that's all. Did you try to follow him? How could I, Marshal? They run off the horses, stole them. Yeah, I see. Anyway, I was out a long time. There wasn't a sign of anybody when I come to. Well, they could be in the Rocky Mountains by now. We'd never find them. Uh... I'll report this to Colonel Jenkins of Fort Dodge, and he can spread the word through the Army Post. Thanks, Marshal. I, I'm i sorry, Jim. But I guess that's all I can do for you. Sure, Marshal. Uh, come on, Chester. Let's uh, take a look around outside and then get back to Dodge City. Yes, sir. So long, Jim. I sure I am sorry it happened. So long. Jim's pretty broke up, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. That's terrible. And her a squaw now. Yeah. yeah. My, aren't those pretty, Mr. Dillon? What? Hey, that bunch of columbine there, growing right in a row. <laughs> I think I'll just put one in my hat. No, uh, wait a minute, Chester. Huh? I, uh, I, I wouldn't pick them, Chester. They're, they're too pretty to pick, huh? Well, all right, sir. Jim's stock is gone, all right. Mm-hmm. You know, Mr. Dillon, Jim Cobbett ain't the luckiest man in the world, is he? No, he sure isn't, Chester. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> It was the day after we got back to Dodge City that the trouble started, as I expected it would. Chester spread the story about the Indians kidnapping Lila Cobbett, and it wasn't long before some of the men began to question it. And a group of them, headed, of course, by Hank Luz, came to see me. Marshal, we want to know when you're going to arrest him. Hank, it'd be better if you'd let somebody else do the talking. Your record against Jim Cobbett's pretty strong. Marshal's right, Hank. You always did talk too much anyway. I want justice done, that's all, and I mean to get it. Oh, oh shut up, uh, Hank. Hey. Marshal Hank sort of talked us into thinking you don't need to do anything about Jim Cobbett. Is that true? Well, what's your idea, Merrick? Well, go out there and arrest him and find Lila's body if you can. You think Jim murdered her, is that it? Looks that way. You sure don't believe his story, do you, Marshal? No. Not all of it. Jim did her in just like his first wife. That's what. It's a sure thing, Marshal. No engines would have stolen the woman and left Jim lying there without scalping him. Engines just being made that way. Merritt, I don't know what happened out there, but I'm going to find out. Then what are you waiting for, Marshal? The doc. The doc? What's he got to do with this? Well, Miss Prillick, you had a baby this morning. The doc was up all night and he's sleeping today. We're going to ride out to Jim's tomorrow. Well, I don't know what you need the doc for, but we'll wait and ride out with you. You won't ride anywhere, Hank. When I need a posse, I'll ask for it. And I don't want a single man of you anywhere near the Cobbett place. Is that clear? Well, all, right, all right, now get out of here. I got work to do. Mighty lonely looking place, Matt. Uh, yeah, it is. I wonder what Lila Cobbett thought when she first saw it. She must have been mighty fond of Jim to come here at all, seems to me. Yeah. Well, I hope Jim's still there. Uh, isn't that him there? Uh, down by the corral there, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got a new horse. Oh, oh. Hello, Jim. What are you doing here, Doc? I had to bring the Doc, Jim. To perform a sort of autopsy. Autopsy? On Miss Cobbett. It's necessary, Jim, or I wouldn't do it. Marshal? Now, don't do it, Jim. You wouldn't have a chance. No. Take his gun, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Jim, let's you and me go on into the house, huh? I don't imagine you want to watch this. Well, uh, well, where is it, man? You want to tell him, Jim? Over there, under that row of columbines. 
Well, I'll... So, that's why you wouldn't let me pick any, Mr. Dillon. I watered the ground a lot to make it hard. It was a good job, Jim. Come on, let's go in the house. Shovel's out back of the corral. I'll get it. Well, all that water and it didn't do any good. In the house, Jim sat with his back to the wall, his hands clasped tightly across his knees. He was so gaunt and leathery that I wondered if he'd bothered to eat anything at all since this had happened. He just sat there as if waiting to be sentenced and not caring very much one way or the other. Finally, Doc and Chester were finished and they came into the house. We put her back, Jim. Right where you had her. Yeah. And it wasn't easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. But what did you find? Well, she was killed by a forty-five, Fired at close range. Bullet entered her head just under... Never her. mind, Doc. Jim's gun here is a forty-five, Mr. Dillon. You want to tell us about it, Jim? You think I killed her, Marshal? Well, it looks that way, Jim. But I still can't believe it. Thank you, Marshal. If you did it, Jim, you're going to hang for it. The crows didn't attack the house, Marshal. They never aimed to. They just dodged around out there, some of them, to cover for the ones that ran the stock off. They didn't want to fight, just to stock. Yeah, it's happened before. Lila screamed and screamed. I guess she went kind of crazy. Then I heard a shot. First I thought she was shooting at the engines. But then I saw her on the floor there. I didn't care after that. They could have come right in there. They could have done anything they wanted. I didn't care. You, uh... You had given her your six-gun, is that it? Yes. The crows didn't bother you after that? They just took the horses and left? I didn't care about them. I buried Lila out there right away. And I sat there on the ground all night. Everything had been all right, Marshal, but when Hank Luz came by, I got scared. I didn't want to talk to him, but I knew what he'd say. So, I put water on the grave and tried to hide it, except for the flowers I'd planted. I just couldn't not have planted flowers there. He's telling the truth, Matt. Yeah, Jim isn't lying. No, no, sir, he certainly isn't. Are there? There's no reason I know of why Jim should stand trial. What about Hank Lewis, Mr. Dillon? He'll make trouble. Well, the three of us here have heard the story and seen the evidence. Hank's talk doesn't mean a thing. I, I have no cause to arrest Jim. Then I can go, Marshal. Go? Go where? I don't want to live here anymore. It's like the other place up north after my first wife rode off. She just said goodbye and rode off one day. I was ashamed of that, so I never told nobody what happened. And I left the place. Like I'm leaving this one. Well, you got to settle down sometime, Jim. No, no, I don't. I got bad luck both places. I won't settle down no more. We won't stop you, Jim. I don't think I'll go now, Marshal. I don't want to spend another night here. I'll get my things together. Yeah. Uh, we'll wait outside. Come on, Chester. Doc. A half hour later, Jim was packed and ready to go. Silently, he shook hands with each one of us and then mounted and rode off. Yeah, the prairie had dealt hard with Jim Covet, but the man was too tough and dry not to survive somehow. He wouldn't try again to be happy, but he'd live. He'd make his way. 
We watched him disappear while the sun went and the land cooled and became still and quiet. Big Plymouth Contest closes Monday midnight. Your last chance to win a new 53 Plymouth free or a big cash prize. Go to your nearby Plymouth dealers tomorrow. Meet the new Plymouth. Look it over stem to stern. Ask questions. Find out all about this new kind of low-priced car. Then, on an official entry blank in 50 words or less, tell what you like most about this great new beauty. But remember, entries must be mailed by Monday midnight, so be sure to visit your Plymouth dealers tomorrow to pick up your contest entry blank and meet the new 53 Plymouth. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre and Jeanette Nolan, with Paul Dubov, Jack Crucian, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke was brought to you by Plymouth, along with a reminder that you visit your Plymouth dealer tomorrow and enter the Meet the New Plymouth contest. Remember, entries must be mailed before Monday midnight. Clancy Cassell speaking. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. This morning, Mr. Bumby. Huh? Oh, hello, Marshal. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Dillon. Morning, Sam. Is uh, Kitty around? Oh, don't know she's up yet, but if she is, she ought to be down soon. <laughs> oh, I'll wait. Nippy this morning. Oh, feels good. It's a nice time of year, huh? Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like spring myself. Uh, Sam. You better wash that glass over. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, can I get you something? Beer, maybe? Uh, got any coffee? Sure. Just made a bottle. Oh, that'll be fine. Her face is something wondrous. That's pretty, man. <laughs> you got a pretty voice. Oh, it is. Good enough for calling the hogs, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you just got up? A uh, while well, ago. Why? Oh, it, it just strikes me I haven't seen you close too early like this. Uh-huh. No, no, I, I, you look fine. I, I, uh, I, mean, I mean that you... You better quit by your head. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's... Where's Sam? Oh, he's bringing in coffee. Oh, Sam, cup for me, please. Sure, Miss Kitty. What's the occasion, Matt? Uh... Kitty, uh, there's a party tomorrow night, a dance. It's a benefit for the new school down at the hall, you know. <laughs> and uh, ever fellas to bring a girl, y you know? <laughs> it happens at dances. Go on. Well, uh, what I'm trying to... Will you go uh, with me? I'd kind of like to, Matt, but 
No, thanks. Oh. Well, I gotta work here. You know that. Besides... Well, you I... ought to be able to get off. Well, even if I could, ladies might not take kindly to it, Matt. I... Not rightly polite society. Ah, what do you care about? What? The... Well, thanks anyway, Matt. Ah, that smells wonderful. Sammy, I think I'll marry you. <laughs> Me? <laughs> shucks. Me? Oh, shucks. <laughs> uh, listen, Kitty, about the dance, I, I've already bought the you're, you're sweet, Matt, and I, I thank you kindly for thinking of me, but you better ask someone else. Well, it, it isn't... Ki Sam, will, will you go and polish up your glasses, please? Hmm? Oh, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. Mm -hmm. Now, look, Kitty, I'm asking you to go with me. It, well, it's important to me that you go. Are you making love to me, Matt? At this hour in the morning? No, no I, I mean it. I I want you to go to the dance. You want to be embarrassed. You want everyone to stare at us. You know what they'll say? My, my, the marshal really should have better sense than to bring that woman here. It ain't decent. It ain't proper. <laughs> oh, Kitty. Well, it's true. <laughs> I'm a hostess at the Texas Trail, a, a saloon. You know what they think about me. Well, I... Will you go, Kitty? No. I'll call by for you at seven, huh? I'll drink a bottle of whiskey and clout some old biddy on the head. Then you'll be sorry. Oh, Kitty. I haven't got anything to wear, Matt. I can't wear my working clothes. You look just fine like you are, Kitty. Just fine, just like you are. Marshal. Yeah. I shouldn't, but I guess I'll go to the dance with you. <laughs> I'll be ready at seven. How do you talk about a woman like Kitty? The color of her hair, eyes, the shape of her leg, the way she spoke, thought. Well, that's a picture you had to get by looking and hearing. Otherwise, you, you'd never know it. And I felt real good about taking Kitty to the party. The first time we'd really be out in company. And I liked the idea. Oh. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Good morning, Chester. Nice day. What is that? That? Mr. Dillon? Yeah, all over my desk, that. Ink. Yes, sir, I know. I was just cleaning it up, Mr. Dillon. Seems like a big blue bottle fly, last of his kind this fall, I guess. Big fool blue bottle fly was a setting on your desk, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you're slopping it all over the floor, Chester. Yes, sir, I see it. That lazy fool blue bottle fly was a stomping all over your desk, Mr. Dillon, and I took a whack at him with a paper I happened to have in my hand, and I got him. Well, thanks a lot. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. If there's anything in this world I hate, it's a big maggoty blue bottle yeah, fly. Yeah, 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 I know, Chester. Uh, the mail come in yet? Yes, sir. A couple of minutes ago. It's right over there. Oh, okay. There. I think that should do it, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Anything... Likely in the mail, Mr. Dillon? No, no. Uh, look, Chester, uh, we better get these government circulars posted. To... Would you do that for me? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? About the dance tomorrow. Now, what about it? Well, you're going, aren't you, sir? Doc's going. He's <laughs> taking Ms. McNish. I I'm going. Everybody's going. You are going, aren't you, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I'm going. Don't seem right, a man. You're standing not to go to a big social like we're... You are? Yes. Well, that's fine. Just fine. Uh, Doc and, and me, we were talking, and it just didn't seem right to us that a man like you didn't have no real nice sweet girl to escort to a big social. I got one, Chester. A real nice sweet girl. I'm taking Kitty. Miss Kitty? I asked her before I came down, and she accepted. Well, that's good. Miss Kitty. Uh, that's right, Chester. Uh, 
I uh, got, I got a couple of letters off to Washington, Chester. You, you want to go and see about posting those circulars, huh? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Ah, fine. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Oh, what is it, Chester? Well, Mr. Dillon, it... It ain't none of my business, and I, I did not have no right to say it. Say what? Well, sir, I... I... Yeah? I was wondering if I might borrow one of them fancy ties off you for the party. That's not your business. That's what you haven't got any right to say. Yes, sir. No, that's right. You're a liar, Chester. But you can borrow a tie. I thank you kindly, Mr. Dillon. You work for a long time with a man, and you share a lot of life and a lot of death. And after a while, you you know him even better than yourself. Well, that's the way it is with Chester and with me. Now, he had something on his mind, and I... Figured after a while he'd get it off. Well, the morning went, and it was almost noon when Chester came back. Gonna go have some dinner, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I think I will. How about you? Hungry as a raggle-bone possum. <laughs> Did you get the posters up? Yes, sir. Well, okay, let's go. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah? I guess there's something you ought to know, sir. There's talk. Yeah. All right, Chester, come on, get it out. It's all over town. About you taking Miss Kitty to the dance tomorrow night. What do you mean, all over town? I only asked her this morning. Yes, sir, I know. Best I can figure, Sam over at the Texas Trail must have heard you and let it slip. There's been a mighty fierce mess of gum clobbering up and down all over. All right. Uh, thanks for telling me, Chester. It ain't none of my business. Yeah, I know. You said that before. Yes, sir. I surely did. Well, let's go get something to eat. It's hard to tell about people. Maybe it's hard to tell about yourself because you come under that same heading, people. And when they're mean and small, there's not an animal to touch them. Chester and I walked down the street, and it didn't take long to hear and see what was going on. Some of the drifters leaning against the wall on the corner came right out with it. Morning, Marshal. I understand there's a gal in town has got herself a new boat. What did you say? <laughs> Maybe you ought to look into it, Marshal. Folks are being downright rude. Mister, you're going to... Come on, Chester. <laughs> Ought to haul him in. Every one. Yeah. What are you going to charge him with? Pestilence, Mr. Dillon. Just plain pestilence. I knew better what Kitty had meant about the ladies of the town when a couple came out of Olivet's dry goods store. It didn't see me until it was I'm too late. I'm complaining to the dance committee. It's indecent, that's what it is, why she's common. Nothing but a common saloon woman. What's this city coming to when a United States marshal... Ooh. Morning, Miss Sprinkle. Uh. <laughs> when a man's born... They... They say he's blessed or cursed with a lot of things already in him. Take pride, for instance. Sometimes pride can be a curse. Well, maybe I had more in my share. Maybe it would have been a sight kinder if I'd not taken Kitty the dance. But I did.
return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this hint for weekend driving. Whatever you do, be moderate. Be obedient to all traffic laws. Be careful. Use your head and don't take chances. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. I picked up Kitty at the Texas Trail at 7 the next evening. She was waiting by the side door, and when I saw her, she kind of moved back in the shadows, almost as though she was ashamed for me to see her. Hi. Hello, Matt. Are you all set? Well, I guess so. Uh, Matt, are you sure? Hey, you... Kitty, you look fine. Hey, you look just fine. <laughs> Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. We walked along the street down to the hall, and I, I kept looking at her like, like I say, you know, you, you, you had to know this, Kitty, to understand what I mean, and <laughs> even then you get a surprise. She was like a 17-year-old on her first date, and she was like all the women you'd ever known and loved, soft and innocent. And something else, something that's female, and you can't figure out what. Something that makes you drunk without a drink inside you. It was snowing a little, and the flakes caught in her hair and melted into the black of her velvet cloak. And just before we went in, I looked at her again. And I didn't care. I, I was proud she was with me. Oh, evening, Marshal Dillon. Evening, Miss Murphy. Uh, you know Miss Russell? I do. You have your tickets, Marshal Dillon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, here we are. Fine. Uh, go right in, won't you? Oh, sure. Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Murphy. Is there somewhere I can put my cloak? Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, the ladies' reception room is right through there. I, I didn't catch the name. Catherine Russell, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll wait for you. Thanks. You better... I could see them through the big open doors in the hall. They were all there. Faces flushed, smiling, happy, dancing. And all the women seemed pretty and the men handsome. And Chester was up on the platform calling the dance and Doc was fiddling. And I was waiting for my dancing partner, Miss Kitty Russell. What took you so long? I'm sorry, Matt. I had a skirmish with one of the genteel females in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Why so she? You know, I get the idea I'm not welcome around here. Uh, uh, let's go in and get some punch, huh? Sure. How are you, John? Oh, that's a nice dress, Kitty. Well, I haven't worn it since a few years back in New Orleans. Hey, Marshal. Oh, Miss Kitty. Oh, it's Doc. Well, hi. Oh, fine, Doc. Hello, Doc. <laughs> I say, <clears throat> say, we got a bottle of whiskey outside. You care to join it? <laughs> oh, this punch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not right now. Thank you, Doc. Oh, well, sure. Hey, Miss Kitty. I saw you come in. Best looking woman in here. <laughs> oh, there's lots of scratching going on. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. If you see Mrs. Magnish, don't tell her where I am, will you? Man gets kind of dry, fiddling. Oh, I've been so long. So long, Doc. Punch, Marshal Dillon? Uh, Kitty? I guess so. Uh, Mr. Sprinkle, have you met Miss Catherine Russell? Uh, no, no, I'm afraid I haven't. 
You got a short memory, Mr. Sprinkle. Huh? I could have swore it was you in the Texas Trail a couple of weeks back. Drunk or no hoot owl. Don't you remember I had to slap your face? I, I think... Edward? Well, I, it, Edward? Yes, dear. You let somebody else take care of the punch. I want you to come with oh, me. Oh, well, no, I, mean, I, I, I promised. I, I'm, I'm on the committee. Yeah. Even, Miss Sprinkle. I have no wish to speak to you, Marshal Dillon, or this woman you brought with you. I will not have my husband serving such people. Aren't you being a trifle bad-mannered, Miss Sprinkle? How dare you say that? Well, aren't you? I suggest that you leave, Marshal. Emmy. You're not wanted here. Not with that woman you've seen fit to bring. Come on, Matt. I want to go. No. This is a public dance, Miss Sprinkle. Right now, you're trying to make it private. If you can't behave like a lady, I'll thank you to leave this lady's presence. What? Now, see here, Marshal. You can't talk like that to my wife. Hey, Kitty! What do you say, Kitty? Hmm. Matt, please. I want to go. We're not going anywhere. We're staying. Uh, uh, how about some music? All right, all right now, folks. It'll be a wall this time. Thanks for the punch, Mr. Sprinkle. Come on, Kitty. I warned you, Matt. Now... Please, will you take me out of here before something happens? Nothing's going to happen, Kitty. You and me are going to dance. Have a good time. That's all. You're acting like a kid. Matt, it won't work. I've seen this kind of thing before. May I have this dance, Miss Kitty? Please, Matt. You're being pig-headed and you know it. Let's get out. You refusing me, Miss Kitty? Oh, Matt. We danced, but it wasn't what I hoped it'd be. Kitty closed her eyes. I guess she was trying to blot it out, but I could see the other couples looking, whispering, and one by one dropping away over into a small group that got larger. And there were only about six of us left when the wall ended. And that's when the stranger and a couple of his pals walked out onto the floor. They were drifters, probably been in town for a week. And they were having their fun before they moved on. Marshal, I got a painful duty. Yeah? The folks in this town seem real upset about you bringing that mm, woman in here. What's your name? I'm just a fella. I kind of made myself and my friends here a committee of three, seeing as how everything's done by committees here, and we, <laughs> yeah, we figured it would be best if you take your um, friend home. Mister, I'm the marshal in Dodge Matt, City, and I... I'm leaving. You're staying here, Kitty. She's smarter than you, Marshal. Everything all right? Everything's Mr. fine, Chester. Now, this ain't a matter of law, you know, Marshal. It's decency and, and, and what's right. So. Yeah, and Marshal, this ain't right. Mister... I'm taking this badge off. Chester, you stay here with Kitty. Matt, don't you do it. Now, come Matt. on outside. You. We're going to talk some more about this out there. Ah, oh, it's cold outside. Now, you be a good fella and get out of where you ain't wanted. You know I won't hit you in here, don't you? Were you thinking of doing that, Marshal? Now, that ain't lawful. I ain't done nothing. Kitty. Kitty, wait. Now, now, there's a gal with sense. All right, man. mister. Now, I'm telling you, you and your pals are going to have to come out sooner or later, and when you do, you better start hightailing it out of Dodge before I catch up with you. We'll think of that. Oh, sure. We sure will. <laughs> Marshal. <laughs> Just three no-good drifters hating the law, finding pleasure in trouble. Kitty had gone, and I went out into the street. It had stopped snowing. Just cold. Much colder. I went up to the Texas Trail. There was only two people in there. 
Some guy dead drunk on a table and someone else standing at the bar looking into the mirror at me. Well, you haven't, Mr. Dillon. Nothing, sir. Yeah. Well, I, I, I got some things to do in the back. You, you give me a call if anyone comes in, will you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, kid. Shut up. I, I'm sorry. I'm... Bad, bad. Oh, Kitty. Oh, it's all right. Sure, it's all right. That's so mad. I, I could... Yeah, I know. I, know. I should have known better. No, it, it was me, not you. No, it wasn't that either. It was all those polite ladies and gentlemen. Give me a kerchief, will you? Yeah, here. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time since I cried. Yeah, sure. It wasn't so much for me, for you. I, want, I wanted to cry right there in the hall, watching you and knowing there was nothing you could do. Nice mess of people we got in Dodge. No, it's not them, man. It's me. I've run into this before. The only difference was I didn't have you around. I wanted it to be right tonight because of you. A lot of narrow-minded prayer spouting. Yeah. They hurt your pride, didn't they? No. No, it, it wasn't that. No? No, I, I wanted you to go with me. That made me real happy. But maybe we're different, Matt. You and me figure life different to them. That's not their fault. There's a lot of folks there I know. I I smile at them on the street. They talk to me. But tonight, well, that was different. I made them uncomfortable. Yeah? Well, they didn't do a bad job with you. Oh, you can't look at it that way. And you can't go fighting the whole town either. There's three fellas going to get hurt. No, I don't want you to do, the, do that, Matt. You just... Let it go. Let it go, Matt. They don't mean nothing. You know what means something to me? What? That you asked me to go to the dance with you. I knew what was going to happen, but it was worth the chance. I thank you for it, Matt. You're a funny one. Am I? <laughs> but you sure showed them up, those women. <laughs> the way you look. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> you know, you look pretty fine yourself. Sam? Yeah? Uh, you got any champagne, Sam? What? Have I got any what? Champagne. Well, yeah. I guess maybe. A bottle or two? Yeah, maybe. Sure. Well, break it out. All right. Miss Kitty, I think the next dance is mine. Oh, Matt. I'd be real pleased, Mr. Dillon. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vivi Janis, Bob Sweeney, Lawrence Dobkin, and Mary Lansing. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis 
is Kitty. Gun smoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gun Smoke. <laughs> Don't miss Robert Trout and his timely roundup of world news tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Everything was all right until about a mile north of the Cimarron... That's when my horse got a hoof caught in a frozen dog hole and broke his leg. So I had to shoot him. It made me feel awful bad. I didn't feel any better thinking about the walk ahead of me. Close to 40 miles to dodge and carry in my saddle all the way. Guess I'd been on the trail about an hour, near as I could figure it was around three in the afternoon. And I'd ease the saddle off my shoulders for a rest and a smoke. And that's when I saw the stranger riding up from the way I'd come. He was tall and thin. And his horse was taller and even thinner. And they made quite a pair. Hi. How are you? You lost? No. My horse busted his leg away back. I'm on my way to Dodge. Oh, it's your horse, huh? I saw it. Yeah. On your way to Dodge, huh? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you got any more of that tobacco? Yeah, sure. Uh, Here you are. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. That's okay. Kind of a big walk you've got ahead, ain't it? <laughs> kind of. It's going to be dark soon. You figure making camp? Uh, that's the idea. Well, it's too bad. Yeah. Do you need any food? No, 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 thanks. I, I got enough. Uh-huh. Well, I thank you for the tobacco. Sure. Anytime. Hey. Yeah? Not saying this beast won't drop dead from the shock, but do you want to climb on behind? Save you a piece of boot leather for a while, anyway. <laughs> Why? Well, I... I'd be much obliged if you think that animal of yours can carry us. Well, she won't mind. It should have been dead a long time ago, except she don't know it. She don't mind. Well, okay, thanks. Uh, here, will you hold my saddle till I get up, huh? Yeah, give it to you. Yeah. 
Ah. Can you manage this saddle? Yeah, I give it. Yeah, I got it. Now let's go. You heading for Dodge too? Not in particular. Just north. Uh huh. This beast will do about ten knots with the wind behind her, but we ain't going to get more than five with this load. You ain't in no hurry, I am. Well, I, I was kind of hoping to get back tonight. It's a Christmas Eve, you know. Oh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. That backbone of hers sticking into you? Oh, no, it's okay. Thanks. Notice that tin doodjigger tied to you. You with the law? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Marshal. Uh, my name's Matt Dillon. That's so. I've never seen a marshal on foot. <laughs> well, it happens sometimes. How is it you're down this way? And it to mite off your course? Mm hmm? So you marshal down here as well as Dodge? No, no, I, I just took a prisoner across the Cimarron into Oklahoma Territory. Turned him over to the Army there. Did, huh? then he shot up tight. We must have ridden a couple of miles without a word. I got to thinking about Dodge and Chester and Doc and Kitty and the rest of them. You know, there's something pretty special about any place at Christmas time. <laughs> the backbone on the stranger's nag was just about to split me in two when he talked up. My name is... Cowley. Oh? Amos Cowley. Uh, better heave to a spell. She's breathing mighty hard. All right, hold up. Yes. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, getting a little chilly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could I trouble you for another smoke? Oh, sure, sure. Here you are. I right, thank you. Say, hmm? what's it like in Dodge? What? Dodge. Well, what's it like? <laughs> oh, it's like any other town, I guess. <laughs> Pretty big, huh? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. Not so big as New York, though. Oh, oh no, 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 not as big as that. You know, I haven't been in a big town now for more than ten years. Oh, is that so? No. Been down the territories... Drifting. Thought I'd move up north this time. Maybe go back east. Now you're from the east, huh? Some time back. Say, what's it like? What? Well, Dodge, any town. Uh, at Christmas. Same as it used to be? <laughs> well, I guess so. Uh, what do you do? Well, it's the same as most people, I guess. What most people do at Christmas. Well, that ain't saying a lot. What are the folks like? And what does it look like? I, I just... I just kind of like to know. Well, I I don't know. Uh, well, there's Front Street. Uh, that's most of Dodge right now. Of course, it's getting bigger all the time. Do you time. have any kids? No, no, I, I'm not married. Yeah. Kids have fun at Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, they do. That, that's certain. And Dodge, they sometimes have a party for the kids. A couple of days before Christmas. Uh, kids like that. And then everybody gets feeling good, looking forward to Christmas Eve. Like last year. There was snow on the ground. But the sky was clear. You, you could even see the stars. I was going down the street to the Texas Trail to meet Doc and Chester. Uh, Chester, he's my deputy. Doc's a doctor in town. We had some work to do later on in the evening. You could uh, see the light shining behind the curtained windows. and Almost everybody had a sprig of holly berries hanging up. They got some from the east a couple of days earlier. I remember running into John Bumby. He's a kind of general handyman in Dodge. Never says much, but... <laughs> he sure had a lot to say that night. Oh, hello, Marshal. Oh, hi, John. <clears throat> a lovely night for a Christmas Eve, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is, John. Yeah? Pretty fine night. 
peace on earth, goodwill to men, <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah, that's the way it should be, John. Um, you know, Marshal, this is going to be quite a night for me. Yes, sir. Oh, is that oh, so? Oh, yes, sir. Tonight, I'm asking Mrs. McNish to become Mrs. Bumby. What? Mm-hmm. Why, John, I didn't know that. Oh, I know. It's been a mighty fast secret, but I, I'm popping the question tonight. Well, oh. I wish you a lot of luck, John. Hey, I'll I tell you what. Come by to the Texas Trail later, and, and we'll have a drink on it. Oh, I will. I really will, Marshal. <laughs> You're good and kind, Marshal. Good and kind. Merry Christmas, <laughs> Marshal Dillon. Merry Christmas. Well, the same to you, John. That may sound kind of funny to you, but John Bumby's a good man. A little peculiar sometimes, but good as they come. And they don't make enough like him. Of course, most everybody in Dodge suspected Doc and Ms. McNish were sweet on each other. But it just goes to show you. Uh, I'll tell you about John and Ms. McNish a little later. So I went on down the street. You know, it's a funny thing about those words... Merry Christmas. Men say it to each other, and, well, it makes them feel kind of good. I know what you mean. Used to be a seafaring man myself. When you're on the sea and it comes Christmas, things like that can, they can count a lot. Yeah. Well, we might as well get underway again, huh? Sure. All right. You want to take my saddle? Give it here. Okay. Uh. Uh, give it to me. Okay. Come. I guess. I guess you'll miss it in Dodge tonight. I mean, won't you? Well, if you could get a little more out of this nag of yours, we might make it tonight. Oh, no, there's not a chance. She'll be on her beam ends pretty quick. She's been on a long reach since sunup. Ah. Oh. Mighty bare country up this way. All right. Depends on what you're used to, I well, Mighty bare where I've been, too. It's not like the sea. That's always different. How come you left it? I always heard a sailor doesn't ever get it out of his blood. Or the sea? <laughs> I guess you can get it out of your blood, all right. You got the right reason you can. Yeah, I guess so. Hey. You trying to get something out of me? Well, no. Get what? I, I would just remind you. You want to ride with me? I don't want any talk about the sea. Well, you brought it up. <laughs> I get it. Turn for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Jack Benny and his whole fun making gang make a personal appearance at a Long Beach, California veterans' hospital. It's going to be a Christmas they'll never forget, as Benny and the bunch cut loose while they assist the folks at the hospital in trimming their Christmas tree. Be sure to join the fun tomorrow night on CBS Radio when it's Jack Benny time all across America. Now for the second act of Gun Smoke. Amos Cowley sulked his way along the trail for the next while. And then it was almost like he couldn't stand the quiet. Or maybe he had things on his mind. He turned his head. Go on. What? Go on. Tell me some more. Oh, about Dodge? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Well, you try some more. Well, uh... They got a little pine tree in the Texas a Trail. Tree. Yeah, come down a long way from the north. Uh, uh, Kitty Russell, she she's a hostess in the Texas Trail. Well, she she got a lot of ribbon and gewgaws and made it look real nice. Uh, that was last Christmas. A star at the top. A star? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It looked like a star, I guess. It <laughs> sure looked pretty. And there was a 
Well, a, a, a difference in the place that day. Everybody was celebrating and feeling real good. The doors would swing open and somebody had come in and... You know, maybe somebody you just knew to nod at, but because it was Christmas Eve, he'd come right up and say, Hello. Oh, maybe that's a good reason, maybe not. I don't know. All right, I'll tell you. Anyhow, it was still kind of early. Kitty and Chester were standing off looking at the tree. Hi, Matt. Good evening, Mr. Dillon. Hi, Kitty. Chester. How do you like it, Matt? Christmas tree. That's yours. Oh, that's real pretty. <laughs> Only tree but one in the whole town. Yeah, Kate's got one over the Alphaganza. Oh, well, I'll have to see it later. Sure, you're next. Where's Sam? I don't know. Maybe he started celebrating too soon. Oh. Doc's taking over the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. You, you want a drink, sure, Kitty? Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. All right, I'll get you a drink. I'll get you uh, You haven't forgotten anything, have you, Mr. Dillon? Forgotten? Uh, what, Chester? Th- there. What did I tell you, Miss Kitty? I knew just as sure as my nose that you Oh, that. No, no. I, I hadn't forgotten. Oh, well... I thought as soon as they get Sam sober enough to take care of the customers, we could go on over to Doc's like we planned. Sure, we'll do that, Chester. <laughs> Here you are, Matt. Ah, thanks, Doc. Ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still snowing out? No, no, it's not. Uh, wh- where are you going, Kitty? Oh, I just want to look outside. Ah, real pretty. Man thinks of a lot of funny things that don't mean much. Kitty standing at the door, sniffing the cold air, and the warmth inside, and the whiskey in me. It it, it was a good feeling. And then Chester and I decided to take a bottle over to Mr. Hightower. He's the telegraph operator over at the depot. He runs a printing shop on the side. Say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Do you mind if I stop by the church for a minute? Uh, No, I don't mind. I just feel kind of right tonight, Mr. Dillon. Figure out to thank somebody for it. Sure. So we stopped by the church. I've never been much of a man for a church, I guess, but I went along with Chester. There wasn't anybody else there, just the two of us. Guess we sat for ten minutes in that place. Chester a little way off with his head bowed. You know, there's a lot of peace in a church. Maybe, maybe it's the quiet. Maybe, maybe it's the good that people find in there. Whatever it was, it made a man feel glad about pretty much everything. I haven't been in a church since I don't know when. Oh, is that so? I uh, heaved to. Well, she's becalmed again, mister. <laughs> okay. Uh, this. Uh, well, she sure wasn't built for it, I'll tell you. You ever see anything like that? <laughs> yeah, she is kind of old, isn't oh, she? I've had her going on eight years. She hasn't changed a mite. Eats like a pig and looks like a four-legged mizzenmist. <laughs> Smoke? Don't mind. Hey, what about that, uh, that fellow Hightower? Did you get that bottle to him? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I guess it was lonely over in the depot all alone. He, he was glad for the company. There was a wood fire burning in the stove, but it didn't keep out the cold. Well, how are you, gents? Merry Christmas. Well, how's it going, Mr. Hightower? Oh, slow, Marshal, slow. Bit of excitement about an hour back, though. That's so? Yeah, 9.15 got stuck between here and Hutchison. Lots of snow back there. They getting her out? Sure, they're trying, but 
I'm sure glad I'm not on it. It's going to be a cold night on that train. Well, it's kind of chilly in here, isn't it, Mr. Hightower? Any warmer, and I'm going to sleep. It will say we brought you over a bottle of Irish for company. <laughs> Jameson's well. I declare I was just thinking about a tot before you boys come in. Now, that's real <laughs> friendly. Will you have a drink with me? We sure will. Let's open her up, huh? A couple of glasses up on the shelf there, Chester. Get them down, will you? <laughs> I don't know if you get an idea about the folks in Dodge or not. They, they're not any different than any other people. Or the town either. Uh, I guess maybe it's a pretty small place at that. The depot, the hall, a few stores, a church, Doc's office, a Texas trail, Alifaganza, my office. Uh, well, not much, but... Hey, it's where you live, you know? Sounds all right. I lived in a town once back east. Small. I know what you mean. Well, maybe you'll be going back. Maybe. Say, the kids, they still believe in St. Nick? Oh, sure. I, I Mighty suppose. few kids down where I've been. Injun kids, they don't believe in St. Nick. No reason they should, I guess. I used to believe in it, you know that? Well, I guess most people did one time or another. Hey, you figure we come maybe ten miles? Maybe. Yeah, it's getting dark. Yeah. Well, come on. You want to... You want to ride the saddle for a bit? Oh, no, no. I, uh, that's okay. Well, then, okay. We rode on, and I thought about last year, about Kitty... Doc and Chester and me going over to Doc's place after Doc got tired at Tendon Bar at the Texas Trail. It was about a quarter to midnight, and we stood around and sang Christmas carols. And I, I remember how it sounded that night, how it looked. The glow in the stove in the middle of the room, and... Uh, the frosty windows. On a cold winter. Yeah, it was Christmas Eve, all right. It was so deep. Nowhere, 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 nowhere. Born is a king of Israel. <laughs> Say, that was fine. That was just fine. Yes, it was. Oh, gee. <clears throat> say, now, what do you say if hey, we... Hey, hey, Listen. Hey. Huh? Huh? Oh. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, I feel sentimental. That's exactly what I feel. I feel sentimental. I know what you mean, Doc. I surely know. Okay, Doc. Bring him out. <laughs> and I remember how Doc scuttled over to the bureau and yep. brought out some packages. The presents weren't much, but it didn't matter what they were. And when we'd finished opening them, it was Chester who said what we were all thinking. I just... I, I just want to say, Miss Kitty, Doc, you, Mr. Dillon, I, I just want to say that this is the best doggone Christmas I ever had. And, and that's what I want to say. Say... He was going to tell me about that, uh, that fellow John was caught in that woman. What was her name? Oh, oh yeah. Ms. McNish. That's right. Well, she said yes. And she you've did. never seen two happier people in your whole life. Yeah, she's Ms. McNish Bumpy now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, you know, you might settle for a bit and dodge or you could get work there. Sure would be fine if you could 
get back tonight, wouldn't it? Well, it, it can't be helped. I'd be a lot further away and a sight more tired if you hadn't come along. Yeah. Now, listen. How far do you figure before there's a place you might pick up a horse? Oh, I don't know. Fifteen miles or so, maybe. Oh, oh. we're not going to make any fifteen miles in this nag tonight, that's for sure. Oh, that's all right. Now, I tell you what. You go on alone, do you see? Oh, no, forget now, it. Now, you go I... on alone. She'd hold out with one man on her. And then you get a fresh horse and you ride into Dodge tonight. Well, thanks. That's now, very I'm kind. telling you, I want you to go. I'll be fine. I've walked before. Probably make it almost as quick as you. Look, look it's, it's real nice of you, Mr. Cowley, but no thanks. Uh, now, Christmas don't mean nothing to me. you got friends waiting for well, you. Well, I'll see them tomorrow. Ah, uh, you're a fool. Well, that may be. All of them nice folks. I'm going to make them feel pretty bad. Uh, look, I'll stay. If you want to go on along, uh, uh, thanks for the ride. Well, might as well make camp then. <laughs> I guess so. And listen, you want to tell me some more about uh, what you was telling me before we turn in? Well, sure. I but... take it kindly, mister. I'll get yourself settled. I got some stuff in my pack we can eat and maybe get a fire going. Then after we eat, you can tell me some more. We made a fire and then shared what we had for supper. He seemed to soften up after that, and we talked for a couple or three hours. It was like he was starved for news of people, everyday things, and just plain company. And that's how we spent Christmas Eve together out on the plane. And then when the fire was dying down and I was about ready for sleep, he said, Marshal. Yeah? I want to tell you something. I've been needing to tell it for a long time. Do you mind? Well, of course I don't mind. Well, then I'll tell you. A few years ago, I was skipper of a little schooner. I used to sail up and down the East Coast, you know, Boston, New York. Yeah. Well, one night... We hit dirty weather off New Jersey, real dirty. Blew us off course, and we piled up on the rocks and knocked the bottom out. That's too bad. There was 18 passengers aboard, Marshal. Four of them was kids. We never saw them again. No. And my own... My own wife and my kid went down, too. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, now, something must have happened to me after that. I didn't want nothing to do with... With ships or the sea, and I started to drift out this way. I couldn't forget, though, do you know? And I didn't want to be near folks, especially kids, to remind me, do you know? Yeah. Well, that's how come I've been slewing around ever since. Sure, I understand. Just kind of wanted to get it off my chest. Sure. Marshal, I'd like to ride into Dodge with you tomorrow. You think I might meet some of them folks you was telling about? Oh, I, I don't see why not. But that'd be all right. Maybe I wouldn't need to drift no more. Maybe I could... Uh, <laughs> drop anchored, you know. Yeah, you might at that. Yes. Well, good night. Good night. Merry Christmas, Marshal. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cowley. Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin with Harry Bartell and John Daner, Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week 
as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Edgar Bergen's real-life daughter, Candy, pays him and you a visit on The Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. Candy and Charlie hit it off fine, but Edgar has cause to regret his hasty decision to invite his six-year-old daughter into the show, especially when she starts throwing her voice. Sounds like fun tomorrow night on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It was over a hundred miles back to Dodge, but I figured I could make it easy in a day and a half. I'd been in Hayes City as a government witness in a murder trial, and I was anxious to get back. So I rode out of Hayes one morning a couple of hours before light. The ground was clear as snow, but it was midwinter, and it was sharp cold. When the day came, there was no sun, only dark gray sky drilled by a high, cold, searching wind. The air was as thin as I could ever remember it being. And behind me in the north lay a great slab of blackness. When I saw that, I should have turned back, for the wind stood out of the north, too, and sooner or later it would drive that black slab right down on top of me. This was blizzard weather, the kind of weather that kills the land and everything on it. I don't know why I went on, maybe because of the wind. You know, a high wind will distemper a man. Make him drunk-like. Anyway, I didn't turn back. About noon, the sky began to turn white with snow, and I could smell a touch of moisture in the air. And finally it came. The sleet, shrilling in on the wind like small buckshot as the blizzard howled down the prairie. I couldn't look right or left without being stung blind, but as long as I kept the wind on my back, I knew I was headed south. Two hours of this, and I could feel my horse slowing down and weakening under me. My own body stiffened with the cold. Men died when they got caught in a thing like this. They died easy. Another hour passed, and my horse was carrying his head close to the ground. I figured he'd stumble soon, so I kicked my feet out of the stirrups and braced myself against the horn. By now, the wind had really gotten into me. And when I saw the blur of a ranch house up ahead, I thought maybe it was a trick. 
But a few minutes later, we rounded a corner of the place and stood at last in the lee of the storm. I slid down and got up to the door and pounded on it. And I waited. Then I pounded again. Then the door came open and the figure stood in the light. Who are you? Bring him in, L.B. Any man out in that weather's been made harmless. Get inside. Out of the way, L.B., you fool. All right, stranger, hands in the air. High. That's better. Unload him, L.B. Nice gun, Hack. Real nice gun. Shut up. Now, take him down, stranger. You can come up to this stove now, but don't try nothing. I'll cut you in half with buckshot. He was a burly man with flushed cheeks and a wild red beard and a great shock of red hair. Even his hands and fingers bristled with it. He sat on a stool by the stove, a shotgun across his knees. And his eyes never left me. The other one, Alvy, had a body of an underfed boy, but he was completely bald, and his skin was tight and dry. He looked like a naked skull. And his eyes... Well, something had touched Alvy. You look half-froze, stranger. You must have wanted something real bad to go out in weather like this. I never saw him around here before, Hack. He's a stranger, Alfie. He don't belong around here. Of course, we don't know anybody, but I, I, I seen a few, and I never seen him before. Maybe he's seen you, Alfie, somewhere. Not me. He, he never saw me nowhere. How do you know that? Maybe he was just looking for some cows and got lost in the storm. You're just a kid, Alfie. I always said you don't know much. Bell! Bell, get on out here. She was a pretty girl, but with a dark, half-wild look that I'd never seen before in a woman. Her eyes jumped from man to man and then came to rest on me, fixed and curious. And then after a moment, she looked away and moved it into a chair across the room. Supper ready, Belle? It's awful cold out. You recognize him, Belle? You ever see him before? No. Nope. You're sure now? Maybe Hayes City... Maybe you saw him up there sometime. I don't know him. You sure? Yes. If you're lying to me, you know what I'll do to I you. I never saw him before. He come in here half froze, right right out of the blizzard. Must have been looking for some cows and got lost. Shut up, Alby. We don't know what he's doing here, Bell. Why shouldn't a man get out of the storm? Even in here. That's enough. All right, stranger, we never saw you before. We don't know who you are. And as soon as I think you're lying, I'm going to blow a big hole in you. What about my horse? I'd like to put him in the barn if you've got one. Alvy? Oh, now, Hack, I ain't going out there. I'd freeze. And the horse will freeze if you don't. It's his horse. We might need it. Go on, Alvy, before I get cross. All right, I'll go. I know why the horse is so important. Elvie's a good boy. He'll put your horse up. Thank you. Supper's about ready. Leave it. I want to talk to our friend here first. Maybe we won't have to feed him. Potatoes will get mealy. They better not, that's all. I'm right curious about you, mister. I've noticed that. I'll blow your guts all over the wall. You make fun of me. Don't get me mad, mister. I got the shotgun. The meat will be boiled to shreds if we don't eat soon. You just won't understand any other way, will you, Bell? What is it you want to know about me? <laughs> I can tell, mister, I can handle you easy now. What do you mean? All I got to do is wallop the girl and you'll talk. I don't have to do nothing to you. All right, if I take my jacket off, I've warmed up now. I mind. You might have a gun hit out in there. He can raise his hands. I'll unbutton it. Well, now, that's right smart of you, Bell. Oh, 
I'll hide it. No, leave it be. Bell. Come over here, Bell. Drop the jacket, Bell. Now hold out your other hand. Open it, Bell. Open your hand. That's real bad what you did, Bell. Real bad. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you outside for a spell out in the weather. After supper, after you've cleaned up supper, you can be thinking about it till then. United States Marshal. You're in bad company, Marshal. You shouldn't have come here. Oh? It looks to me like I sort of struck gold coming here. Now, why do you talk like that, Marshal? I still got the shot. Let me get that stove. Seems like it's getting colder and colder. You didn't see any sign of nobody outside, did you, Alvy? What? Who? Somebody might have come along to cover the Marshal here, it's all. Marshal? What, what, what Marshal? Me. I'm a Marshal, Alvy. Shoot him, Hack. Shoot him. Shut up and answer me. Was there sign of another horse footprints, anything like that? Oh, I didn't see nothing. Maybe you didn't look. Would I have walked in here the way I did if I'd been after you people? Maybe your head got muddled with the cold. Where'd you ride from, Marshal? Hayes City. Left there this morning. <laughs> it was a fool thing to do with a blizzard coming up. Maybe. Or did you think you could get the jump on us easier in a storm? Was that it, Marshal? Yeah, You knew we'd be trying to keep cozy in here. I'm curious, Hack. What are you and Alvy on the run for? Don't you tell him, Hack. I don't trust him at all. (laughs) Alvy, it'd be mighty dull without you, boy. (laughs) Don't laugh at me, Hack. Now stop it. I don't like laughing. You know that, Hack. And don't you do it no more. I got ways... Yeah, I ain't seen you in your ways. But don't try them on me, Alvy. Maybe I won't. Look, Alvy, now you don't understand. It's all right to tell the marshal about us. He ain't going nowhere. No? No, of course not. We'll kill him, Alvy. We'll kill him and bury him somewhere. Oh, sure. Now, now why didn't I think of that? Because I do the thinking for us, Alvy. That's why. Now, uh, what was it you like to know, Marshal? Stop playing games, Hack. Me and Alvy are wanted for murder. Up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Seems a mite unfair, though. We didn't aim to kill nobody. It just happened that way. We was robbing a bank. Yeah, and a couple of the people there wouldn't do what we told them, so Alvy used his knife on one, but it just made the man holler. You could hear him all over town. And we had to shoot our way out after that. Must have killed three or four people. I know I killed two. Worst of it was, Marshal, all we wanted just then was some money. We didn't care about killing anybody. But you know how it is, Marshal, when you're robbing a bank and all. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) Now, I don't suppose you do it that. Anyway, we're wanted for murder, and we didn't even get any money. Nary a dollar. So we rode out here and lighted for a spell. I see. What about Bell? And whose place is this, anyway? It's my place, now that Pa's gone. You mean you were living here alone? No. They killed your Pa, is that it? Yes. How long ago? I don't know. Maybe a month. Yeah, it's been about a month, hasn't it, Alvy? Thirty-five days. There, you see? Alvy always knows just how long everything's been. No, that's fine. Tell me what you do with him. Who? The old man. Oh, we we buried him out back. (laughs) We couldn't afford a funeral. (laughs) Could we, Alvy? Hack, 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 we told him that. Now let's shoot him. No, no, I've been thinking it over. People in Hayes City know he started for Dodge, and when he don't show up, they might come looking for him. 
But you you said we'd bury him, Hack. That's what you said. Yeah, that's right. But we can't bury his horse, too. Not in this ground. It's froze solid. And if we turn the horse loose and they find it and can't find the marshal's body, then they'll suspect something. You're pretty smart, Hack. Too bad you don't know enough to stop killing people. Too bad for you, anyway. Well, what are we going to do, Hack? I'm getting hungry. That supper won't be fit to eat. Shut you... up! One more word out of you, Bella, and I'll whoop you good. Come on, Hack. I'm really hungry. No, no, li- listen to me, Elvie. Now, my idea is to knock the marshal on the head and throw him outside to freeze. Now, he'll keep real good that way. And when the storm breaks, we can carry him off 20 miles or so and dump him on the ground. Look like he got throwed and hit his head and froze. Oh, that's fine, Hack. That's just fine. Then we'll break his horse's leg, make it easier for them to find him. You just don't care about anything, do you, Hack? Just me. Sometimes, Alvie. Sure. Me and Hack are friends, ain't we, Hack? Of course, if it don't want snowing, we'll have to think of something else. Can't leave tracks for them to follow back there. Oh, Hack, ain't we gonna kill him now? Well, sure, sure we are, Alvie. I didn't mean that. Let me hit him, huh? You keep the gun on him, and I'll get up behind and hit him. There was a Brandon iron around here somewhere. I'll, I'll hit him with that. Hack, you've sunk pretty far, but I'm sort of wondering just how far. What do you mean? I'm wondering if you're low enough to... Kill a man before he's been fed. Here, here it is, Hack. Here, see? I found it. Leave it be, Alvie. We're going to eat first. Turn for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, this Sunday night, Lionel Barrymore is your host and Joseph Cotton the star on Sunday Night Playhouse's gripping historic drama based on the life of Peter Marshall. Hear how a Scottish immigrant lad rose to the position of chaplain of the United States Senate. A story you'll agree is far more fascinating than fiction. Remember, it's tomorrow night when Lionel Barrymore introduces another Sunday Night Playhouse on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. It was only five in the afternoon, but the blizzard had darkened the land and its blackness showed in at the windows. Here and there along the walls of the ranch house, tricklets of snow blew in through the warped timber. In the kitchen, Hank sat directly behind me while I ate. Later changed places with Alvy and fed himself heartily, as though he had nothing at all on his mind. Hank was just a nerveless brute, born with no conscience at all. His intelligence was the instinct of an animal that snapped at or killed whatever got in its way of survival. Every living thing was his enemy. And Alvy? Well, there was no way to figure Alvy. Too much of him was missing. My only chance lay in the girl, Belle. Even though Hack had pretty well beaten all resistance out of her. Supper was over soon enough, but Hack seemed in no particular hurry to get on with his plans. I've eaten better food on the trail than that. Can't blame me for it. Now, get it cleaned up, Belle. You can talk your head off when you're outside alone, and you're going outside. I'll learn you to heal if I have to break your neck. No, don't do that, Hack. Not till we're ready to pull out, anyway. Why? Well, I ain't going to do the cooking. Well, I hope not. I've eaten your cooking. My sister was a good cook. Yeah, we should have brought her along, Alvy. No, mm-hmm. I don't like her. Where are you from, anyway? Which, me or Alvy? Well, you to start with. Wyoming, place called Crowhart. I didn't stay there long, though. What about you, Alvy? Now, where were you born, Alvy? I never did know. Republican River. ha, <laughs> ha. 
That's not a place, you fool. Well, that's what they told me. Republican River. They always lived in a wagon, my ma and pa. Had a lot of kids, too. Of course, most of them died. I'm about the only one that made out any good at all. And you did fine. I'll be fine. Uh, give me the shotgun. Yeah. All right, Marshal, let's get back by the stove while Bell cleans this mess up. Shall we hit him and throw him out to freeze up now, Hack? Not yet. I want to punish Bell first. You know, someday you're going to get caught without that shotgun, Hack. Somebody's going to tear you apart. That's fair enough, Marshal. Give me a fair chance at you then, huh? Barehanded? No. Oh, no, you're bigger than I am, Hack. Might be fun for you. I don't know nothing about fun. I ain't gonna kill you because it's fun. Oh, come on, Hack. I want to go to bed. Bell! Bell, come out here. Get outside like I told you. And don't open that door so wide, you'll blow the lamp out. Bell had walked through the room and out the door without a glance at any of us. I figured she'd go down to the barn where she'd be all right for a little while anyway. But I knew I'd have to make a move soon. I sure wasn't going to sit there like a fall hog and let Alvy knock me in the head whenever he got ready. But it didn't take much more sense to try to jump Hack in that shotgun and let him blow me all over the place. It was a beggar's choice, and the more I thought about it, the matter I got. Uh, Hack, I'm sleepy. I'm going to hit him and go to bed. You can do what you want after, but I ain't staying up all night. Alvy's got his mind made up, Marshal, I can tell. Just what do you call his mind, Hack? I got ways to fix you, Marshal. Nah, never mind, Alvy. Wrap something around that iron, otherwise it won't look like he hit his head on a rock. What difference it makes? Do what I say, Alvy. All right, Hack. Here, I'll use this curtain. Now, keep your eyes on me, Marshal. Alvy moved around behind me and was getting a good grip on his brand and iron. I leaned slightly forward in the chair and was tensed and waiting for the split second when my instinct had told me to jump. And then suddenly the door was flung wide open and the wind roared in, almost lifting the room as it came. The lamp flared and then went out as I plunged sideways from the chair. Ah! Did you hit him, Alvy? Did you hit him? You bloody fool! Don't you try nothing, Marshal! I got some more shells right here. Don't you move now! I crawled across the room and was out the door before Hack could reload. In the snow outside, I stood up and turned to find Belle waiting by the side of the door, a pitchfork in her hand. I couldn't see her face very well in the dark, but I could tell she was shaken with cold. I reached out and took the fork from her and then flattened myself against the wall and waited. I was afraid it was you he shot. That was a smart trick, Bell. Throwing the door open that way. He shot Alvy, didn't he? Yeah. Good. I think he's found out I'm not in there. What are you going to do? Wait. Marshal. Marshal. I'm going to kill you and the girl both now. I waited, praying he'd come through the door before my hands got too cold to hold the pitchfork. And finally, the barrel of the shotgun appeared waist high and began to poke its way around in our direction. It was stupid of him, but a man behind a gun often gets a false sense of power. I let him shove it out three or four inches, and then I slammed down on it. <laughs> then I jumped into the room. Hack tried to club me with a gun, but he missed. And I got in under him with a fork and lifted him off his feet. And he struggled for a moment like a spirit fish and then went limp. And I let him fall. One of the prongs had reached his heart. Did you get him, Marshal? Is he dead? Yeah. I light the lamp. Okay. 
I can't do it, Marshal. My fingers are too stiff. Here, I'll I'll do it. There. Uh, quite a mess in here. Why don't you wait in the kitchen, Bell? I'm all right, Marshal. But I can't help you much till I get warmed up some. Well, then you'll stay by the stove, huh? I'll lug these people outside. Thank you, Marshal. Marshal? Marshal Dillon? What? Oh. Morning, Bell. Come on out in the kitchen, Marshal. It's warm there, and I got some hot coffee waiting. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, I say, it looks like the storm's lifted. It has. The wind's gone, but it's mighty cold out. Well, I don't mind the cold. It's that wind that breaks a man down. There. Get some of that in you. Uh. <clears throat> oh, well, you make mighty good coffee, Bell. <laughs> Tell me something, Marshal. Hmm? Tell me the truth now. Oh, uh, sure, Bell. What is it? Are you married? I'd make a... Poor husband, Bell, for any woman. Why? Well, in my profession, it's... It's too chancy. Thank you, Marshal. Thanks for putting it that way. Now, Bell, I, I didn't mean... Forget to... it. I'm leaving this place, Marshal. What? As soon as you go, I've packed what I need and I'm clearing off. Where will you go? I got three horses. I'll ride up to Hayes City and sell them. Then what? I'll buy some pretty clothes. And then I'll find a place. Won't be hard after this. I, uh... I wish I could help you, Bell. You have. Oh, but I mean... I can uh... take care of myself, Marshal. I just want to get away from here, that's all. Sure. Uh, I'll stop at the nearest ranch and tell the men to come over here and take care of Hack and Alvy as soon as it warms up. Whatever you like, Marshal. Well, <laughs> goodbye, Bell. Goodbye, Marshal. Look me up in Hayes City next time you're there. Sure. Sure I will. But, uh, Bell, don't let all this make you bitter. There are a lot of good men in the world. So they say. So long, Marshal. I, uh... So long, Bell. A few minutes later, I'd saddled up and was on the trail to Dodge. The sky was low and a slate gray all over, but there was no wind. The blizzard had gone, leaving the land still and white and bitter cold. There wasn't a sign of life anywhere. It was like riding through a vast tomb. I found myself feeling like a trespasser. As though something had gone wrong. And I wasn't supposed to be there at all. Gunsmoke. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, 
with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner as Hack, Harry Bartell as Alvey, and Vivi Janice as Bell. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Starts this Monday, a new run for Road of Life, returning to CBS Radio to join the rest of your daytime listening favorites at the Star's Address. Road of Life, telling the day-to-day story of surgeon scientist Dr. Jim Brent. We'll keep your interest at a high point every Monday through Friday on most of these same stations. Remember, starting this coming Monday, Road of Life in its 16th year will be heard again on CBS Radio. Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. p.m. We got in right on time, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the railroad's getting better every month, Chester. Looks like they're going to civilize this prairie yet. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, let's go. Well, Abilene sure don't change much. Looks about like it did the last time I was here. Now, we're getting most of the cattle at Dodge now. Boom's leveled off here. It's still a rough town, though, I suppose. You think he'll put up a fight? I don't know, Chester. He's pretty mean from all reports. He may. We'll try to avoid it, though. Of course, we're only guessing anyway. He he might not even be here. He always heads for Abilene when he gets in trouble. It's his hometown. He'll be here. Mm. One good thing, it's Bill Hickok's town, too. At least we'll have the local sheriff on our side for once. Yeah. I suppose that's some help. Some help? (laughs) I'd rather have Wild Bill along than anybody I know. I suppose. Chester, what's the matter with you? You're acting like a man at his own funeral. Mr. Dillon, I've had an uneasy feeling ever since we left Dodge. A kind of a hunch, you might say. Ah, it's nonsense. They're going to pick up a killer and take him back for trial. That's all. Maybe. And maybe not. Look, Chester, any man who lives by a gun knows down inside that he's going to die by one someday. But if he's got any sense, he keeps from thinking about it. Of course, he can't help getting a hunch now and then. 
I had plenty of them myself. Mostly wrong. Come on, Chester, let's walk down to the last chance, and I'll buy you a drink. As a matter of fact, I'll buy us both a drink. Quite a crowd in here for this time of day. Yeah. I've been looking around for a while, Bill, but I don't see him. Suppose the Daggett kid might be in here, Mr. Dillon? I he spent most of his time hanging around the saloons while he was in Dodge. Here you are, boys. Drink up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, bartender, do you happen to know a kid around town by the name of... Uh... Who, mister? What? Oh, oh, never mind, never mind. Well, he's here, Chester. Hmm? Down there at the end of the bar. Yeah, it's him, all right. Well, Sir Mr. Dillon? He's what we're here for. We gonna wait for Mr. Hickok? No. Come up on his left side, Chester, and watch his gun head. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Dillon. I'm telling you, it was the funniest sight you ever seen. Yeah. Bullet knocked that scrawny hound dog over end over end. <laughs> First shot I fired. Caught him right in the back of the. Uh, well, <laughs> You're Jack Daggett, aren't you? That's right, mister. What about it? My name's Dillon, U.S. Marshal from Dodge. You're under arrest. You're kind of out of your territory, aren't you? Marshal's territory's anywhere. I'll take that gun of yours now. You will, huh? All right. Drop it. Drop the gun. Let go of my wrist. Drop the gun. Drop nothing. You heard the marshal. Oh! Uh. That was easy, Mr. Dillon. A lot easier than what I thought it'd be. All right, Chester, put the cuffs on it. Yes. Seems to me your partner acted a little high-handed there, Marshal. It does, huh? Now, he had no call to slug that boy in the head that way. Would you rather have to put a bullet in his belly? Chester saved his life. That's all he was drawing on me. Well, now, if you'd come around and seen me before you started anything, you wouldn't have had this trouble. My name is Rourke. I'm the town constable here. I see. Young Jack here told me all about that shooting out in Dodge. Said they ganged up on him in a poker game, tried to cheat him. Forced him to shoot his way out. That's a good story. It's too bad it didn't happen that way. All right, Chester, let's get him on his feet and go find the sheriff. I, uh... Reckon you won't be finding him, Marshal. Why not? Hickok's up in Topeka. Won't be back for a week or ten days. Meantime, I'm the law in Abilene. And I got a favor to ask from you. I'd like to use one of your jail cells until nine o'clock. That's when the next train leaves for Dodge. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, Marshal. I got no authority to do anything like that. What difference does that make? If Wild Bill were here, he'd let me do it. But Wild Bill ain't here. I see. A lot of us folks here like to run our own town. We don't like outsiders coming in and taking over. It's four hours till that train leaves, Marshal. I think you're going to find four hours in a long time. Meaning? This uh, young fellow you arrested has got a couple of older brothers. The Daggett boys. You probably never heard of them, but you're going to. They're not going to like this. I don't care much what they like. Maybe they'll teach you to care when they hear about this. And they'll hear. Like I said, four hours is a long time. Look, I want you to get this straight. I came here to arrest the killer and take him back to Dodge to stand trial. I got him under arrest now, and I'm going to take him back. Maybe. All right, Chester, let's get him out of here. Get hold of his other arm there. Lift him up. Yes, sir. 
Pay him out if you want. Mr. Dillon? What is it, Chester? Maybe it was too easy. Yes, gentlemen. What can I do for you? We'd like to get a room, please. Well, I have a very nice one right at the head of the stair. If you'd care to look at that it... That won't be necessary. We'll only need it for about four hours until the train leaves for Dodge. Mm-hmm. Well, if you'll just sign the register here. Thank you. My, your friend seems to have suffered quite an injury. Yes, sir. He bumped his head. Oh, really? Well, it's certainly a bad cut just to have had... Boy, that... That's one of the Daggett boys. Young Jack Daggett. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I got him under arrest for murder. Now, where's the room? You arrested Jack Daggett? Right here in Abilene? Yeah. You said the room was... Up... And, and you're planning to keep him here at my hotel for the next four hours? Well, I can't stand out there on the street with him. Oh, Marshal. Marshal, do you know what's going to happen when the Daggett boys hear about this? No, but I understand they may not like it very much. May not like it. I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot stay here. I will not let my hotel be made the scene of a bloody massacre. Now, just a minute, mister. Yeah, You've I, rented me a room. I've I, signed the register and I've got the key. I, I, and I'm I going to use that I... room until 9 o'clock, whether you like it or not. <sighs> It's the second door at the top of the stairs. Thank you. Come on, Daggett. Move. You heard him, son. Come on. Keep your hands off. There's just one thing, sir. Yeah. It's, it's not a question of your honesty, you understand, but in view of the circumstances, I wonder if you'd mind uh, paying in advance. <laughs> What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 6.23, Mr. Dillon. Mm, I thought it was later than that. Yes, sir, I know. He goes pretty slow when you're waiting for something. Like this. I swear I wished it was 9 o'clock. I, I wished we were leaving on that train right now. You're not leaving on no train. Not alive. You've got a one-track mind, Daggett. So have my brothers, Dylan. What they think about all the time is hands off the Daggetts. That goes for you or anybody else. Reckon we ought to stuff a pillow in his mouth, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Might not be a bad idea. You won't think it's funny when they come around. But maybe they won't come around. Maybe they decided... Cover the door from the other side, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah, who is it? It's me, sir. The clerk. What do you want? It's the Daggett boys. They're across the street at the last chance right now. And you're hoping I'll go over there instead of waiting for them to come here, huh? Well, I... I... All right. I'd rather jump them than have it the other way around. Chester, I guess we'll go over and have a talk with them. What about him? No, well, he's cuffed hand and foot to a pretty solid iron bed. I don't think he's going anywhere. I'll bet on it. You ready, Chester? I'm ready whenever you are, Mr. Dillon. All right, let's go. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night and most of these same stations, be sure to be with us when Lux Radio Theater raises the curtain on its full-hour adaptation of the exciting screenplay, Phone Call from a Stranger. 
Shelley Winters and Gary Merrill recreate their original screen roles in this dramatic thriller about the experiences of a lone survivor of an airplane crash in bringing the tragic news to families of the victims. Remember, it's on Lux Radio Theater this Monday night on CBS Radio. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. That must be them, Mr. Dillon. Across the room there. Yeah, I guess so. And they look a lot like Jack. And they look mad. And there's quite a crowd around it. Well, Chester, the only way to get it over is to get it started. Yes, sir. Uh, how will we do it, Mr. Dillon? I haven't got a plan, Chester. Face them down, that's all. Yes, sir. You the Daggett brothers? What if we are? This is him, Jim. This is a fellow. Shut up, Rourke. You've been glad enough to stay out of this so far. Stay out of it now. My name's Dillon, United States Marshal from Dodge City. I got your brother Jack under arrest for murder. You probably heard about it. Yeah, rumors got around. I'm taking him out of here on the 9 o'clock train. He's going back to Dodge to stand trial. My guess is he's going to hang. Yeah. Now, the point is, what are you going to do about it? Why didn't you wait? We'd have looked you up. <laughs> you didn't answer my question. Still two hours and a half till 9 o'clock. I reckon we've got plenty of time yet. We'll wait. Why wait? What's the matter with now? Would rather wait. Maybe you're trying to pick up some helpers among this bunch of hangers-on, huh? Well, look at them. Each one to trying to sneak behind the man next to him. If you're counting on any help there, you better forget it. You're pushing your luck, Dylan. I don't think so. You boys are full of talk, and that's all. You never even intended to start anything. You're a dirty liar. We're going to do Hold plenty. It. Now, don't you move, either one of you. You covering my back, Chester? Yes, sir. All right. I'll take that gun. Thank you. Yours, too. Sure. It's your play, Dylan. Where it stands now. Thank you. Here, Chester. Kick those back under the tables. Yes, sir. All right, folks, just leave them lay, please. Don't nobody touch them. Here, Chester. Now hold on to my gun. All right, Mr. Dillon. Now just keep them off my back. Yes, sir. You, come here. Sure. You called me a liar, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you cheap chin horn. You... Boy, get him! I thought you daggers were tough. Hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. All right, you. You're next. I'll wait, Marshal. I'll get to you later. You're a no-good coward, Daggett. All right, Chester, I'll take my gun back now. Here you are, sir. Thank you. All right, boys, the show's over. Unless, of course, one of you'd like to take up where the Daggett's left off. Any one of you still figuring on helping them try to take my prisoner away from me? Oh, I hate that at all. 
No? Well, I didn't think so. You're all fine, upright citizens now, huh? A pride and joy to Constable Rourke here. That's enough, Dylan. I thought I told you boys the show was over. All right, get out. Go on, get out, all of you. Move! Marshal, I'd say you overreached yourself there. Step past the limits of your authority. How I enforce the law is my own business. I do things my own way. Uh, the way it'll get you killed someday. Maybe. I have to live in this town, Dylan. You don't know these Daggett brothers. If you cross them, you're through. I've seen it happen. Come on, Chester, let's go. All right, Mr. Dillon. What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 7.45, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the time's dragging. Yes, sir. It's still an hour and 15 minutes till that train leaves. What difference does it make? You're not going to be on it. Neither one of you are. The way I'm figuring, Jack, we'll all three be on it. You wait and see. You'll never get to that train. My brothers will take care of you. They don't seem to be in any hurry about it. You wait. I sure do wish I hadn't had such an uneasy hunch about this trip. <laughs> Forget it, Chester. They'll stop you. You just wait. It's only 8.15. Mr. Dillon seems to be going slower all the time. Yeah, adds up, though. It won't be much longer now. 45 minutes. If the train's on time. And if we're lucky enough to get on it. Chester, you're wearing yourself out. Why don't you sit on and relax, huh? I just can't seem to set my mind to it, Mr. Dillon. No Daggett will ever leave this town wearing handcuffs as long as the other two are alive. Well, I'd think that's up to them, Jack. Sure. And they'll take care of it, too. I, I swear and declare, Mr. Dillon, I almost wish they would try something and get it over with. <laughs> the waiting's always the worst part, Chester. You find out what the worst part is. I could slug him, Mr. Dillon. No, let him talk. Let him talk, Chester. He's only got a few more weeks to do it in. They'll never hang me. I'll never even stand trial. You wait and see. Chester? It's half past eight exactly, Mr. Dillon. All right. Let's get started. A little early, isn't it? Won't take that long to walk from here to the station. It might if we have trouble. Mm. Yes, sir, I guess it might. You'll have trouble. Don't you worry about that. Jack, why don't you get on a new subject? How are we going to take him, Mr. Dillon? Just drag him? If he wants it that way. Otherwise, he'll walk handcuffed to my left wrist. Keep him covered, Chester. I'll unlock these cuffs and get him loose from the bed. Yes, sir. <sighs> Dillon, if you're smart, you leave me here and run while you still got the chance. Well, I've never been smart enough to run yet. Stick out your right wrist. All right. On your feet. Come on. You can put your gun away, Chester. Starting now, he's only going where I go. Now, come on, Jack. We got a train to catch. Thank heaven, gentlemen, you're leaving. Yeah, we're leaving. And I want to thank you for your wonderful hospitality. I'll be glad to recommend your hotel to anybody who plans to stop over in Abilene. Oh, I, I hardly know what to say, Marshal. 
You simply don't understand. You don't know these Daggett brothers. No, no, no offense personally, Jack. I have to live in this town, and I... Come on, Jack. Uh, I... Uh... Now, you boys must run quite a bluff. You got everybody in town jumping sideways. You'd be smart if you did, Dylan. Good luck, gentlemen. Best of luck to, to all of you. <laughs> all of us. Well, that's hedging his bet. Up there, Mr. Dillon. Not a soul on the street. Quiet as a graveyard. Yeah. And they're going to make a play, Chester, somewhere between here and the depot. We can count on that. Yes, sir, I kind of figured they would. Especially after getting beat up over there at the saloon. Oh, they would have anyway. And jumping them like that did one good thing. It scared the pack off. At least we only have to worry about the Daggetts, not a mob. You think it's a mob? Shut up, Tom. Now, from here on, you keep your mouth shut. If you don't, so help me, I'll slug you and drag you to the depot. All right, now, let's go. Now, sir, not a soul. I never thought I'd see the main street of Abilene deserted at this time of night. It's not deserted, Chester. They're inside, behind the shutters. But at least they're staying out of it. I wonder if coyotes are as lonesome as they sound, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> they couldn't be, Chester. Watch that left side up ahead of us, sir. It's pretty dark along there. Yes, sir. They might jump us from behind. I don't think so. Too many people watching. They gotta keep up their reputation. I hope you're right. Chester, mm. there at the corner of the bank, somebody moved. Across the street, too. In the shadow. Take the one in the shadow, Chester. Yes, sir. There's one down, Chester. The other one's still there in the shadows. Get him if you can. Jack, here's ruining my aim. I'll ruin more. Hey, all right. Jack. Good for you, Mr. Dillon. You ought to slugged him sooner. I didn't slug him, Chester. He caught a bullet that was meant for me. Well, shot by one of his own brothers. Here, let me unlock those handcuffs, Mr. Dillon. No, get... no time. Here, I'll get him up on my shoulder and... All right, let's move in and keep firing. Yes, sir. Hey! Hold it, Chester. I guess we got the other one. Here, let me get him off my shoulder. Get these handcuffs off. Well, there's our prisoner, Jack Daggett. Wanted for murder, killed by his own brother. Let's take a look at the others. Three men dead. Look down the street there, Mr. Dillon. They're all starting to crawl out of their holes. Sure. They're all on our side now. Oh, come on, Chester. The train's coming. We gotta get on it and get out of here. Yes, sir. Don't let Rourke clean up this mess. He ought to be good for something. Hmm. That sounds more lonesome than the coyotes. Gives a man the creeps. Yes, sir, it sure does. Well, you were wrong about that hunch of yours, Chester. It wasn't us. Not this time. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Barney Phillips, with John Daner, Tom Tully, Larry Dobkin, and Jim Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week 
As Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Lionel Barrymore and your Hallmark Playhouse invite you to enjoy another Hollywood cast bringing you another drama in the tradition of this fine program. Every week, your Hallmark Playhouse features Lionel Barrymore as host. Frequently, Mr. Barrymore stars as well. Historic dramas, stories about the human side of patriots, presidents, pioneers, and adaptations from literature. Enjoy them on Hallmark Playhouse over most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of Escape, listen Sunday nights to the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Over inside a Dodge anyway, Chester. There's Ellen Henry's homestead. Wonder how she'd take to serving up a breakfast, Mr. Dillon. I'm plum hungry. I'll settle for water and the horses. I don't imagine Ellen has any extra food. No, sir. It's gone pretty hard for her since Ethan died, hasn't it? That's the talk. Look at her place. Three lean-tos and not a green thing growing. I don't know how she makes out. Well, maybe Luther helps more than the folks give him credit for. For a son, he's not much good to my way of thinking. I don't know when he turns a hand for his mother between stops at the Texas Trail and the Long Branch. At least not much like his father was. Or Ellen either, for that matter. That's a mite early. Nobody's stirring. Oh, oh, oh. We better just water our horses and ride on, Chester. Yes, sir. Quiet-like, isn't it? Hey, where'd you come from, Mr. Dillon? Uh, from the house, I think. Luther? I don't know. You're trespassing. Get off my land. It's Marshal Dillon, Ellen. We just stopped to water our horses. I recognize you. The trespassing still goes, Marshal. You're awful quick to fire, Ellen. Ethan and me never took to folks arriving unannounced. I still don't take to you. Well, that's no cause to be firing on us that way, Miss Henry, especially since you recognized it. Quit whimpering. If I'd aim to hit you, I'd have hit you. All right, Ellen. Get off my land and stay off. Just don't you get in any trouble with that rifle, Ellen. I expect you'll hear about it if I do, Marshal. Now get. I don't always aim high. Come on, Chester. How old would you say she is, Mr. Dillon? 
Oh, she can't be over 40, I guess. If that. She looks like an old woman. 60 or more. She's dried up. Dead inside. Remember when Ethan and her and the boy came out here, Mr. Dillon, right after the war? She's an awful pretty little thing. Mm-hmm. Luther was a little more than a baby then. No, well, Mr. Dillon, I was just thinking. Ethan was so proud of his homestead and his boy and Ellen. Now he's five years dead, the boy's gone bad, and his wife and his homestead, they've just dried up. It's kind of sad, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Well, come on, Chester, let's get on into Dodge. <laughs> Oh, Mitch. Well, what'll it be? Uh, set up a bottle of rye, will you? Yes, sir, Marshal Dillon. <laughs> Look. There's Luther over there at the table, alone. Yeah, I saw him. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mitch. Wait here, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, Mitch, could I have a little sugar in here? Mind if I don't get to my feet, Marshal? I got the feeling if I tried to stand up straight, I'd fall over first thing I knew. Sit still, Luther. I just don't have a lot of choice about it, Marshal. I was out by your place this morning, Luther. I hadn't seen your mother in a long time. I wish I could say the same. A woman shouldn't have to run a homestead alone. Not when her son's big enough to be a real help. Is this a lecture, Marshal? A do-good talk? Put your own name on it, Luther. I can't make you feel what you don't feel. But in a way, you're responsible for your mother and what she does. I'm real lucky, Marshal. I can quit listening any time I don't want to hear something. Between the old lady and people like you, I quit listening an awful lot. Get it straight, Luther. I don't care what happens to you. I done something wrong? You accusing me of something unlawful, Marshal? No. But if you have any feeling left for your mother or what happens to her, you'll do something about her. Living out there alone so much, she's gone a little crazy. <laughs> she shot at you. <laughs> Is that all that's concerning you, Marshal? Half the time I do go home, she levels off at me. I got a ride in under fire. Or crawl in on my belly. She's crazy, like you said. I swear, she's crazy. Then you ought to bring her into town and get a keeper for her. Maybe I would. If I cared what happened to her, I don't care. I don't care at all. Well, that's up to you, Luther. Now, that's just another one of them things I didn't hear you say, Marshal. Well, Luther's just plain drunk, isn't he, sir? That and just plain no good. Well, whatever you said drove him right out of here, Mr. Dillon. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't been in the office since early yesterday, Chester. All right, sir. Only... Only what? Well, sir, Mitch has got a catalog in the back room, and he's not busy, and he says it's just full of things you can order straight from St. Louis. I thought I'd... Well... Uh, you got extra money, have you, Chester? Oh, no, sir. Well, that is not really extra money, Mr. Dillon. It's just that... Well... Mitch swears you can get underwear from this catalog that don't rub your skin raw, and I'd like to take a look at it. <laughs> All right, Chester, I'll wait. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh, Marshal. Uh, oh, hello, Cass. Now, 
what's on your mind? Talk I heard, Marshal. It's a private like maybe we'd go to your office. We can do our talking here. <laughs> I thought you was always of a mind to get me inside there, Marshal, where you could turn the key on me. Maybe I will someday, Cass. Now, come on, speak up. Yeah, I heard talk at Luther Henry Road cattle off Carnes' place last night. I saw you talking with him just now. I wondered if you'd heard the same. I haven't heard a thing, Cass. Odd you wouldn't know. I was out of Dodge last night, all night. Uh, I wonder if it's so. L Luther didn't give himself away when you talked just now. You're the one who's heard the talk, Cass. I got my rights. I can ask questions of you, Marshal. If a man's heard ain't safe, he's got a right to know. Are you worried for Carnes or for you? If Carnes' cattle can be rode off, mine can. No. I didn't know you had much of a herd. What a man has is his own business, Marshal. I'm asking about Luther and the other rider. They say there was two. If Luther's wrong with the law, I'll get him. Is there anything else on your mind? Thanks, Mitch, for letting me see the book. Not a thing, Marshal. But I don't much like your attitude. I can't see that worrying me too much, Cass. All right, Chester, let's go. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon, I was watching him from the back there. He's a sniveling sort, that cat. Mm-hmm. Come to think of it, though, I don't know a single bad thing he's done. Know any good he's done? No, sir. Can't say that he do, Mr. Dillon. Well, how about you, Joe? Find out about your fancy underwear. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, now we can tend to business, huh? Come on. <laughs> Hello, Marshal. I was waiting for you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carnes. How do you, Chester? Well, how do, Mr. Carnes? You got the key, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, I don't see you in town much, Mr. Carnes. Only when I got business, Marshal. No. Yeah. Well, come on in, won't you? My, it's close in here. <laughs> We've been away a day and a night, Mr. Carnes. Sure gets close that way. I'll just open up the back. Won't you have a chair, Mr. Carnes? I don't have a long piece to say, Marshal. It don't take long to say some of my cattle were stolen last night. Ah, uh, I heard. So soon? Yeah, Cass Stetter told me about it a few minutes ago. Hmm. Well, I don't know how Cass come by the information, but it's true. This is the second time it's happened in the last few weeks. You don't keep much cattle, do you? Hardly any. I suppose a hundred heads is the most I ever had at one time. Mm hmm But last night I lost five or six... About the same time before. Cass was of the mind that uh, Luther Henry did it. I don't know, Marshal. One of my hands said Luther was out of my place the other day just looking around. I got no real reason to suspect him. Only thing I know is that whoever it was rides a horse that shot all the way around. You don't see a lot of that on the prairie. No, you don't. Do you think there was just one rider, Mr. Carnes? There was two from the tracks, but the boys and me lost them in the rain. I thought I'd tell you about it, Marshal. I can't afford to lose a little I got. No, I'll do what I can, Mr. Kirk. I... I kind of hope it isn't Luther. Not for him so much as Ellen. She's had enough trouble. Yeah. Well, Chester and I'll ride out to the Henry place and look around, Mr. Carnes. If uh, Luther's guilty, maybe some of Ellen's troubles will be over. Or maybe they'll just be beginning... Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, in the 17th annual poll of Noted Daily, CBS Radio won 12 first places. The top poll award, Champion of Champions, went to The Jack Benny Show. Best comedian was Eve Arden on Our Miss Brooks. Best comedian, Jack Benny. Best master of ceremonies, Bing Crosby. Bing also won the nod as best popular male vocalist. Doris Day was rated best feminine pop vocalist. And so it went. 
in all 12 first places. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. I swear, Mr. Dillon, I feel like I was riding right into the camp of the enemy, coming back to Ellen this way. <laughs> you think we should be flying a white flag as we ride up, Chester? You know, I'd feel a little safer to tell the honest truth. Oh, she's got no reason to fire on us. <laughs> but I'll agree, that's pretty small comfort. Oh. Look yonder, Mr. Dillon. I think I saw her peering out. It's all right, Chester. Come on. <laughs> I don't see Luther's horse around. Maybe he isn't here. Well? Afternoon, Ellen. I uh, want to talk a bit about uh, Luther. I got work to do in the shed. I'm going there. You want to talk. Let me help, Ellen. I'll get it. Uh, he's got a loose shoe. I aim to fix it. Well, we could be a hand, Ellen. If, yes, uh... I'm proud, too. I aim to fix it myself. All right. He wouldn't have shoes if I waited for a man to shoe him. Easy. Easy, Dal. Easy. Oh. You come to talk, Marshal. Yeah, about Luther. Come on. Open. Huh. Two nails clean out. No wonder it's loose. Carnes lost some cattle last night. Two riders got off with five or six head. One of Carnes' hands thinks Luther was one of them. Is he around, Ellen? I told you before. He comes and goes, Luther does. Well, have you seen him since we were here this morning? Don't recall that I have, Marshal. I got other things to occupy my thought. Like trying to get together enough money to go back to my people. What to do with those nails? Here they are, man. Oh. I'd admire to help you, Miss Henry. I'll do it. That's a fine horse, Ellen, a real fine horse. Shot all the way around. Come on, boy. That was Ethan's way. This your horse or uh, Luther's? Mine. What? Well, that was Luther, Mr. Dillon, and he took your horse. Yeah. Do I make a run after him, sir? Not when he's wild, Chester. I don't want you shot or him either. I just want to talk to him. Well, he just comes and goes, huh, Ellen? Believe what you want, Marshal. I didn't know he was around. Like I said, I never know. I quit caring. Don't worry, Marshal. Luther will get his. He's had it coming to him for a long time. Well, I guess we ride back double, Chester. Yes, sir, we sure do. Luther sure cut out quick, Mr. Dillon. Maybe he did run those cattle off Carn's place last night. Maybe. He's running away from something. Wonder where he'll hide. Everybody around here knows your horse. Oh, he's made a lot of mistakes. He'll make more. Nothing says he's going to turn bright all of a sudden. You're not worried about your horse then, Mr. Dillon? I don't think so, Chester. What kind of a woman is that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen? Yes, sir. 
I don't know. I'm not much of a hand to understand women, Chester, any woman. I don't know. You think she knew Luther was home all along? Maybe. I just don't understand it, Mr. Dillon. It's not right somehow, a woman not caring about her own son. You hear her? She said right out, I quit caring. It just don't seem right. Still might close in here. I believe I'll leave them back windows up a spell, Mr. Dillon. I think I'll go up to Emil's blacksmith shop, Chester, and see if he has a horse to spare. All right, sir. Uh, there's some paperwork to catch up on if you get the time. Yes, sir. Of course, you'll want to write that place in Chicago about your underwear, the first thing. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> I'll be back, Chester. Well, I may not need that horse after all. How's that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen Henry's riding up the street, leading my horse. Well, bless my soul, it sure is. There's something thrown across her saddle. Mr. Dillon, it looks like... Wait here, Chester. Hello, Ellen. I brought your horse back, Marshal. He's been run hard. He looks all right. You, uh... You found Luther, did you? He's dead. You found him dead? He had it coming a long time. Here, I'll lift him down. Easy. Easy, Daryl. Easy. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Uh, Chester, take the body up to docks, will you? Yes, sir. Miss Henry, I... I'm real sorry. I'll be going now, Marshal. Well, I'll take my horse then, Ellen. You, uh... You got any plans for burying Luther? Put him in any ground you like, only don't tell me where it is or when you do it. You know how he died, Ellen? He was shot. Look, it's near dark, Ellen. You could put up in town for the night if uh, you'd... Don't put him near Ethan, Marshal. I wouldn't want that. Cut on! Doc's working on Luther now, Mr. Dillon. He's just plumb full of holes. Yeah, I know. Poor Miss Henry. Even though she don't act like it, I just know she feels terrible. Yeah, she's grieving her heart on. Where are you going, Mr. Dillon? I don't think I express my sympathy to poor Miss Henry. Proper. <laughs> I followed Ellen Henry West toward her homestead. The sun was down now, but I could see her ahead riding hard. There were clouds to the south and the smell of rain on the easy wind that blew in little circles around me. Ellen bore west, and I lost her past a clump of cottonwoods near Carnes' place, so I rode harder. And when I came even with the trees, there was just enough sun ray left to see her head south toward the dark clouds. She wasn't going home. It was dark now. I couldn't see anything. The storm clouds stretched black from the south and fastened over half the sky. And I rode hard against them until I saw the flicker of lantern shine ahead. It was Cass Stetter's place. I left my horse out away from the house and 
walked in as softly as I could. Cass and Ellen were having their talk in a cattle shed near the you house. You trusted me before about the money, Ellen. What's the rush this time? My work's done, Cass. It was done last night when Luther and me drove them last few from Carnes place over here. I want my share and Luther's. Him not cold dead yet, you want a share. Ain't a mother entitled to whatever her son leaves? Mother? You never had no mother feel for him and him no love for you either. Ha! Huh. Ain't you the one to talk about love, though. It takes courage to love. To love with all of you. When the love goes, they take it and bury it in the ground. There's nothing left but hate. I wouldn't kill my own kin. You wouldn't be that honest. You won't even steal cattle yourself. You buy it off of them as has the courage to ride in and rustle it. Yeah, well, how'd it feel, killing your own Ellen? Like it'll feel killing you, Cass. If you don't give me the money here and now, like nothing at all. Luther's dead and gone because he tipped his hand, showed his face around Karn's place, talked big in the saloons. He was no use. No use at all. There's no woman in you at all. I've been dead five years. And your time's running short, too, Cass. I'm in a hurry. Too late to hurry, Ellen. What's too late to move for guns, so. Well, I'm sure I'm glad to see you, Marshal. How are you, Cass? Oh, I sure am. I guess I called a trick on Luther, all right, didn't I? Yeah, you were a big help. You and Luther stole the cattle, Ellen, and brought them to Cass for pay, is that it? Only sometimes, like now, we didn't get paid. Don't believe her, Marshal. You wouldn't take the word of one as murders your own son, would you? I don't have to, Cass. Carnes' brand won't be hard to find on any cattle you got here. Cass was just slow to move him on, Marshal. If he'd have gone on toward Abilene with him last night like we planned... You're lying, Helen Henry, you're lying. Now get your horses. Both of you. Wait... Well, why are you taking me, Marshal? Well, there's some kind of a law, Cass, about buying and transporting stolen cattle. Yeah, Marshal knows his law, Cass. You, you know what she did to Luther, don't you, Marshal? Yeah, I know. Now, come on. You'd like it better, wouldn't you, Marshal? If one of us made a move so you could use your gun. I said, come on, Ellen. I think I'd like it better if you used your gun, Marshal. I ain't going to get back east now anyway. You'd be taking a coward's way out, Ellen, if you made me kill you. Ah. <coughs> I said, get your horse, Cass. <laughs> now make your choice, Ellen. But I don't think Ethan would think much of you. All right, Marshal. I'll go. But mind what I said. Don't put Luther near Ethan. They wasn't the same kind. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Kathleen Height, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Sam Edwards, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Herb Vigran. Parley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke.
This coming Monday evening, hear Richard Widmark as one of the desperate Spencer brothers riding against time and death in a suspense drama well calculated to keep your interest high. Also Monday night, you want to hear CBS Radio's Lux Radio Theater starring Joan Fontaine and Joseph Cotton in the strange drama September Affair. Remember, both this Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. Suspense and Lux Radio Theater. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Dylan? Yeah. I'm ready for spring, Chester. The tail end of winter always gets on my nerves. Well, it shouldn't be long now. The worst of it's bound to be over. Well, I hope so. Here, let's try Delmonico's here. Huh? I'm always ready to eat, Mr. Dillon. Morning, Matt. Chester. Oh, Morning. hi, Kitty. Well, how about joining me, huh? Well, thank you. Pull up a chair, Chester. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're up early this morning, Matt. Usually you don't even start breathing till noon. It's too cold to sleep, Kitty. A jail stove always burns itself out about 5 o'clock in the morning. From then on, you just have to... Well, what is it, Matt? 
Chester, that second table from the window over there. Hmm? Those three men there, do you know them? No, sir, I don't think I do. Well, I do. Ran into them about four years ago out in Arizona Territory. That's the Pueblo gang. Never heard of them coming this far east before. Well... You want some help, mister? No, just sit tight, Chester. Ma'am? Uh, order me some sausage and buckwheat cakes, Kitty, will you? I'll be right back. I don't want to stay in this town. I don't like it enough, but go ahead. Morning, boys. It's the Parks Brothers, isn't it? Ed and Rio and Chuck Evans. Well, what about it? Easy, Rio. It's Dylan, the U.S. Marshal, the one I told you about. Yeah, I bet you did. What'd you tell him, Chuck? Look, Dylan, our food's getting cold. You got something on your mind or not? Nothing important, Rio. I figure it's quite an honor to have the Pueblo gang in town. I just thought I'd drop over and tell you how I felt about it. And uh, how do you feel? Well, that depends, Ed. Are you boys here on business or pleasure? Does it uh, make a difference? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a difference. I know your reputation west of here. Half the stage holdups in the last five years from Colorado to the California border can be laid right at your door. As far as I know, you're clean in Dodge City so far. Nah, look, All right, Dylan, you just we... keep it that way. You make one move here and your time's up. Right then, you're short and I'll take you, all three of you. You understand? Sure, we understand. We'll think it over, Dylan, let you know what we decided to Rio, do. Rio, you I'll... talk too much. Now, see you around, boys. You can put the gun away now, Chester. All right. I was just going to be ready in case. Uh, Matt, I thought I'd tell you. Those boys are mean. They were in the Texas Trail last night. They're just downright mean. Yeah, I know. What do we do, Mr. Dillon? Run them out of town? Not unless they give us some reason to, Chester. Yes, sir. The law doesn't say you can hang a man because he might steal a horse. Yeah, forget it. Let's eat, huh? <laughs> Our old train just about ready to pull off, looks like. Yes, yeah, on time. It's three o'clock. Be in St. Louis tomorrow night, Chicago the next day. If the engine holds up. <laughs> oh, they don't break down so much anymore. They're getting them worked out so they're pretty dependable. Yeah, I guess so. You ever get a hankering to take a trip back east, Mr. Dillon, just to see how things have changed? Uh, not me, Chester. I've been on the frontier too long. I'd be lost back there. I wouldn't know how to act. I, I guess man could get his rope kinked over which fork to use or what to hey, do Matt. with it. Huh? Oh, hi, Will. <laughs> you down watching your competition pull out? There'll be a stagecoach running for a long time to come yet. Railroad's not bothering me any. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Something else is, though. No? Matt, the stage from Buckeye is more than two hours overdue. I'm getting a little worried. Well, why? It's usually late, isn't it? Not on this particular day of the month. Well, what's today particular? Gold dust. Uh -huh. This is the day those plaster mines out there always ship their cleanup. Charlie's never missed getting it here at 3 o'clock on time for the eastbound Santa Fe. Not once. Who's riding the shotgun, Will? Houston Jack. Well, he's a good man. I doubt if there's any cause to worry. That shipment runs eighty or $100,000 sometimes, Matt. Never been laid before. Oh, Charlie will probably roll in any minute now. Uh, we'll see you later, Will. So long. What do you think, Mr. Dillon? Same as you do, Chester. Let's ride up and meet that stage. <laughs> I think I heard a horse went in, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I thought I heard it, too. We must be an hour and a half from town the way the stage runs. It sure is late, all right. I hope late is all it is, Chester. I hope it's not... There. There, there it is again, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it came from that draw over there, somewhere on that sumac thicket. Come on. Come on. Look, Mr. Dillon. Wheel track leading off the trail. Yeah. Run into the dead gallop and out of control. Like... Bye -bye. Oh. Oh. 
Well, Chester, there's the stage. I don't see any sign of life, Mr. Dillon. Oh. Let's take a look. There's tracks all around. Must have been three or four horses here. Yeah, three, the way I'm figuring it. I'll lay any odds you want if this is some of the... That's Houston Jack, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Shot in the back of the head. And they didn't take any chances. He must have ridden up behind the stage and fired without any warning. That's probably what spooked the horses and started to run away. Yeah, they shot the lead horse. It's an old trick. Charlie's still up here on the box. They got him, too. Uh, that strong box has been forced open. It's empty. All right, Chester, let's cut these horses loose and get them out of the traces. Huh? All right, sir. Come on now, boy. It's the same way they used to work it out west. Shoot the guard in the back and let the team run until they're far enough off the trail and then kill the lead horse to stop them. You mean that Pueblo gang? Yeah, who else? Oh, oh. That's a good thing there weren't any passengers. They'd have got the same treatment. All right, there you go, boy. I think there were some passengers, Mr. Dillon. One, at least. What? Huh? There's a couple of trunks tied on top and a carpet bag of some kind inside the stage. Here, let's have a look. They're the only bodies of the guards and the drivers. Say, maybe one of the gang was riding as a passenger. They wouldn't leave trunks behind it. What is it? There's stuff in the carpet bag. Belongs to a woman. There's no woman here? Yeah, I know. Well, they... And they must have taken her. Yeah. It's almost dark. Come on, Chester, let's try to pick up their trail. And it's just no use going any farther, Mr. Dillon. It's too dark to tell what we're doing. Well, they were heading towards the river here. Let's take a look through these willows, and if we don't find anything, then we'll ride on back to town. All right, sir. I still keep getting a faint whiff of wood smoke from somewhere. I sure wish we would find the fire. It's getting colder in the heat. Wait a minute. Uh, look over there. Well, I'll swear. It's fire, all right. Or what's left of one, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you suppose you're still I don't there? know. Let's leave the horses here and go up on foot, huh? All right, sir. Couldn't have left too long ago. That fire would have burned itself out. Well. I'd say we're too late, Mr. Dillon. I think they've gone. Yeah, it looks that way, all right. Yeah, a half hour or an hour ago. Made a fast camp, stayed long enough to warm up, and then they went... <laughs> I don't know. They're over here, Chester. There's somebody lying on the ground. Help me. Help me, please. Here. Throw some brush on the fire, Chester. Yes, sir. No, it's all right, miss. It is all right now. Three of them robbed the stage. Killed the driver and the guard. Brought me with them. Anything I can do, Mr. Dillon? No, Chester, I'm afraid not. I love it. Chester, get some light over here. Grab one of those branches that's caught fire. Now, Mr. Dillon, just a second. Easy now, ma'am. Just easy now. It's going to be all right. I pleaded with them. Begged them to, to let me go. Here. This help in? Yeah, hold it over here. Mm. Helen. 
but they wouldn't. They wouldn't let me go. Helen Ford. And when they left, they drew their guns and shot me. Easy now. They shot me. You know who they were? Helen? Helen, can you hear me? One. One named Rio. One called Chuck. They sat on their horses. Shot me. Then they laughed. She's in awful bad shape, Mr. Nellon. We ought to get her to dog. Shot me. And laughed. But it didn't matter. Not that. Dodge, get me your saddle blanket, will you, Chester? You knew her, Mr. Dillon? A long time ago. Then things happen the way they do. Later, she married Bill Ford and went out to Colorado. It's a long time ago. I didn't expect I'd ever see her again. It's a bad thing, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to see him hang for it. We will return. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... Everybody's got a heart. That's a plenty solid reason for everybody to support with generous contributions the annual fund drive of the heart campaign. Don't forget, what your money pays for is aimed at making the sick well and keeping the well from getting sick. Support the heart campaign again this year. Now for the second act of Gun Smoke. <laughs> Chester, we'll check the livery stable first. Yes, they could have pulled out, of course, but I'll lay odds they came straight back into town. You won't take long to find out. Now, let's go in. Who's there? Who is it? It's Matt Dillon. Is that you, Mr. Kelvin? Oh, yeah, sure is, Marshal. Hey, hey, let me get a lantern lit. I'm just fixing to lock up the stable and go over and grab myself a bite to eat. Running things alone again tonight. The confounded boy didn't show up. I'd like he's not drunk and seen... There. Now, come on, Marshal. We've got a fire going back in the office. Come on back. Set us. Uh, I'd like to, Calvin, but we don't have time. I'm looking for some horses. Well, I got them, Marshal. You want to buy, trade, or hire? Uh, just look. Yeah. There are three fellows staying over at the Dodge house. They've been there about a week. Ed and Rio Parks and Chuck Evans. They're keeping their horses here. Here they are, right back here. And if I ever saw a ruination of good horse flesh, this is it. There. Take a look there. That one belongs to the oldest Parks boy, Ed, and the one next to it's Rio's. They've been rode, Mr. Dillon. Mm. They've been rode plenty. Yeah. What time did they come in, Kelvin? Well, about an hour ago, more or less. They've gone since forenoon, just come back a little while ago. Look at that horse. Been rubbed down twice. And he's still wet. They didn't say where they'd been, did they? No, not them. They ain't the talking kind. Just left their horses and went on over to the hotel. Well, wherever they was, though, they must have been riding like the devil himself was chasing them. Well, maybe he was. Uh, thanks, Mr. Cullen. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess there's not much doubt of it, Chester. No, sir. It was them, all right. And I could have stopped it before it happened. 
A man shouldn't be jailed on suspicion, I figured. Just because he might do something wrong. Well, my... Everybody has to play it the way he sees it. Yeah, only sometimes you can see it a lot plainer afterwards. What are we going to do? Go get him, that's all. Uh, <laughs> well, where do we start looking? The Texas Trail. Oh, I one thing, Chester, before we go in. Now, you leave the play on this to me, huh? Just keep me covered, that's all. Mr. Dillon, what was her name before she was married? Marlowe. Helen Marlowe. All right, come on, let's go. <laughs> Evening up until now. Hiya, Matt. Chester. Hi, Miss Kitty. Kitty. Uh, I'm looking for the Pueblo gang. Have any of them been in here? Why, yeah. One of them's here now. Leo Parks. He's over there at the faro table. Oh? Huh? Well, what's wrong, Matt? What happened? Well, they held up the Buckeye stage. Killed Charlie and Houston Jack. And a passenger. A woman. Helen Ford. Ah. Oh. No. All right, Chester. Oh, be careful, Matt. Yeah, sure, Kitty. Just cover me, Chester. That's all. Yes, you. Five hundred says I've got the car. Thank you. Too much me. Are you going to cover me or not? What's the matter? You all a bunch of pikers? <laughs> Maybe they haven't been out robbing stagecoaches, Rio. What do you mean by that? Maybe they don't make their living by killing women. Dylan, a man could get in trouble shooting off his mouth that way. You're already in trouble. All right, boys, Rio's checking in his hand. The game's over. You can slide out at the end of the table over there. You're under arrest for murder, Rio. I don't know what you're talking about, Dylan. Murder. The murder that you're going to hang for. Now, where are the other two? Go find them if you want them. I'm going to as soon as I finish with you. I said you're under arrest, Rio, and I get your hands up. Oh, and I don't. Dylan. You're not going to make any play. You don't have the guts. Shooting a man in the back is more your line, Rio. You're killing a woman. Now get your hands up. That's better. All right, Chester, get his gun. Seems like it's getting colder, Mr. Dillon. Clear as a bell, though. Look at that moon. Where do you suppose they are? You've been in nearly every saloon on Front Street. I don't know, Chester, but wherever they are, we're going to find them. And you know something, Mr. Dillon? When we do arrest the other two, they're as good as hung with the evidence we got on them. I haven't arrested them yet. Maybe them other two won't be taken as easy as Rio. That's up to them. If they want to surrender, they can. I've never shot a man with his hands up. Chester. Hmm? Ben's barber shop over there. The man that he's shaving. It's kind of hard to tell with all that lather on No, it's Ed Parks. Come on. And there's just him and Ben in the shop. I wonder where Chuck Evans is. We'll worry about him later. Uh, just help yourself to a seat, gentlemen. Be ready for you just as soon as... Uh, oh, evening, Marshal. How you been? I didn't know you were in the habit of shaving outlaws. Uh, well, maybe you're mistaken, Marshal. I, you just have a seat there and No, I... I recognize him, all right. It's Ed Parks. Uh, well, looks like you got the advantage of me, Dylan. No, we can't have that, Ed. Wipe the leather off his face, Ben. Yes, sir. Sure thing, Marshal. Uh, just uh, a second <clears throat> now, Mr. Parks. Uh, there. There you are. It's too bad you have to leave that shave half finished, Ed. But they'll give you a free one just before they hang you. What are you talking about, Dylan? Uh, now, now, gentlemen... Ed, you're under arrest for murder. Get your hands up. 
Your brother's waiting for you at the jail. You arrested Rio? What about the hands, Ed? Are you gonna put them up? No, dirty kid! Huh? That was a fast move for a barber, Ben. I, I knew he had a gun under the towel, Marshal, but of course I couldn't say anything about it. Well, thank you, Ben. And if you'll send the bill for your shaving mug to the stage company, they'll probably take care of it for you. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Chester, spill some water on him. I want him to walk to jail. <laughs> I bet Chuck Evans got clean away, Mr. Dillon. The word must have got to him. Well, he had to do it awful fast. The clerk said he checked out of the hotel less than ten minutes ago. Kelvin? Yeah, the light must hurt his eyes. He never keeps a lantern burning. Afraid of fire, maybe. Kelvin? Are you there, Kelvin? Yes. Hey, well, what's wrong? Who is it? Matt Dillon. Oh, Strike a light. A man could fall over something this stable and break his neck. All right, all right. I just don't get excited. I'm used to it myself. I know just where everything is and don't see any point in wasting oil. When I, uh... Now, what's on your mind, Marshal? Chuck Evans. Is his horse still here? Oh, yes, indeed. It most certainly is. As a matter of fact, he's back there saddling up right now. Good. I told him it seemed like a fool time of night to start out on a trip. I, you can't reason with anybody that treats horses the way that bunch does. Uh, I guess not. Kelvin! Well, go on, answer it. Uh, 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 yes? What is it? Give me a hand back here, will you? Tell him yes. All right. I'm coming. What's this all about, Marshal? Nothing to get yourself worked up about. Just stay right here and stay out of the way. Uh-huh. All right, Chester. Yes, sir. He's got a lantern back there at the stall. Yeah. Now, you were right about one thing, Chester. He's trying to leave town. Give me a hand with this, Kelvin. I can't seem to get the... Th- you going somewhere, Chuck? Now, look, look, Dylan. You got nothing on me. Lay off. The Parks boys are in jail. Uh, I don't know anything about it, Dylan. You can't prove a thing, and you can't shoot me. I'm not even wearing a gun. It, it, it's hanging there on the saddle horn. Yeah. So I see. If the other boys did something, I, I, I don't know anything about you're it. You're a liar, Chuck. And you're a coward. You've got no call to talk like Shut that. Up. Now, you're under arrest. Chester, get his gun off his saddle. Look out, Mr. Dillon. He's got another gun. I'll kill you, Dillon. Say, help me. You're scared, Chuck. You're too scared to shoot straight. Help me. (laughs) Well, I guess that does it, Chester. Come on. What what, what is it, Marshal? What happened? Evans is dead. The Parks boys are going to hang your short three customers, Kelvin. Well, who's going to pay the stable bill? The stable bill? Uh. You got their horses. Sell them. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Well, it serves them right. Anybody that would treat a horse the way that bunch did, baby. Uh. Guess it's over, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's over, Chester. And it's just as well. This country would be a lot better off with them fellas dead than alive. I guess so. Even the moon looks brighter. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, you're still thinking you should have jailed him on suspicion, aren't you? I'd have half a dodge in jail if I started that. No, Chester, it's the kind of a chance a lawman has to take. Yes, sir. Whether he likes it or not. Yes, sir. But I'm not liking it much right now. In the morning, I'm going to have a talk with the preacher about holding the service for Helen. That's about all I can do for her now. Gun 
Blue Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Tom Tully, Paul Dubov, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Louise Lewis. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Starting tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations, there will be more Arthur Godfrey and his gang, presented by CBS Radio for our Sunday listeners. Folks who are regular Arthur Godfrey fans know there's been a 30-minute roundup of Arthur Godfrey time Sundays at the Star's Address. But starting tomorrow, there'll be 30 minutes more with Arthur Godfrey and all the wonderful Arthur Godfrey gang. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Lionel Barrymore is your host, on the Sunday Night Playhouse on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Sure made himself scarce in a hurry, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it looks that way. The plaza seems pretty quiet. Maybe he got the wind up and rode right on out of town. You're giving him credit for too much sense, Chester. Yes, sir. The only time that Mallard bunch stops is when somebody stops them. Hey, come on, let's take a look in the Texas tree. All right. Something wrong? Kitty, I'm looking for Billy Mallard. Ah. Has he been around? Take a look at the mirror back of the bar. He's shot up half the town already and passed the word out that he's going to shoot up the rest of it before midnight. When was he here? Uh, half an hour ago, Matt. Drunk, mean. I can't stand him or his father. Maybe they do own half of Texas, but I hate him. Well, they're Texans, Miss Kitty, and that means they've always got to be... Chester. Trying to... I told them, Mellers, when they brought their cattle up here last year that they'd have to act civilized. 
Come on, Chester. Sounded like it's up at the west end of the plaza. Yeah. It's probably the Occidental. Oh, just a second, Marshal. What? Huh? Oh, what is that, Mr. Colby? About those pistol shots, Marshal. Yeah. I reckon that's young Billy Meller kicking up his heels. Well, in about five minutes, he's going to be kicking them up in jail. No, 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 no. Let's not be hasty, Marshal Dillon. We have to think to the best interests of Dodge City in a situation like this. What? Those Mallers are mighty important people, you know. Own one of the biggest ranches in Texas. Always throw a lot of money around when they come up here with a herd. Well, as far as I'm concerned, he gets the same treatment as any other drunken cowboy. I'm sorry, Mr. Tobin. Now, wait a minute. All you're going to do is antagonize them. They'll turn their drives east from now on. They'll ship their stock out of Hayes City or Abilene. And you can't arrest Billy anyways. Well, he's got that gunman, Tom Wayne, and 30, 40 Maller Ranch riders back of him. Look, I'll argue with you later. I got a job to do. Dylan, you can't do that. Chester, let's go pick him up. That's him, all right, Mr. Dillon. Stand in there in the light. Yeah. I see him. Must be a dozen or more of his riders with him. Chester, you keep Tom Wayne covered. The rest of them will wait for him to make the first move. I'll take Billy. Yes, sir. Mallard! Well, now, what do we got here? Local marshal, huh? Put the gun away, Muller. Why don't you try to put it away for me, Marshal? All right. Mr. Wayne, you'll keep your hands still and in plain sight. I said put the gun away, Billy. You're talking mighty big, Marshal. For a man with empty hands. That ten star of yours makes a good target. I got me a whole collection of stars like that. That's far enough. You better hold it right where you are. I gave you two warnings, Billy. That's one more than I usually give a man. Now, you hand over that gun. I told you to take it if you think you can. No, let go of it. No! You've been that gun barrel someday, Marshal. Laying it over man's head that way. Don't worry about it, Wayne. As long as it's not your head. I'm not worried. I would be, though, if I was wearing that star of yours. Why? Old King Mallory, he don't like badge toters much. Especially when they buffalo the boy here. Then he better leave the boy at home when he brings a herd north. Does he get away with this kind of behavior down there? He does. Well, here it's different. You can see for yourself. Maybe it ain't over yet, either. You weren't figuring on drawing a hand, were you, Wayne? It's nothing to me, Marshal. Not unless I get orders from King. Well, he knows where he can find me. Yeah, I reckon. All right. The rest of you men. You can stay up all night, spend your money, do as you please. With one exception. If any one of you pulls a gun inside the city limits of Dodge, you'll get the same treatment as young Maller here. Is that clear? Let's go. All right, Chester, let's drag him over to the jail. Dylan? All right, in you go, Billy. Oh. 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 
I'm sure he is out cold. Well, it's better than having a bullet in the stomach. That's what he was asking for. He certainly was. I declare, Mr. Dillon, if you don't stop taking chances when a man's already got a gun in his hand... Chester, you can't shoot every cowboy who has a snort or two and starts to take it out on the town. I know, sir, but... Here, hand me that bucket of water there in the corridor, will you? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, Billy. (coughs) Yeah, that ought to bring him around. All right, Chester, lock up his cell. Just a minute there, Marshal... Don't lock that cell. Lock it up, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just told you to stop that matter. Didn't you hear me? I can probably hear you clear back in Texas. Now, what's on your mind? I'll tell you what's on my mind. I want my boy out of that cell. And I want him out in a hurry. Come around in the morning when the court opens. He's under arrest. Arrest? You? I can buy you in this 30-cent town of yours and never know the difference. Maybe, but we'd know it. Now, you shut up and get out of here. I've argued about this long enough. Either you'll open that cell or hand over the key. I'm sorry. Uh, you there. Come on, hand them over. Here now, Mr. Mallard. What's Dang, you've gone I far enough. You think some tin horn's going to... In... Oh. I said leave him alone. Let, let go of me, Dylan. <laughs> Chester, unlock the cell. Yes, sir. I'm warning you, Marshal, for the last time. If you don't get your hands off me. Sure, King. In you go. Now lock it up, Chester. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll break you, Dylan. I'll break you and run you out of the country. Sure. Sure, I know. But you'll have to wait till tomorrow morning. Kind of quiet around town, Mr. Dillon, with them mallards locked up. Well, you and Chester look thirsty, man. I brought you a pitcher of beer. On the house. Well, it's not a bad idea, Kitty. Well, thank you. I have heard about the mallards. They ought to be locked up in the same cell. They're two of a kind. Well, Kitty, it's... I don't know. The kid always has had his way paid for him by the old man's money. I don't know who's more to blame. Excuse me, Kitty. Uh Uh-huh. But uh, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do here. Uh, Well, you'll learn, honey. Oh, Matt, I don't think you've met Nora Beale. Huh? Matt Dillon, Nora. And uh, Chester Proudfoot. I probably know you. you. How do you do, ma'am? Well, now, honey, all you got to do right now is just stand around and look beautiful. I'll be along in a second and show you the rope. Oh, well, thank you, Kitty. I'm very pleased to have met both of you. Thank you. Likewise, ma'am. Oh, where'd she come from? She's new in Dodge, isn't she? Oh, yeah. She's real sweet, Matt. She's a singer from Chicago or somewhere. She got stranded here a couple of days ago. She only plans to work a week. Excuse and then me, Miss Kitty. Uh, Mr. Dillon, look. Th- there's King Mallard. What? Over at the bar there, Mr. Kelby. Well, what's he doing out of jail, man? <laughs> My gracious, you arrest a man and throw him in jail and an hour and a half later he's out loose again. It's aggravating. But I'm sure he won't mean any harm by it, Mr. Mallard. It's just that sometimes he's got... Well, now. Now, Marshal, let's keep our temper. Shut up. King, how did you get out of jail? When I've got anything to say to you, Dylan, I'll look you up. Now, now, Marshal, it's all perfectly legal. Mayor came down to his office, he fixed bail, and he released Mr. Maller and his son. They're both out, huh? Who went bail for this, Covey? Now, it's all in the best interest of the town, Marshal. Just like I've been telling Mr. Mallard here. It was just a misunderstanding, and all of us hope he won't hold it against us. Kelvey, I ought to run you in for obstructing justice. Somebody fired from the street, Mr. Dillon. I'll go out there. What? What? What is it, Kitty? No, Bill got hit, man. She hurt. Bad. We will return.
return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, giving medical and welfare assistance to our armed forces and veterans, collecting much-needed blood, training our citizens for service in case of a national emergency, and always on the spot first with disaster relief, these are some of the many services of the American Red Cross. But this all costs money, $85 million this year. So please answer the call. Give generously to the Red Cross. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Somebody sent for Doc. Uh, yeah, and the dealers went after him. Oh. Uh, uh, don't know. Now look, Norm. Don't try to move now. Looks like she was hit twice. Uh, Matt, do you think that she have a chance at all? I don't know, Kitty. Uh, poor kid. Oh, oh, oh. It's all right, honey. Doc will be here soon. What? Why did they shoot me? Well, I, I think they were trying to get me, Nora. Not you. Why did they do it? Why? Oh. Oh, where's Doc? Why doesn't he get here? You want me to go after you, Mr. Dillon? Oh, please. I, I feel so... So... I... No, Chester, there's no need for Doc to hurry now. Oh, Matt. She was so... so... Yeah. Well, Doc can take care of her when he gets here. Looks like Billy Mallor really pulled something this time, Mr. Dillon. No. How do you know it was Billy, Chester? Well, sir, half a dozen people saw him fire through the window and then ride off down the street. Yeah. I got a feeling those shots weren't wild. They were aimed. Only they were aimed at me. You were just lucky, Mr. Billy. Where's Billy now, Chester? I don't know, sir. I heard the Mallard Bunch is getting ready to pull out. They're milling around the street out in front of their hotel. King Mallard and Tom Wayne are there. Yeah. Well, they'll cover Billy, of course. It's going to be a lot tougher this time. Yes, a whole lot tougher, I reckon. Kitty? Yes? Yeah. Will you sort of take charge of things here until Doc shows up? Oh, sure, man. You go on. Get your posse. Posse? You'll need one, miss. When you move in with a posse, you ask for a gunfight. Works on a man like an out-and-out challenge. I'm going to handle it alone. But there must be 50 of them, Matt. Only three that count, as long as we can control the Mallers and Tom Wayne. The others don't matter. Marshal! Huh? Oh, Kelvy. You got another suggestion for the best interests of the town? Now listen here. You can't go up there, Marshal. That'll just lead to more killing. Won't do anybody any good. This wouldn't have happened, you know, if you'd taken my advice, not thrown that boy in jail. And it wouldn't have happened if you'd have stayed out of it and left him in jail, Kelvy. Tomorrow morning, he'd have sobered up and cooled off. Well, what's done's done. But they're getting ready to leave now. You can pass the word for King not to bring the boy along when he comes up next year and let it go at that. Don't make it any worse now, Marshal. Yeah. Let it go at that, huh? Don't antagonize him, huh? Look the other way. It's just Billy Mallard kicking up his heels, so let's stay real quiet. And maybe he won't commit another murder. Murder? It wasn't murder. That was an accident. It was murder. He meant to kill somebody, and he did. The only accident about it was the fact that he didn't kill me. Well, it 
Just a common dance hall girl nobody's going to pay any mind. I mind, Calvi. And the law minds. And you stay out of this from now on. You understand me. Well, now, Dylan, you're not talking to some saddle bum. Yeah. Chester. Yes, sir. Matt? Yeah, Kitty. I'm not going to help to go get yourself killed. It seems to me I'm being sold awful short around here. They outnumber you 20 to 1. Kitty, if I let Mallard get away with this, I'd be through in Dodge City, and so would the law. It was hard work bringing the law in here. And it's been hard work keeping it here. And it'd be ten times harder trying to bring it back if it ever got shoved out. Yeah. All right, Matt. But do one thing, will you? What? Wait here. I'll be right back. Give me the shot, Conrad. Right. Here. Take this shotgun with you. Red keeps it back of the bar, but you take it, Matt. It'll help the odds a little, at least. It, it's a good idea, Mr. Dillon. I'd sure feel a lot easier in my mind if you took it. Well... All right. Thanks, Kitty. I'll see you. She was a pretty little thing. Yeah. Seems a shame. There they are, Mr. Dillon. Out there on the street in front of the hotel. Yeah, I see him. Looks like the whole Maller mob. This ain't going to be very easy. Uh, King and Wayne are there, but I don't see Billy. No, sir, I don't either. Those two are the ones to watch, Chester. Don't let them start a play. Yes, Mr. Dillon, I understand. Here comes Marshal, Mr. Mallard. King, I want that boy of yours. What's the charge this time, Dylan? Murder. That girl died. She died. Now, where's Billy? Where'd you get the idea he had anything to do with it? Half a dozen people saw him fire the shots from the street. Well, I say he wasn't near that street. Well, don't say it to me. Say it in court. Now, where is he, King? Marshal, there's 40 of my riders standing here in the street. Every one of them packing a gun. I suppose you just turn around and start walking. I said, where's Billy? All I got to do is give the word, Dylan... These boys will drop you right in your trap. You're not giving anybody the word, mm. King. Huh? Buckshots have got a pretty fair spread. Now, at the first sign of any move by this bunch, and I'll get you and Wayne with one blast. Now, you better warn him, King. <coughs> Dylan, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Billy rode out of town, headed south. That's his horse tied there at the rail, isn't it? All right, where is he, King? Inside the hotel? Now, nah, look, Marshal, there's no call for all this. Maybe Billy did get a little bit out of line. He's always been a high-spirited youngin, but there's no reason for us to lose our heads. You know you got no case against him. Every one of my men here will swear he wasn't anywhere near that shoot. They'll get their chance at the trial. Well, now, nah, that's just the trouble. We can't hang around here waiting for a trial. It's cost me money, but I'm willing to spend quite a bit, Marshal, to avoid the inconvenience. Never mind, King. Don't be a fool, Marshal. Shut up. Wayne, move over a little closer to him, him. All right, that's it right there. All right. The rest of you men fish your guns out and drop them on the ground. Now, slow and easy. No sudden moves. 
Watch him, Chester. Yes, sir, I am. All right. Back up now, out into the street, away from those guns. A whole bunch of you. Move! Here, Chester, take the shotgun. Keep him covered. Yes, sir. Hold it now. Just like you are. Nobody will get hurt. Dylan, what you gonna do? I'm going in the hotel and bring out that kid. Watch him, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. your time. Go ahead if you want. The Mallers won't bother you. Thank you, Marshal. And the best of luck to you, sir. Billy. Billy, you better give up. Billy, you haven't got a chance if you know what's going on. Now hold it, Billy. Throw your gun out into the hall. I'm going to kill you, Dylan. It's your last chance, Billy. Now come out into the hall and give yourself up. Kill you so help me. Oh, no. oh. Fool, kid. Dylan, was that, is he dead? Yeah. I gave him two chances. He wouldn't take them. Yeah. Headstrong. Or was worse. Guess maybe, maybe I didn't bring him up right. It's too late to worry about that now. But uh, I'm sorry, King, for Billy and for the girl both. He had it coming. I know that, Marshal. I tried to stop it. Too late. The only way I knew. But he, 
you wouldn't blow. Tom, go get him. We'll have to bury him in Kansas. All right, King. We'll be leaving Dodge right after. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Charlotte Lawrence, and Barney Phillips. Polly Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Every Sunday evening, CBS Radio presents My Little Margie, a hilarious comedy show starring Charles Farrell and Gail Storm. It's a worthy addition to the Sunday Fun Day lineup, a program that's packed with laughs from start to finish. Listen for My Little Margie on most of these same stations, tomorrow night presented by CBS Radio. This is the CBS Radio Network. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.